Section Zero of The Assault on Mount Everest, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Assault on Mount Everest by Various Authors. Section Zero introduction by sir francis young husband k c s i k c i e introduction colonel howard berry and the members of the expedition of nineteen twenty one had effected the object with which they had been dispatched they were not sent out to climb mount everest it would be impossible to reach the summit in a single effort they were sent to reconnoitre the mountain from every direction and discover what was for certain the easiest way up for it was quite certain that only by the easiest way possible and only if there were an easy way would the summit ever be reached in the alps nowadays men look about for the most difficult way up a mountain hundreds every year ascend even the matterhorn by the easiest ways up so men with any turn for adventure have to look about for the difficult ways with mount everest it is very different the exhaustion produced from the difficulty of breathing in enough oxygen at the great heights is so fearful that only by a way that entails the least possible exertion can the summit be reached hence the necessity for spending the first season in thoroughly prospecting the mountain and this was all the more necessary because no european so far had been within sixty miles of mount everest so that not even the approaches to the mountain were known during nineteen twenty one under the leadership of colonel howard berry this reconnaissance was most thoroughly carried out mr mallory found what was quite certainly the easiest indeed the only practicable way up the mountain and major moorshead and captain wheeler mapped the mountain itself and the country round they brought back also much valuable experience of the conditions under which a definite all-out attempt to reach the summit might be made ample data were therefore now at the disposal of the mount everest committee for organizing an expedition to make this attempt and first the question of leadership had to be decided this was a definitely climbing expedition and a climbing expert would be needed to lead it and a climbing expert who had experience of himalayan conditions which are in so many ways different from alpine conditions the one obvious man for this position of leader was brigadier general the hon c g bruce he could not be expected at his age to take part in the actual climbing but for the command of the whole expedition no better could be found for thirty years he had devoted himself to climbing both in the himalaya and in the alps he was an expert climber and he knew the himalayan conditions as no other man and what was of scarcely less importance he knew the himalayan peoples and knew how to handle them any climbing party would be dependent upon the native porters to carry stores and equipment up the mountain but climbers from england would know nothing about these men or how to treat them it was essential therefore that there should be with the expedition some one who could humor and get the best out of them this was the more necessary as one of the chief features of these expeditions to mount everest was the organization of a corps of porters specially enlisted from among the hardiest men on that frontier for the particular purpose of carrying camps to high altitudes this idea originated with general bruce himself so far himalayan climbing expeditions had been dependent upon coolies collected at the highest villages and taken on for a few days while the climb lasted but this was never very satisfactory and coolies so collected would be of no use on mount everest general bruce's plan was very different it was 
months beforehand to select thirty or forty of the very best men who could be found in the higher mountains to enlist them for some months pay them well feed them well and equip them well and above all to put into them a real esprit de corps make them take pride in the task that was before them but to do all this there was needed a man who knew and understood them and who had this capacity for infusing them with a keen spirit and for this no one could be better than general bruce himself he had served in a gurkha regiment for thirty years he loved his gurkhas and was beloved by them he spoke their language knew all their customs and traditions and had had them climbing with him in the alps as well as the himalaya and gurkhas come from nepal on the borders of which mount everest lies for organizing this corps of porters for dealing with the tibetans and lastly for keeping together the climbers from england who were mostly quite unknown to each other but who all knew of general bruce and his mountaineering achievements in the himalaya general bruce was the ideal chief this being settled the next question was the selection of the climbing party general bruce would not be able to go on to the mountain itself and he would have plenty to do at the main base camp seeing after supplies and organizing transport service from the main base to the high mountain base as chief at the mountain base and as second in command of the expedition to take general bruce's place in case of any misadventure to him lieutenant colonel e l strutt was selected he was an alpine climber of great experience and knowledge of ice and snow conditions but for the actual effort to reach the summit two men were specially marked out one of course was mr george lee mallory who had done such valuable service on the reconnaissance of the previous year and the other was captain george finch who had been selected for the first expedition but who had through temporary indisposition not been able to go with it both of these were first-rate men and well known for their skill in mountaineering these two had been selected in the previous year of new men major e f norton was an experienced and very reliable and thorough mountaineer he is an officer in the artillery and well known in india for his skill and interest in pig sticking but in between his soldiering and his pig-sticking and a course at the staff college he seems to have found time for alpine climbing and for bird observation a man of high spirit who could be trusted to keep his head under all circumstances and to help in keeping a party together he was a valuable addition to the expedition mr somerville was perhaps even more versatile in his accomplishments he was a surgeon in a london hospital who was also skilled in both music and painting and yet found time for mountaineering and being younger than the others and possessed of exuberant energy and a fine physique he could be reckoned on to go with the highest climbers another member of the medical profession who was also a mountaineer was dr wakefield he was a westmoreland man who had performed wonderful climbing feats in the lake district in his younger days and now held a medical practice in canada he was bursting with enthusiasm to join the expedition and gave up his practice for the purpose as medical officer and naturalist of the expedition dr t g longstaff was chosen he was a veteran himalayan climber and if only this expedition could have been undertaken some years earlier he like general bruce would have made a magnificent leader of a climbing party as it was his great experience would be available for the climbers as far as the high mountain camp and this time it was intended to send with the expedition a whole time photographer and cinematographer both for the purpose of having a photographic record of its progress and also to provide the means by which the expenses of this and a future expedition might be met 
For this, Captain J. B. Noel was selected. He had made a reconnaissance toward Mount Everest in 1913, and he had since then made a special study of photography and cinematography, so that he was eminently suited for the task. The above formed the party which would be sent out from England, and subsequently General Bruce in India selected four others to join the expedition. Mr. Crawford, of the Indian Civil Service, a keen mountaineer who had long wished to join the expedition, Major Mooreshead, who had held charge of the survey party in the 1921 expedition and now wanted to join the present expedition as a climber, and two officers from Gurkha regiments to serve as transport officers, namely Captain Jeffrey Bruce and Captain Morris. This completed the British personnel of the expedition. It had been my hope that a first-rate artist might have accompanied it to paint the greatest peaks of the Himalaya, but the artists whom we chose were unable to pass the medical examination, though the examination was, of course, not so severe as the examination which the actual climbers had to pass. While these men were being selected, the equipment committee, Captain Farrar and Mr. Meade, were working hard. Taking the advice of Colonel Howard Berry and Mr. Mallory, and profiting by the experience gained on the previous expedition, they got together and had suitably packed and dispatched to India a splendid outfit comprising every necessity for an expedition of this nature. The amount of work that Farrar put into this was enormous, for as a mountaineer he knew well how the success of the expedition depended on each detail of the equipment being looked into, and he spared himself no trouble and overlooked nothing. The stores were of the most varied description, in order to meet the varying tastes of the different members. The tents were improved in accordance with the experience gained. Most particular attention was paid to the boots. Clothing and bedding, light in weight but warm to wear, were specially designed. Ice axes, crampons, ropes, lanterns, cooking stoves, and also warm clothing for the porters were all provided, and much else besides. But about one point in the equipment of the party, there was much diversity of opinion. Should the climbers be provided with oxygen, or should they not? If it were at all feasible to provide climbers with oxygen without adding appreciably to the weight they had to carry, the summit of Mount Everest could be reached with a certainty. For the purely mountaineering difficulties are not great. On the way to the summit, there are no physical obstacles which a trained mountaineer could not readily overcome. The one factor which renders the ascent so difficult is the want of oxygen in the air. Provide the oxygen, and the ascent could be made at once. But to provide the oxygen, heavy apparatus would have to be carried, and carried by the climbers themselves. It became a question whether the disadvantage of having to carry a weight of at least 30 pounds would or would not outweigh the advantages to be gained by the use of oxygen. And the Mount Everest Committee were warned of another feature in the case. They were told that if by any misfortune the oxygen were to run out when the climbers were at a considerable height, say 27,000 feet, and they suddenly found themselves without any preparation in this attenuated atmosphere, they might collapse straight away. It was a disagreeable prospect to anticipate. But Captain Finch, who was himself a lecturer on chemistry at the Imperial College of Science, Mr. Somerville, and Captain Farrar, pressed so strongly for the use of oxygen and Mr. Anna was so convinced he could construct a reasonably portable apparatus that the committee decided that the experiment should be made. The value of using oxygen could thus be tested, and we should know what were the prospects of reaching the summit of the mountain, either with or without its aid. Captain Farrar, 
Captain Finch, and Mr. Anna, therefore set about constructing an apparatus which would hold the lightest procurable oxygen cylinders, and which could be carried on the back by the climbers. This final question having been settled, all the stores and equipment having been purchased, packed, and dispatched, the members of the expedition left England in March. But before I leave General Bruce to take up the tale of their adventures, I must say yet one word more about the good of climbing Mount Everest. These repeated efforts to reach the summit of the world's highest mountain have already cost human life. They have also caused much physical pain, fatigue, and discomfort to the climbers. They have been very expensive, and there is not the slightest sign of any material gain whatever being obtained, not an ounce of gold or iron or coal or a single precious stone or any land upon which food or material could be grown. What, then, is the good of it all? Who will benefit in the least even if the climbers do eventually get to the top? These are questions which are still being continually asked me, so I had better still go on, trying to make as plain as I can what is the good of climbing Mount Everest. The most obvious good is an increased knowledge of our own capacities. By trying with all our might and with all our mind to climb the highest point on the earth, we are getting to know better what we really can do. No one can say for certain yet whether we can or cannot reach the summit. We cannot know till we try. But if, as seems much more probable now than it did ten years ago, we can reach the summit, we shall know that we are capable of more than we had supposed. And this knowledge of our capacities will be very valuable. In my own lifetime, I have seen men's knowledge of their capacity for climbing mountains greatly increased. Men's standard of climbing has been raised. They now know that they can do what 40 years ago they did not deem in the least possible. And if they reach the summit of Mount Everest, the standard of achievement will be still further raised. And men who had, so far, never thought of attempting the lesser peaks of the Himalaya, will be climbing them as freely as they now climb peaks in Switzerland. And what then? What is the good of that? The good of that is a whole new enjoyment in life will be opened up. The enjoyment of life is, after all, the end of life. We do not live to eat and make money. We eat and make money to be able to enjoy life and some of us know from actual experience that by climbing a mountain we can get some of the finest enjoyment there is to be had. We like bracing ourselves against a mountain, pitting our metal, our nerve, our skill against the physical difficulties the mountain presents, and feeling that we are forcing the spirit within us to prevail against the material. That is a glorious feeling in itself, and a real tonic to the spirit, even when it does not always conquer. But that is not all. The wrestling with the mountain makes us love the mountain. For the moment, we may be utterly exhausted and only too thankful to be able to hurry back to more congenial regions. Yet, all the same, we shall eventually get to love the mountain for the very fact that she has forced the utmost out of us, lifted us just for one precious moment high above our ordinary life and shown us beauty of an austerity, power, and purity we should have never known if we had not faced the mountain squarely and battled strongly with her. This, then, is the good to be obtained from climbing Mount Everest. Most men will have to take on trust that there is this good. But most of the best things in life we have to take on trust at first till we have proved them for ourselves. So I would beg readers of this book first trustfully to accept it from the Everest climbers that there is good in climbing great mountains for the risks 
they have run and the hardships they have endured are ample enough proof of the faith that is in them. And then go and test it for themselves in the Himalaya, if possible, or if not, in the Alps, the Rockies, the Andes, wherever high mountains make the call. End of section zero. Chapter One, Part One of The Assault on Mount Everest, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Assault on Mount Everest, 1922 by various authors. Chapter One, Part One to the base camp by brigadier general the honorable c g bruce c b m v o the precursor of the present volume the reconnaissance of mount everest in 1921 sets forth fully the successful and strenuous work which was accomplished in that year and which has rendered possible the expedition of the present year the whole of our work lying in country which had never previously been explored by europeans it was rendered absolutely necessary for a full examination of the whole country to be made before an attempt to climb mount everest could possibly be carried out we have to thank colonel howard berry and his companions especially his survey officers for their important work which rendered our task in arriving at our base comparatively simple. The object of the expedition of 1922, of course, was the actual attack on the mountain in an attempt to climb it, but no great mountain has ever succumbed to the first attempt on it, and therefore it is almost inconceivable that so tremendous a problem as the ascent of Mount Everest should succeed at the very first effort in fact i myself am more than satisfied almost astounded at the extraordinary success attained by my companions in this endeavor the problem that lay in front of us i think should be first explained mount everest as all know lies on that part of the himalaya which is narrowest it is therefore exposed very rapidly to the first assaults of the southwest monsoon and this monsoon advances up the bay of bengal at an earlier period in the year than that of its western branch the gulf current it is this fact which supplies the greatest difficulty to be faced in an attack on any of the great peaks which lie in this region giving one an unusually short season however to a certain extent this is counteracted by the fact that the winter climate in this portion of the himalaya is far drier than it is in the west there is less deposit of snow on the mountains in this section of the himalaya than there would be for instance in the kashmir mountains and this to some extent makes up for the early advance of the monsoon and consequent bad weather which renders any exploration of the great heights during the time that the monsoon blows an impossibility towards the end of may the monsoon arrives in darjeeling and then according to the strength of the current quickly approaches the southern faces of the himalaya and as the current strengthens drifts across their summits and through the gorges and over the lower ridges the problem therefore of any party exploring in these mountains resolves itself into the rapidity with which they can establish their base of operations in a suitable locality to explore the mountains and to climb them during the period of the very great cold naturally the upper heights are impossible and camping on the upper glaciers is in itself also almost impossible traveling across tibet in march crossing high passes of over seventeen thousand feet is such that although it might be perfectly possible to do it would be a great strain on the stamina of the party and likely to detract from their condition we had therefore to adapt our advance into tibet 
so as to make it at the latest possible moment in order to avoid the very worst of the weather, and yet at the earliest possible moment so that we could arrive at the foot of our mountains with sufficient time to attack them before the weather broke up and rendered mountaineering an impossibility at a great height. It resolves itself, then, almost into a race against the monsoon. This was our problem, and it is my special province in these opening chapters to show how we tackled it. During the winter of 1921-22, the Mount Everest Committee, owing to the lateness with which the party had returned after the reconnaissance, had to work at very top speed. They had to collect all the necessary stores for the party, and not only that, but also to select a suitable mountaineering team. This was a considerable difficulty. Finally, the party was made up as follows. Myself as leader, Colonel E. L. Strutt as second in command, and Dr. Longstaff, the official doctor and naturalist of the expedition. The climbing party, pure, consisted of Mr. Mallory of last year's expedition, Dr. Somerville, Dr. Wakefield, and Major Norton. We had three transport officers, one of whom belonged to the Alpine Club and was considered an assistant of the climbing party, Mr. C. G. Crawford of the Indian Civil Service. The official photographer was Captain Noel. Two officers in the Indian Army were attached to the expedition as transport officers, Captain J. G. Bruce and Captain C. G. Morris. Later on our arrival in Darjeeling, the party was further reinforced by Major Mooreshead, who had been one of the survey party of the previous year, and whose general knowledge of Tibet and of Tibetans was of great service to us, and last but not least, Captain George Finch, who came not only as a most important member of the climbing party, but also as the scientific expert in charge of the entire oxygen outfit. This large party was collected in Darjeeling by the last week in March, and in a few days we were all ready to make a start. I myself preceded the party by about a month, arriving in Delhi to interview the Indian authorities about the 25th of February. Through the kindness of the Commander-in-Chief, Lord Rawlinson, we were supplied with four young non-commissioned officers of Captain Bruce's regiment, the 2nd Battalion, 6th Gurkha Rifles, and an orderly of the 1st Battalion, 6th Gurkha Rifles, and right well all these five Gurkhas carried out their duties. As will be seen later, one of them, Lansnake Tejbir Burra, very highly distinguished himself. I arrived in Darjeeling with Captain Bruce on March 1st, and there I found that our agent in India, Mr. Weatherall, had carried out the instructions which he had received from England in the most efficient manner. The large quantities of stores which we had ordered previously were all beautifully packed and ready for transportation. The tents of the previous year all mended and in good order. The stores of different kinds, such as there were, which had been left also from the previous year, had been put into order, and last and most important, 150 porters had been collected for our inspection and from whom to make a selection. He had also for us a large number of cooks to choose from, a most excellent individual to look after the tents, Chong Gay, who proved quite invaluable to us, and a local cobbler who had expressed his willingness to come with the expedition. Owing to the tremendous hurry in which all arrangements had to be made in England, the stores were forwarded in different batches. On our arrival in Calcutta, we interviewed Mr. Brown of the Army and Navy stores, whose work, both for the expeditions of 1921 and of 1922, has been quite beyond praise. He told us that only one installment of stores had yet arrived, but that the ships containing the remainder were expected shortly. Luckily for us, we had at the Army and Navy stores, and acting in the interests of the expedition, a most capable agent. As the ships containing the stores arrived, the latter were unloaded, rapidly passed through the customs, 
and forwarded on to Kelimpong Road, which is the terminus of the Darjeeling Railway and the Tietzda Valley. On arrival, there they were met by our representative, in no less a person than Captain Morris, handed over to the contractors who were moving our stores, and forwarded on to Tibet in advance of the expedition. This, naturally, required a great deal of arranging. I must mention that shortly after our arrival in Darjeeling, we were joined by Captain Morris, who immediately left for Kalimpong, two stages on our journey, to which place the whole of the outfit of the expedition was sent. We could not spare the time to wait for the arrival of the oxygen, and therefore, when the party finally left Darjeeling, Captain Finch, the scientist in whose charge the whole of the oxygen and scientific apparatus had been put, remained behind with Mr. Crawford to bring it up. Luckily, the ship arrived in Calcutta just as we were leaving, and therefore the delay was less than we had anticipated. The people of Darjeeling, both the British and the native inhabitants, whether Tibetans or hillmen, were all immensely interested in our expedition, and Mr. Laden La, the deputy superintendent of police, was, if anything, the most enthusiastic of them all. Mr. Laden La has himself rendered excellent service to government and has traveled greatly in Tibet. He is himself a Tibetan and, I believe, is an honorary general in the Tibetan army. His influence in Darjeeling and the district is great, and his help to the expedition was invaluable. He arranged in Darjeeling both as head of the Buddhist Association of Darjeeling and in conjunction with the Committee of the Hillman's Association that the whole of the party should be entertained by these two associations and that the chief lamas and brahmins of the district should bless and offer up prayers for the well-being and success of the party. The entertainment went off most excellently, and it was altogether a most interesting function. The Nepalese members of the party were blessed by the Brahmins, but also, in order to confirm this blessing, further received the blessings of the Lamas. I think there is every reason for supposing that this small function assisted in bringing home to all our porters and followers what was expected of them by their own people, and it was very likely a good deal in consequence of this that they behaved on the whole so extremely well. For it must be understood that all these hill people, whether Nepalese or Tibetan, are very light-hearted, very irresponsible, very high-spirited, and, up to the present time, prohibition as a national measure is not exactly a popular outlook. In fact, none of them on any occasion, unless well looked after, lost any opportunity of looking on the wine when it is red or any other color. Our cooks had to be chosen with a good deal of care. Captain Bruce and myself took the most likely candidates out into the hills and gave them a good trial before we engaged them. One of them, who was a Nepalese, had been an old servant of my own for many months. He was the only Gurkha among them. The other three, for we gave ourselves an ample outfit of four cooks, were Botias, Tibetans. They were the greatest success, mostly because they are hard-working and ready to do any amount of work, but they were good cooks, too. Captain Noel also engaged an excellent servant, also a cook, and Major Norton's private servant, another Tibetan, was very capable in the same way, so that we were thoroughly well provided with an ample outfit, and wherever we went we could count on having our meals properly prepared. This is one of the important points in Tibetan travel, from the want of which, I believe, a certain amount of the illness that was experienced in the previous year was due. We also engaged almost the most important subordinate member of the expedition, the interpreter, Karma Paul. He was quite young and had been a schoolmaster in Darjeeling. He had also worked, I believe, for a time in an office in Calcutta. He was quite new to the kind of work that he would have to do, but he was a great acquisition to the expedition, 
always good company and always cheerful, full of a quaint little vanity of his own, and delighted when he was praised. He served us very well indeed from one end of the expedition to the other, and it was a great deal owing to his cheerfulness and to his excellent manners and way with the Tibetans that we never had the smallest possible misunderstanding with any officials, even the lowest grades, to disturb our good relations with the Tibetans of any kind or class. He also was bilingual, for he had been born in Lhasa and still had relations living there. On March 26, the whole expedition started off for Kalimpong by rail, with the exception of Captain Finch and Mr. Crawford, who remained to bring on the oxygen. Owing to the kindness of the Himalayan Railway Company, we were all taken round by rail to Kalimpong Road free, the whole expedition traveling up the Titsta Valley in the normal manner, with the exception of Captain Noel, who elected to ride on the roof of the carriages in order to take pictures with his cinema camera of the Titsta Valley. The junction at Siliguri, where the Titsta Railway branches off from the main line, is only 300 feet above the sea, the terminus at Kalimpong Road about 700 feet above the sea. And therefore, as one dives down from the hills, one enters into tropical conditions and passes through the most magnificent tropical jungle and the steepest gorges and ravines. It is a wonderful journey. Even the long spell of hot and dry weather and the heat haze at this time of year were unable to spoil the scenery. And though we saw it almost at its worst time, it remained gorgeous. At Kalimpong, the expedition broke up into two parties, but before we left, we had a very pleasant function to attend. I had been charged by Sir Robert Baden Powell to deliver a message to the scouts of Dr. Graham's home for European children at Kalimpong. Not only that, but incorporated with these scouts was the first small body of Nepalese Boy Scouts. It was a very interesting function indeed and a most enthusiastic one. From there, we pushed on stage by stage over the Julep La into the Chumbi Valley. Of course, journeys through Sikkim have often been described. Again, we were disappointed. On my first arrival in Darjeeling, the cold weather had hardly finished. But now, March 28, we were well into the hot weather of Bengal, and in consequence we were also in the hot weather haze. During the whole of our journey we never got a single view of the gorgeous southern faces of the Himalaya, of Kanchenjunga, and of its supporters, and especially of the wonderful Sinial Chum Peak. This was a very great disappointment, as from several points on our road a view of the southern face can be obtained. Nevertheless, a journey through Sikkim is always a wonderful experience. The steep and deeply cut valleys, the wonderful clear mountain streams, and the inhabitants and their means of cultivation are all full of interest. The depth of the valleys is always striking and can never be anything else. When one thinks that from Rongli to situated only at 2,700 feet above the sea, one rises in one continuous pull to close on 13,000 feet on the ridge which looks down on the Natong bungalow and travels through cultivation and forest the whole way, passing through every phase of eastern Himalayan landscape. One cannot cease to be continually impressed by the scale of the country. We were too early for the rhododendrons on the way to Natong, but there were just sufficient in flower to give us a mental vision of what these wonderful rhododendron forests would be like in another three weeks. On the way to Natong, at a height of 11,500 feet, we came to a little village of Longtong. Here there was a tea house kept by some Nepalese. It was spotlessly clean, or at least all the cooking arrangements were, and here, as we came up, we all indulged in tea and the local cakes and found them both excellent. Not only that, 
but the little lady who kept the shop was full of talk and full of chaff, and we all sat down and enjoyed ourselves for more than an hour, keeping up a continuous flow of conversation. All the men joined us as they came up, and I am afraid we made rather a noise. As a matter of fact, all through Seacum these little tea shops are to be found, and the tea is generally quite drinkable. This little lady's shop, though, was particularly well run and attractive. When we left, we promised to call and see her again on our return, which promise we were able to fulfill. The higher portions of the road from Natong over the Jellip are a very great contrast. It is almost like a march through the highlands of Scotland, and hardly represents or brings to one's mind the fact that one is among great mountains. The Jalep, which is 14,300 feet above the sea, is a perfectly easy pass, crossed by a horrid paved road very much out of repair, the descent into Chumbi Valley being, for animals, the last word in discomfort. We employed altogether in our two parties about eighty mules from the Chumbi Valley, and we were all immensely struck by this wonderful transport. There is a considerable trade carried on between Tibet and Chumbi, in particular, for seven or eight months in the year, as on this road quantities of Tibetan wool are brought down for sale at Kalimpong, very nearly all of it being brought by the Chumbi muleteers, and most efficient they are. They thoroughly understand the loading and care of mules, and the pace they travel at is something to see. It is only understood if one walks for long distances with, or often behind, a train of laden mules. No doubt, owing to the continual changes from cold to warmth and heat, Many sore backs are occasioned, and further, owing to the tremendous stress and continuous labor involved, many mules are worked that have no business to be worked. The muleteers themselves, when talked to about it, say that it distresses them, but they are hard put to it to carry out their work, and see no method very often of being able to fulfill their contracts and at the same time lay up their mules. After crossing the Jalep La and leaving Sikkim, it is almost like diving into Kashmir. So great is the difference in the general appearance of the country and in its forests. While we were sitting on the top of the Jalep, we had the most splendid view of the Chamohari, 23,800 feet. It showed itself at its very best. The day was quiet and very warm. Chamal Hari stood out clearly, and still with plenty of atmosphere round it. Snow streamers were blowing out from its summit. It showed its full height and did full justice to its shape and beauty. It is a great mountain which completely dominates Fari and its plain, and is the striking feature as one enters Tibet from the Chumbi Valley. We all admired it enormously, but the enthusiasm of the party was somewhat damped when I pointed out to them that our high advanced base on Everest, in fact, the camp that we hoped to establish on the North Call, called the Chang La, which had been marked out the year before by Mr. Mallory, was, in fact, only about 600 feet lower than the top of the Chamalhari itself. On our arrival in reaching Gong, which is at the foot of the valley which forms the junction between the Jalep Valley and the Valley of the Amu Chu, which is the Chumbi Valley, we were met by Mr. MacDonald, the British trade agent who lives at Chumbi, and his wonderfully dressed to Prasis, and also by a guard of honor of ninety Punjabis, who supplied a small guard both at Yatung in Chumbi and also at the British post in Yancey on the road to Lhasa. We had a very pleasant ride by the Chumbi Valley to Yatung. I had previously supplied myself in Darjeeling with a treasure of a pony, Gayamda by name, who was locally very well known in Darjeeling. He was only twelve and a half hands, but had the go and the stamina of a very much bigger animal. He was attended by Asaeus, who was nearly twice as big as himself, 
and was one of the finest built Tibetans I saw the whole time. Gyamda himself hailed from the town of Gyamda, which is about twelve miles south of Lhasa. His enormous sayas hailed from Lhasa itself, and unfortunately could hardly speak a word of anything but Tibetan. However, he improved by degrees, and very soon we got on very well. He adored the pony Gyamda, but had the habit of giving it, unless looked after, at least a dozen eggs mixed with its grain. When we stopped him doing this, he was caught hugging the pony round the neck and saying to it, Now they have cut your eggs, you will die, and what shall I do? Gyamda carried me right through the expedition and could go over any ground and came back as well as he left, never sick or sorry and always pleased with life. We marched from Chumbi on April 5, accompanied by Mr. MacDonald and his son, who had come to help us make all our transport arrangements when we should arrive in Fari. Mr. MacDonald helped us on all occasions, and we cannot thank him enough for all the trouble he took from now on during the whole time the expedition was in Tibet. It was owing very largely to his help that we were able in Fari to get our expedition on so soon, for he warned the two Zong pens of Fari Zong beforehand to obtain adequate transport for us. Again, the march from Yatung to Fari has been described on many occasions, but it is quite impossible to march through it without mentioning its character. It is, especially at the time of year we went through, one of the darkest and blackest and most impressive forested gorges that I have ever seen, and almost equally impressive, is the debouchement on to the Fari Plain at the head of the gorge, dominated as it is by our old friend Chamalhari. We arrived in Fari on April 6 and made our first real acquaintance with the Tibetan wind. Fari is 14,300 feet, and winter was scarcely over. The weather also was threatening. Luckily, there is a little British government rest house and bungalow and saray at Fari, and there we found comfortable quarters. We were joined on the following day by the rest of the party. This really formed the starting point of the expedition, and further, it was my birthday, and a bottle of old rum, 120 years old, specially brought out for this occasion, was opened, and the success of the expedition was drunk to. If we had known what was in front of us, we should have put off the drinking of this peculiarly comforting fluid until the evening of the day of our first march from Fari. The two Fari Zong pens, probably owing to the fact that Fari is on the main route between Lhasa and India, were far and away the most grasping and difficult of any officials that we met, but no doubt their difficulties were pretty considerable. Although there is a great quantity of transport to be obtained in Fari, at this time of the year it is in very poor condition. Grazing exists, but one would never know that it existed unless one was told, and also unless one saw herds of yaks on the hillsides apparently eating frozen earth. Everything was frozen hard. We had difficulty, therefore, in obtaining the transport required. We found here collected the whole of our stores, with the exception of the oxygen. Our excellent Tyndell, open footnote, tent minder, close footnote, Chungay, who had gone on ahead, had got it all marshaled. The tents were also pitched and in good order. On April 8, we set out from Fari, but had been obliged to reinforce the local transport by re-engaging 50 of the Chumbi mules. We had been obliged to do this because we were unable to get a sufficiency of transport that was capable of carrying loads in Fari itself. But these 50 mules were our salvation. Without them, as it turned out, we should have been in a bad way. There are two roads that lead from Fari to Kambazong, our next objective, the short road passing over the Tang La and the Donka La, and the long road which starts first on the road to Lhasa and turns finally after two marches to the west. 
on account of the short time at our disposal and having regard to the fact that we had now in earnest begun our race with the weather we chose the shorter route owing to the condition of the animals all had agreed that the yaks could not possibly even by the short road get to cambazon under six days we therefore divided our party again into two the advance party and the fifty chumby mules and a large collection of donkeys and particularly active bullocks and even some cows were to march to Kambazong in four days and were to be followed by two hundred yaks in charge of our sardar kyal jen and two of the gurkha non-commissioned officers to wit naik herke garung and lance naik lal singh garung the other two gurkhas being in charge of the treasure chest which accompanied the first party lance naik teshbir bura and lance naik serabjit thapa were to march with the first party the sardar gal jen had accompanied colonel howard barry's party on the first expedition and had apparently from the accounts given of him in last year's volume not been a very great success i however gave him a second chance he was a thoroughly capable man and i had every hope as he knew that i had heard about him and also had seen the report that had been made of him by colonel howard barry that on this occasion he would pull himself together and do well in this we were not disappointed of course as all sophisticated men in his position are likely to do he was out to benefit himself but we were able pretty successfully to cope with this failing and generally speaking his services were of great value especially on certain occasions altogether i think he was a success of course we were rather well qualified from this point of view both morris and geoffrey bruce had excellent knowledge of nepal and of the nepalese and nepalese is the one eastern language which i may say that i also have a good knowledge of all sherpas are trilingual that is to say they talk their own sherpa dialect of tibet tibetan as a mother tongue and nearly all of them nepalese as well owing to their being subjects of nepal the official language that is nepalese is the one they are obliged to employ in dealing with the authorities also nearly every one of the tibetans we employed and who came with us from darjeeling spoke nepali as their second language in consequence of this nearly the whole of the work usually done by a sardar of coolies in darjeeling was carried out by the officers of the expedition who dealt directly both with the men and with the people of the country end of chapter one section one chapter one part two of the assault on mount everest nineteen twenty two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by t r love of pleasant hill california the assault on mount everest nineteen twenty two by various authors chapter one part two on april eighth we started out there was for a good long time a tremendous scrimmage getting all the different loads packed on to the animals and dividing the animals especially as the tibetans had no idea of being punctual and in consequence the yaks ponies for riding mules and bullocks all drifted in at different times during the morning finally however our two large mixed convoys were got off it was really a great piece of luck being able to keep the fifty chumby mules these were laden in the early morning with what was necessary for our camp and dispatched well before the rest of the luggage the great convoy of two hundred yaks was finally marshalled and sent off under the charge of the gurkhas and the sardar but the advance party's luggage was spread over miles of country in consequence of this jeffrey morris and myself were delayed until quite late in the morning 
our first march was about sixteen miles and the day was very threatening we pushed along on ponies at a good pace and crossed the tang la which is a little over fifteen thousand feet in rough but not actually wet weather luckily the country is very open over plains of more or less frozen grass over the main chain of the himalayas the clouds had settled and it was evident that the weather was breaking a little after noon it broke with a vengeance the clouds settled down it began to snow heavily and the wind increased to half a hurricane luckily however most of our local men knew the road well otherwise in this great open and undulating country one could very easily get lost the track which was fairly well marked otherwise was completely and rapidly obliterated in places it was certainly a rather disheartening start morris was delayed for a time to look after some luggage Geoffrey and myself pushed on going pretty quickly we were able to pick up different parties and were lucky enough to pass one small encampment of tibetans it was curious to see yaks contentedly chewing the cud the whole of their weather side being a mass of frozen snow they seemed to be quite as happy lying out in a blizzard as though they had been ordinary civilized cows in a barn about what is usually known as tea time we sighted the camp our excellent followers had got a few tents up and i was fortunate enough myself to find that the porter who was carrying my big coat had already arrived nearly all indian camp servants who are accustomed to traveling in the himalaya are good in a crisis and when things get bad come to the fore but on this occasion they surpassed themselves it must be understood that in tibet very very seldom can anything but dry yak dung be found to make a fire with on this occasion the snow had obliterated everything and in consequence a fire had to be otherwise improvised some tents had been pitched a fire had been got going and very soon a hot meal and hot tea were forthcoming the rest of the party gradually collected but it was not until well after nightfall that the whole of the advance transport had managed to arrive as a first march it certainly gave the party a very good idea of what they might have to put up with in tibet it was a real good entry into tibetan travel however nobody was much the worse and the weather having cleared during the night we had a brilliant sight the following morning on april nine we made what i think was the hardest march undertaken on the expedition our path led us over the ridge in its three bifurcations which runs north from pahunri and rapidly rises from our last camp each of these ridges being just seventeen thousand feet slightly more or less and most of the path being at about sixteen thousand feet of elevation at any time early in april great cold would be expected at such a height but on this day the wind was blowing right over the himalaya direct from the snows across these passes and howling down the gorges between them it was painfully cold and the wind never abated from morning to night we left about seven o'clock in the morning and it was well after nightfall again before our transport was collected at our next camp at hung Zung trek longstaff and myself pushed on in search of the camp for most of the day together arriving before any of the animals at about four thirty to five o'clock in the evening and made our camp at the above-named place under some overhanging cliffs with fairly good grazing such as grazing is in april and with a stream beneath the camp from which water could be obtained we were very shortly followed by our magnificent chumbi transport which had been pushing along at a tremendous pace the whole day long i do not know what we should have done without it what was very much brought home to us was the absolute necessity of windproof material to keep out the tremendous cold of these winds 
Fortunately, I had a very efficient Macintosh, which covered everything, but even then I suffered very considerably from the cold. It simply blew through and through wool, and riding without windproof clothing would have been very painful. It was also very fortunate for us that the weather was really fine and the sun shone all day. I think we should have been in a very bad way indeed if the blizzard had occurred on the second day out from Fari and not on the first. However, by night we were all comfortably settled down, although the whole of our advanced stores did not arrive until after ten o'clock at night again. Unfortunately, three of our porters who had stayed behind with the slowest of the bullocks lost their way after dark. They stayed out the whole night without bedding or covering, and in the morning continued to the nunnery of Tatsang, which was about four or five miles further down the valley and rather off our direct route. We here heard of them and retrieved them. These men had not yet been issued with their full clothes, and how they managed to sit out the night clothed as they were and without any damage of any kind passes one's comprehension. So low was the temperature that night that the quickly flowing stream outside our camp was frozen solid. We halted the next day as the transport was overdone, and the following day, April 11, made another long but very interesting march directly to Kambazong, leaving the monastery of Tatsang on our right and crossing high plains on which were grazing large herds of Kiang and Gazelle. The mounted men had great fun trying to round up and get as close as possible to the herds of Kiang. They were trusting up to a point, but never let us go close enough to get a good snap photograph of them. Finally, the road led from the high plateau down to Kamba Zong, through what to several of us immediately became astonishingly familiar country, for the whole surroundings of the Kambazong Valley reminds one very much of the scenery on the northwest frontier of India. But what a difference in climate! We camped at Kambazong, where last year's expedition had camped, and were very well received by the same Zongpen. We were gratified to find Dr. Kellis' grave in good order, and we further added to it a collection of great stones. The inscription on the grave in English and Tibetan was clear and clean. We were delayed in Kambatsong for three whole days, partly because of the difficulty in collecting animals. Also, two days to allow our main convoy of 200 yaks to catch us up, and we had the good luck to be joined by Finch and Crawford, who had pushed on at a great pace with the oxygen apparatus. They showed evident signs of wear and tear, being badly knocked about by the weather. The storm had caught them on the Jalap La, and as this is more south, there had been a very much greater fall of snow, so much so that the Chumbi Valley was inches deep in it. They spoke very highly indeed of all their followers, cooks, and Tibetans, and especially of a capital boy, Lakpa Tsering, who had come along with them as their special attendant. He was quite a young boy, but had made the march in two days with them to Tatsang, where they stayed for the night, without showing any particular signs of fatigue, running along beside their ponies. I make a considerable point of the following. I think great exertions and long marches at these high altitudes before acclimatization is complete would have tended to exhaust and not to improve the training of the party, whereas to have a pony with one and be able to walk or ride when one felt tired or blown gradually allowed the body to adjust itself. At any rate, I am perfectly certain that if everyone had been obliged to walk instead of being able to ride, even on the terribly inadequate ponies that were supplied to them in Tibet, but which at any rate gave them the much-needed rest, they would not have arrived at the Rongbuk Glacier fit to do the work which they afterwards successfully tackled. 
Our march from Kambazong to Tinki and from Tinki to Shekar was exactly by the same route followed by Colonel Howard Barry in the previous year, and calls for no particular comment on my part, with the exception that two small parties of Finch and Wakefield and Mallory and Somerville made a good attempt at Gyanka Nangpa to climb a 20,000-foot peak, Sankari, on the way. This they were not quite able to do. We had no difficulty in crossing the great sand dunes where the Yaru River joins the Arun, as we were able to cross it in the early morning before the wind had arisen. But on that morning, when we came to the junction of the valley of the Arun, we had a most wonderful and clear view of Mount Everest to the south. Although it was over fifty miles distant in a straight line, it did not look more than twenty. The whole of the face that was visible to us was smothered in snow. The entire setting of the piece was very strange. The country was almost bare enough to remind one of a crumpled Egyptian desert, and the strangeness and wonder was hugely increased by the south of the valley being filled with this wonderful mountain mass. At Shekar, where we arrived on April 24, we were again delayed for three days getting transport. We found the song filled with lamas. There was a great monastery in Shekar itself, and one of less account a little further beyond. The great lama of Shekar is an extremely cunning old person and a first-class trader. In his quarters at the monastery, he had immense collections of Tibetan and Chinese curios, and he knew the price of these as well as any professional dealer. We saw a great deal, in fact, a great deal too much of the lamas of Shekhar. They were the most inconceivably dirty crowd that we had met in Tibet. The dirt was quite indescribable. Although the people in Lhasa in good positions are reported to be generally cleanish, here, in the more out-of-the-way parts of Tibet, washing appears to be entirely unknown, except to the Zongpens, and I believe that the ordinary Zongpen only has a ceremonial bath on New Year's Eve, as a preparatory to the New Year, and I should not be at all surprised if Mrs. Zongpen did too. At any rate, the Zongpen's families were always infinitely better cared for in this respect than anyone else. These people, however, have the most terribly dirty cooks it is possible for the human imagination to conceive. For this reason, I never was very happy as a guest, and although the food provided for one's entertainment was often quite pleasant to eat, it was absolutely necessary not to allow one's imagination to get to work. The three days' delay at Shekar was greatly due to the movement of officials and troops marching by the same route from Tingri to Shigats, and as they had commissioned every available animal, they interfered considerably with our movements. Shekar was not comfortable during these days. The wind was not continuous, but came in tremendous gusts, and dust devils were continually tearing through the camp and upsetting everything. Shekar, as Colonel Howard Barry has described it, is wonderfully situated. The pointed mass of rock rises direct from the plains, and the white monasteries and white town are built on its sides. The illustration will describe it much better than I can. Shekar means shining glass, all the towns and houses on the sides of the mountain are brilliantly white and show up very clearly against the dark browns and reds of the hillside. It is no doubt this appearance which gives it its name. The Zongpen at Shekar was the most important official. The whole of the country south of Shekar and the Rongbuk Valley, where we were going, were in his jurisdiction. We hoped that if we could only gain his own good will, as well as his official good will, it would be of very great advantage to us. We entertained each other freely, and he was very pleased with the lengths of kin cob, open footnote, brocade, close footnote, 
which I gave to him and his wife, and also with the photographs of the Dalai and Tashe Lamas, which I gave to him. By showing him pictures and taking his own picture, we were able to make great friends with him, to our great advantage. He sent with us his agent, Chongge La, who served us well during the whole of our time in Rangbuk Glacier. In fact, without him, we should have had great difficulty in obtaining the large amounts of stores, grain, and Tibetan coolies which were necessary for us in order to keep our very large party properly provisioned when we were high up on the mountainside. Among our other presents was the inevitable Hamburg hat. Wherever we went, we presented a Homburg hat. I had provided myself with a large number of these hats from Whiteaway and Laidlaw before leaving Darjeeling. These were a cheap present, but very much valued. Any high man of a village known as a Gembola would do anything for a Homburg hat. It was ceremoniously placed on his head and was invariably well received. In fact, all recipients visibly preened themselves for some time afterwards. From Shikar, our route differed slightly from Colonel Howard Barry's. He had taken the direct road to Tingri, but our objective was the wrong book. Therefore, we crossed the Aran for the first time, and crossing by the Peng La, descended into the Zakar Chu. This was one of the pleasantest marches that we had made. The country was new, even Mallory had only been over part of it. The Peng La, meaning the Grass Pass, was altogether very interesting, and from its summit, where we all collected and lunched, we had again a fine view of Everest, and on this occasion the mountain was almost clear of snow and gave one a very different impression. We here recognized the fact that Everest on its north face is essentially a rock peak. Unfortunately for us, it did not remain clear of snow for long. Rough weather again coming up, the next time we saw it, we found it again clothed from head to foot in snow. Four marches from Chekar found us at Rongbuk, the final march from Chodzong to the Rongbuk Monastery being extremely interesting. There is only one word for it, the valleys of Tibet leading up to the Rongbuk Monastery are hideous. The hills are formless humps, dull in color, of vegetation there is next to none. At our camp at Chodzong, however, on the hillside opposite our camp, there was quite a large grove of thorn trees. We had visions of a wood fire very quickly damped when we were told that this grove was inhabited by the most active and most malicious of demons, and that he would promptly get to work if we interfered and carried away any sticks from his grove. The Upper Rongbuk Valley is an extremely sacred valley. No animals are allowed to be killed in it. In fact, the great Mani at the mouth of the valley opposite the village of Chobu marks the limit beyond which animals are not allowed to be killed. We were told that if we wanted any fresh meat, it was all to be killed lower down the valley and carried up to us. The Tibetans themselves live very largely on dried meats, both yak meat and mutton. I have never tried it myself, and its appearance was enough to put off anyone but a hungry dog, but I am told that when cooked it is by no means bad. Most Tibetans, however, eat it raw in its dried state. I bought quantities of both sorts for the porters. They cooked it as they would cook fresh meat, and it seemed to suit them very well. For the sake of their health, however, I gave them, whenever possible, fresh meat, and with the very finest results. Rongbuk means the valley of precipices or steep ravines. The Lepchas of Sikkim are occasionally called Rongpa, i.e., the people of steep ravines. It is also used for Upper Nepal, or rather for the people on the southern faces of the Himalayan heights, as they are people of the steep ravines. I have also heard it used to mean Nepal itself. Some five miles up the valley, 
one comes out onto a plateau and is suddenly almost brought up against the walls of the Rongbuk Monastery. Here also, as we came out to the Rongbuk Monastery, we found the whole southern end of the valley filled with Mount Everest and quite close to us, apparently. In any European climate, one would have said that it was a short march to its base, and one would have been terribly wrong. The air is astonishingly clear. The scale is enormous. The mountain was 16 miles off. We pitched our camp just below the monastery with considerable difficulty, as the wind was howling rather more than usual. Then we went up to pay our respects to the Rongbuk Lama. This particular Lama was beyond question a remarkable individual. He was a large, well-made man of about sixty, full of dignity, with a most intelligent and wise face, and an extraordinarily attractive smile. He was treated with the utmost respect by the whole of his people. Curiously enough, considering the terrible severity of the climate at Rongbuk, all his surroundings were far cleaner than any monastery we had previously or indeed subsequently visited. This lama has the distinction of being actually the incarnation of a god, the god Changrese, who is depicted with nine heads. With his extraordinary mobility of expression, he has also acquired the reputation of being able to change his countenance. We were received with full ceremony, and after compliments had been exchanged in the usual way by the almost groveling interpreter Karma Paul, who was very much of a Buddhist here, the Lama began to ask us questions with regard to the objects of the expedition. He was very anxious also that we should treat his people kindly. His inquiries about the objects of the expedition were very intelligent, although at the same time they were very difficult to answer. Indeed, this is not strange when one comes to think how many times in England one has been asked, what is the good of an exploration of Everest? What can you get out of it? And, in fact, what is the object generally of wandering in the mountains? As a matter of fact, it was very much easier to answer the Lama than it is to answer inquiries in England. The Tibetan Lama, especially of the better class, is certainly not a materialist. I was fortunately inspired to say that we regarded the whole expedition, and especially our attempt to reach the summit of Everest, as a pilgrimage. I am afraid, also, I rather enlarged on the importance of the vows taken by all members of the expedition. At any rate, these gentle white lies were very well received, and even my own less excusable one, which I uttered to save myself from the dreadful imposition of having to drink Tibetan tea, was also sufficiently well received. I told the Lama, through Paul, who fortunately enough was able to repress his smiles, an actual record for Paul, which must have strained him to his last ounce of strength, that I had sworn never to touch butter until I had arrived at the summit of Everest. Even this was well received. After that time I drank tea with sugar or milk, which was made specially for me. A word about Tibetan tea. The actual tea from which it is originally made is probably quite sufficiently good, but it is churned up in a great churn with many other ingredients, including salt, nitre, and butter, and the butter is nearly invariably rancid, that is, as commonly made in Tibet. I believe a superior quality is drunk by the upper classes, but at any rate, to the ordinary European taste, Castor oil is pleasant in comparison. One of the party, however, had managed to acquire a taste for it, but then some people enjoy castor oil. The Lama finally blessed us and blessed our men and gave us his best wishes for success. He was very anxious that no animals of any sort should be interfered with, which we promised, for we had already given our word not to shoot during our expedition in Tibet. 
he did not seem to have the least fear that our exploring the mountain would upset the demons who lived there but he told me that it was perfectly true that the upper rongbuck and its glaciers held no less than five wild men there is at any rate a local tradition of the existence of such beings just as there is a tradition of the wild men existing right through the himalaya as a matter of fact i really think that the rongbuck lama had a friendly feeling for me personally as he told the interpreter karma paul that he discovered that in a previous incarnation i had been a tibetan lama i do not know exactly how to take this according to the life you lead during any particular incarnation so are you ranked for the next incarnation that is to say if your life has been terrible down you go to the lowest depths and as you acquire merit in any particular existence so in the next birth you get one step nearer to nirvana i am perfectly certain that he would consider a tibetan lama a good bit nearer the right thing than a britisher could ever be and so possibly he may have meant that i had not degenerated so very far anyhow i should have liked to know however what the previous incarnations of the rest of the party had been i think in my present incarnation the passion that i have for taking turkish baths may be some slight reaction from my life in the previous and superior conditions as a tibetan lama the following morning in cold weather as usual we left to try and push our camp as high up as possible our march now became very interesting and we passed on our road which was fairly rough six or seven of the hermit's dwellings these men are fed fairly regularly from the monasteries and nunneries and do not necessarily take their vows of isolation forever all at once they try a year of it and see how they get on before they take the complete vows but how it is possible for human beings to stand what they stand even for a year without either dying or going mad passes comprehension their cells are very small and they spend the whole of their time in a kind of contemplation of the om the godhead and apparently of nothing else they are supposed to be able to live on one handful of grain per diem but this we were able successfully to prove was not the case they appear as far as we could make out to have a sufficiency of food always brought to them however there they are in little cells without firing or warm drinks all the year round and many of them last for a great number of years our march took us right up to the snout of the main rongbuk glacier and on arrival there we vainly endeavored to get our yak men to push up the trough between the glacier and the mountain side there was promptly a strike among the local transport workers but the employers of labor were wise enough to give in to their demands if we had pushed further up we must have injured a great number of animals and finally have been obliged to return so we found a fairly good site protected to a small extent from the prevailing west wind and there we collected the whole of our outfit and pitched our camp i do not think such an enormous cavalcade could possibly have mounted the rongbuck glacier before there were over three hundred baggage animals about twenty ponies fifty or sixty men in our own employ and the best part of one hundred tibetans either looking after us or coming up as representatives of the shikar zongpen finally all were paid off and the expedition was left alone in its glory the date was the first of may End of chapter 1, section 2
1922 by various authors the assault on the mountain now began in earnest our race against the monsoon i have often been asked since my return whether we should not have done better if we had started sooner i think none of us would have cared to have arrived at our upper rongbuk camp a fortnight earlier in the year nor having done so would any good purpose have been served as it was the temperature and the coldness of the wind was as much as any of us could keep up with and still keep our good health this was to be our base camp at a height of 16500 feet we made suitable dumps of stores pitched our mess tents put all our porters in tents at their own particular places and made ourselves as comfortable as circumstances allowed strengthening the tents in every way to resist the wind noel also pitched his developing tent near the small stream that issues from the rongbuk glacier on our arrival water was hardly available all the running streams were frozen hard and we drove the whole of our animals over them where the glacier stream flowed fastest in the center we got sufficient water for drinking purposes the establishment and support of such a large party for we were 13 europeans and over 60 of what may be termed other ranks in a country as desolate and as bare as the bait is a difficulty there is of course no fuel to be found with the exception of a very little scrubby root which burnt in large quantities would heat an oven but which was not good enough or plentiful enough for ordinary cooking purposes our first work beyond the establishment of the base camp was immediately to send out a reconnaissance party strut was put in charge of this and chose as his assistants norton longstaff and morshead the remainder of the party had to work very hard dividing stores and arranging for the movement up to the different camps we wished to make on the way up the east rongbuk glacier to the north colony it was pretty apparent from major wheeler's map that our advance up the east rongbuk to the glacier crossed by mr mallory in 1921 which is below the changla would not be a very difficult road but it was a very considerable question how many camps should be established and how full provision should be made for each we were naturally very anxious to save our own porters for the much more strenuous work of establishing our camp at the north col and perhaps of further camps up the mountain i had therefore on our march up made every possible endeavor to collect a large number of tibetan coolies in order that they should be employed in moving all the heavy stuff as far up the glacier as possible in fact until we came to ground which would not be suitable to them or rather not suitable to their clothing they were perfectly willing to work on any ground which was fairly dry but their form of foot covering would certainly not allow of continual work in snow we had a promise of 90 men we further had to make full arrangements for a regular supply of yak dung the whole of which as in fact everything to burn in tibet is called shing which really means wood all our fuel therefore from now on will be referred to as shing all sampa means flour meat and grain for the main had to be procured as far down as kobu tashing hong and even from other villages still further down the zakarchu that is to say very often our supplies were brought up from at least 40 miles distant we required a pretty continuous flow of everything it is wonderful how much even 70 men can get through the preliminary reconnaissance had fixed an excellent camp 
adds our first stage out. Jeffrey, Bruce and Morris with our own porters went up and so as to save tents, built a number of stone shelters and a roof with spare parts of tents. This camp was immediately provisioned and filled with every kind of supply in large amounts in order to form again a little base from which to move up further. Stroot returned with his reconnaissance on May 9, having made a complete plan for our advance and having fixed all our camps up to the flat glacier under the North Cold. During this period, Finch had also been very active with his oxygen apparatus, not only in getting it all together, but continuing the training of the personnel and in making experiments with the Leonard Hill apparatus as well. He also gave lectures and demonstrations on the use of our primer stove with which everybody practiced. Primer stoves are excellent when they are carefully treated, but our kettle cattle, unless everything goes quite as it should and are apt to blow up. Longstaff suffered considerably on the reconnaissance and was brought down not too fit. We also had a real setback. Our 90 coolies did not eventuate, only 45 appearing and these coolies only worked for about two days. When they said that their food was exhausted and they must go down for more. We took the best guarantee we could for their return by keeping back half their pay. They went for more food but found it in their houses and stopped there. We never saw them again. However, it is not to be wondered at. If ploughing in the upper valleys is to be done at all, it is to be done in May. They were therefore very anxious to get back to their homes. 90 men is a big toll for these valleys to supply, but their behaviour left us rather dispirited. We had to turn everyone on to work and then we had to make every possible exertion to collect further coolies from the different villages. The Konge La, who came with us and who understood our needs, was frantic but said he could do nothing. However, we persuaded him to do something at any rate and further offered very high prices to all the men who had come. He certainly played up and did his very best. Men came up in driblets, or rather men, women and children came as everyone in this country can carry loads and they seem to be quite unaffected by sleeping out under rocks at 16,000 or 17,000 feet. For the whole time we remained at the Rongbuk base camp, the equipping and supply of our first and second camps up the East Rongbuk was mostly carried out by local coolies and the supply of these was very difficult to assure. We never knew whether we should have three or four men working or 30. They came up for different periods so that we would often have a dozen men coming down and four or five going up and in order to keep their complete confidence, they were received and paid personally by myself or the transport officers. By degrees, their confidence was restored and a very fair stream of porters arrived. Not only that, but many of the men's own relations came over from Sola Kumbu, which is a great Sherpa settlement at the head of the Dutkosi Valley in Nepal. To reach us, they had to cross the Gangba La, sometimes called Kumbu La, which is 19,000 feet in height. Often the men's relations came and were willing to carry a load or two and then go off again. The mothers often brought their children, even of less than a year old, who did not apparently suffer. It is evidently a case of the survival of the fittest. We had brought also large stores of rice, sugar, tea and wheat grain, both for the use of the officers of the expedition and of the porters for fear we should run short of green. And this proved a great standby. The very rough Sampa of Tibet is often upsetting 
even to those most accustomed to it. It was found to be an excellent policy to feed our porters on the good grain when they came down to the base camp and to use the sampa which is cooked and ready for eating at the upper camps. Meat also had to be bought low down, sheep killed low down in the valleys and brought up for the use of the officers and men and often fresh yak meat for the porters. The Gurkhas got the fresh mutton. Dried meat was brought up in large quantities for the porters and proved of the greatest use. On the return, having received a full report from the reconnaissance party, we tackled in earnest the establishment of the different camps. Camp 3, which was under the North Coal, was first established in full. This was to be our advance base of operations and Mallory and Somerville established themselves there, their business being to make the road to the North Coal while the rest of the expedition was being pushed up to join them. On May 13, Mallory, Somerville and Van Cooley together with a tent reached the North Coal and planted the tent there. This must be described as the beginning of the Great Offensive of May 1922. Owing to the lack of coolies, all our officers and men had been working at the highest possible speed, pushing forward the necessary stores, camp equipage and fuel to camps 1 and 2, and from thence moving on to camp 3. Gurkhas being planted at each stage, whose business it was to take the convoys to and fro. Finally, camp 1, 2 and 3 were each provided with an independent cook. The duties of the cook at camp 3 were the duties of an ordinary cook in camp. Those of the cooks at camps 1 and 2 were to provide all officers passing through or staying there with meals as they were required and right well all these three men carried out their duties. The distance from the base camp to the advance base at camp 3 was fairly evenly divided. Camp 1 being at about 3 hours journey for a laden animal at a height of 17,800 feet. Camp 2 a further 4 hours up the glaciers at a height of 19,800 feet and directly below the lesser peak which terminates the northern ridge of Everest. Camp 3 on Morain at the edge of the open glacier below the Changla at a height of 20,000 feet, about 4 hours again beyond Camp 2. As our supply of Tibetan coolies improved and as the main bulk of the necessary supplies was put into Camp 3 and the oxygen and its complete outfit had been deposited in this camp, the hard work of supplying rations and fuel to Camp 1 and 2 was entirely in the hands of the local Tibetans. From Camp 2 to Camp 3, one encounters real mountaineering conditions as crevassed glaciers have to be crossed, requiring in places considerable care. The road from the base camp to Camp 2, rough enough in all conscience, was such as could very easily be negotiated by mountain people. On May 14th, Strut, Morshead and Norton left to join the advance party at Camp 3. The weather was even worse than before, the wind blowing a perfect hurricane during the daytime and the thermometer sinking to zero even in the base camp. I asked the Chongela why it should be that as summer was approaching, the weather should be continuously worse. He accounted for this without any difficulty. He said, in the middle of the month, each month, in fact, at the Rongpuk Monastery, there were special services held. These services invariably irritated the demons on the mountains and they attempted to put a stop to them by roaring more than usually loud. As soon as the services stopped, these winds would stop too. The services stopped on May 17 and the Chonge La said we would expect better weather on that date. On May 16, the last of the oxygen with Finch 
left for the upper camps and it is a curious thing that about that time the weather did slightly improve on may 20 i received a letter from strut telling me of the establishment of the camp on the north coal he himself also accompanied the party that reached the north coal here they made a very considerable encampment and put in it such light stores and cooking apparatus as would be available for parties stopping there and attacking the mountain from that spot it is very curious how on this expedition the standard of what we expected from all our members went up it was looked upon as a foregone conclusion that any member of the party could walk with comfort to the north coal 23000 feet it is quite right no doubt that the standard should have been set so high but it is a little amazing when one comes to think that only on one occasion before has a night been spent as high as 23000 feet and that on very very few occasions has this height been even attained strut was quite by way of looking upon himself as a worn out old gentleman because he felt tired at 23000 feet no doubt that is the standard we should set for ourselves but even 23000 feet is a tremendous undertaking and no one at any time or at any age of life need be anything but pleased with himself if he can get there the party established at camp 3 made little expeditions to the lakpala and rapiola and obtained a fine view of makalu and the northern face of everest but the views so obtained also gave them a sight of the approaching monsoon and this made everyone very nervous about the length of time there was left to us for our actual attack on the mountain it was this very point including also the evidence of rough and uncertain weather which had been experienced round the mountain itself that decided strut to allow four members to make an attempt on the mountain without oxygen certain defects had been found in the oxygen apparatus and finch was employed in rectifying these difficulties and at the same time he was not quite ready to proceed further jeffrey bruce was also working with him at camp 3 and made great progress in the use of the oxygen they also roped in as their assistant the gurkha tejbir having for him a special role it is not for me to describe in detail the great attempt on the mountain made by the party consisting of mallory summerwell morshead and norton but i must point out quite clearly that as a tour de force alone it stands in my opinion by itself it was the most terrific exertion carried out during unfavorable weather and in the face of that dreadful west wind not only did they reach the prodigious height of 26985 feet without the assistance of oxygen but they passed a night at 25000 feet i think it is pretty clear from their accounts that any further expedition must be clothed in windproof suitings and these of the lightest when attacking everest or probably any other great mountain in this particular part of the world morse head who suffered far more than any of the others from the cold did not employ his windproof suiting in the early part of the climb and i believe by his omission he very greatly decreased his vitality and it was probably this decrease which was the reason of his terrible frost bites it was a tremendous effort unparalleled in the history of mountain exploration but it gave immense confidence to all that the mountain was not unconquerable if on the first occasion such a gigantic height could be reached we were pretty certain that later with the experience so gained and with the weather in the climber's favor 
instead of the horrible conditions under which this climb was undertaken the mountain would in time yield to assault the following day notwithstanding their fatigue they determined to get down to camp 1 they certainly were a sight on arrival i have never seen such a crowd of swollen and blistered and weary mountaineers before but they were all naturally tremendously elated with their performance strut came down with them and quite rightly too he had been a very long time living about 21000 feet and this in itself is a great strain i thoroughly endorse his judgment in making this great attempt without oxygen at first sight it would seem that it was not wise to send so many of the blessed climbers at once on the mountain before the oxygen apparatus was ready but he felt and i consider he was quite right that as the weather was so bad and the monsoon was evidently arriving before its time and as at the moment the oxygen apparatus was in such a doubtful condition it was far better to make an attempt than possibly to fail in making any attempt at all during the time that the great attempt on the mountain without oxygen was being made finch was employed in getting the oxygen apparatus into order it had suffered in a good many ways and the method of inhaling the oxygen appeared to be deficient the face masks in fact causing a feeling of suffocation and not allowing a sufficiency of ordinary air to be inhaled finch had a very difficult time getting all this apparatus into order in this very high camp it would have been difficult anywhere but up here in the great cold and the great height it was infinitely more troublesome as soon as the apparatus was in working order they made numerous training walks up on to the passes looking down into the heart of the kharta valley from where they were able to see the southern faces of the himalaya and to know the way in which the clouds were pushing up from the south they had also instructed to a certain extent the gurkha tejbir bura in the use of oxygen as they intended him to help them in their advance on the mountain end of section 3
and I think they would have been perfectly justified after two nights spent at this tremendous altitude if they had given up their attempt and returned. But they had too much grit for that. Here should have come in the use of Tejbir, if he had been quite himself. He was given extra oxygen to carry, and their intention was that, after proceeding as far as the ridge, he should be sent back to their camp to wait their descent. However, Tejbir was completely played out when he had reached twenty-six thousand feet. The party continued until they reached a point which had been found to work out at twenty-seven thousand two hundred thirty-five feet. Here Geoffrey had an accident to his oxygen apparatus, and far from becoming immediately unconscious, as we had been warned would be the case before we left England if climbers were suddenly deprived of their artificial oxygen supply, he was able to attach himself to Finch's instrument while Finch was repairing the damaged apparatus. Slightly higher than this point they were completely exhausted, and had to beat a retreat, the whole party finally descending to the North Call, where food was found ready for them, and by the evening got down to Camp 3 itself, a great performance considering the altitude and that the descent was over 6,000 feet. I think it is pretty certain that Tejbir's breakdown was largely due to his not having a windproof suit. This biting west wind goes through wool as if it was paper, and he was exposed to it for a great period of time, and no doubt it very largely sapped his vitality. One result of this last attempt is that it increases our hopes almost to the point of certainty that with luck and good weather, and when the oxygen apparatus has been further improved, the summit of Everest will be attained. All the time the porters were working from our base camp, and up there was great competition between them, and also considerable betting as to who would do the hardest work, the true Tibetan-born porters or the Sherpas from the south. It was rather amusing to see the superior airs which the Sherpas invariably gave themselves in traveling through Tibet. They considered Tibetans undoubtedly jangly, and treated them very much from the point of view that a clever Londoner does the simplest form of yokel when he appears in London. At any rate, they backed themselves heavily to beat the Tibetans. It was a pretty good race, but finally they came out well on top. In fact, I think all but one who reached 25,000 feet and over were Sherpas. Paul, the interpreter, and Gyaljan had a great bet also about the officers, Paul favoring Finch and Gyaljan Mallory. As a matter of fact, there was quite a little book made among all the followers with regard to who would go highest among the officers. I did not even belong to the also-rans between them. Oxygen was looked upon as a matter of no particular importance, and I believe Paul made Gyaljan pay up, as he had won with Finch against Mallory. 4. Wild On May 27 we welcomed the arrival of John MacDonald with a further supply of money, as owing to the large calls of our enormous transport, we had been afraid of running short. This was very cheering to us indeed, and also a very great help, for besides the money, Mr. MacDonald brought with him two or three servants very well accustomed to travel in Tibet, and knowing all the people of the country. These we were able to use as special messengers, and we sent off immediately by them an account of the climbs that had occurred. The second of them was unfortunately delayed by illness, and this accounted for the slight delay in letting the world know of our great second oxygen climb. The first messenger rode through in ten days from Rongbuk to Ferry, and by so doing almost caught up the previous letters which had been dispatched through the Tsongpens. Arrangements are, after all, not so bad in Tibet when one considers that Tibetans themselves have no understanding or care for time, 
The promptness with which the different communications were sent through was rather wonderful. There were, on occasions, no doubt, hitches, but generally speaking, the postal arrangements worked very well. The weather had become more and more threatening, but we could not bring ourselves absolutely to give up for this year the attempts on Everest. At the same time, the casualties were heavy. Our medical members had all got to work and had tested thoroughly each member of the expedition that had been employed. It was evidently absolutely necessary that Moorshead should return as quickly as possible into hospital in India and there were also several other members who were suffering from their hard work. Longstaff had shot his bolt as far as this year's work was concerned, and it was also most important that Moorshead should have a doctor with him. Strutt, too, was very much overdone, and it was time for him to return. Norton was strained and tired, and Geoffrey's toes, though not so bad as Moorshead's, required that he should quickly go down to a warmer climate. We therefore made up two convoys, which were to start together from the base camp. Longstaff, Strutt, and Moorshead to go with the Sardar Gyaljan direct to Darjeeling, traveling via Kambat Song, and from Kambat Song directly south to Lakan and Gangtok, and Darjeeling by the shorter and quicker route. This would bring them quite a week sooner to Darjeeling than the route by which we entered Tibet. It was most important that Moorshead should be got back as quickly as possible. In fact, we were all very nervous about his condition, and we were afraid that it might be necessary for some operation to be carried out actually on the march. It had always been our idea that as soon as we had finished with our summer attack on Everest, the whole expedition should go into the Karta Valley, where Colonel Howard Bury in 1921 made his camps, and there recover from our labors. The Karta Valley is far lower than any other district in this part of Tibet, lying between 11,000 and 12,000 feet above sea level. There are also many comforts which do not exist in other parts. There is good cultivation, trees, and grass to a certain extent, and even some vegetables are obtainable. It is altogether a charming spot, very charming compared with any other country we were likely to see. The road was very high for sick men, as it led over the Doya La, which is only three feet under 17,000 feet, but having once got there, they would be in comfort compared with the Rongbuk Glacier. Having decided on sending off this large convoy of invalids and semi-invalids, we then began to organize our third attempt on Everest, but so doubtful was the weather that the party was organized for two complete purposes. It was fully provisioned with porters, far more than would in the ordinary way be necessary for an attempt on the mountain itself, considering that the camps were all fully provisioned. We had brought every single man off the glacier after the last attempt in order to give them all a complete rest. Everyone had now had a long rest, with the exception of Finch, who had only had five days. He, however, was very keen to join the party. The second role of this party was to evacuate as many camps as possible, according to the condition of the weather, and it was carefully explained to them that if, in their opinion, the weather was such as to preclude an attempt on the mountain, they were to use the greatest possible care and run no undue risks. It was organized as follows, the climbing party to consist of Finch, Mallory, and Somerville, the backing-up party, Crawford, and Wakefield, to remain at Camp 3, and Morris, in whose charge the whole of the transport arrangements were, was to take charge of the evacuation of camps either after the attempt had been made, or if no attempt was made, immediately. Such was the condition of the weather that I had no very great hope that even the Chang La camp could be evacuated, but it was most necessary to recover all stores left at the great depot at Camp 3. This was of the utmost importance, as not only was the oxygen apparatus there, but also a great number of surplus stores, stores which we should be in need of. 
We had, of course, rationed these camps with a view to staying there probably a fortnight longer. But this year the monsoon had evidently advanced at least ten days earlier than usual. That, however, we could not foresee, nor could we foresee the very great severity of the 1922 monsoon of the eastern Himalaya. This we only heard about on our return to India later on. It was a curious thing that the Rongbuk Lama had sent up to congratulate the porters, and ourselves also, on having come back safely from the earlier attempts, but he warned the porters to leave the mountain alone, as he had had a vision of an accident. On June 3 the great convoy set off and spent the night at Camp 1. On June 4 we were rather overwhelmed to see Finch staggering into camp. He was very much overdone, and had by no means recovered from his terrific exertions on the mountain. It was quite evident that he was finished for this year, and he was lucky to be just in time to join the detachment returning to India direct. It was a very great loss to the party. Not only would he have been of special assistance as the oxygen expert, but his experience and knowledge of snow and ice under the conditions then prevailing would have been of the greatest advantage to the party. The weather now had completely broken. It was snowing hard. Even at our base camp we had two inches of snow. The whole of the mountains were a complete smother of snow. Notwithstanding this, and under the conditions quite rightly, the convoy pushed on to Camp 3. On arrival at Camp 3 the weather cleared. The wind temporarily went round to the west, and one perfect day of rest and sunshine was enjoyed. Morris, all this time, was on the line of communication. He had the whole of the service of evacuation to arrange, and was laying out his convoys of Tibetan coolies and others with that point of view in his mind. It was lucky he did so. The great foe, generally speaking, on Everest during the dry period, is the horrible west wind. But now the monsoon had to all intents and purposes arrived. The west wind now was our one and only friend. If it would again blow for a short period, the mountain would probably return temporarily to a fairly safe condition. The south wind is a warm and wet, though fairly strong, current. But the result of even a short visit from it absolutely ruins the mountainside. However, at Camp 3 they enjoyed one full day of sunshine, followed by a very low temperature, 12 degrees below zero, the following night, and it was considered, owing both to the strength of the sun and to the fact that the west wind had temporarily got the better of the south wind, that the mountain would in all probability be safely solidified so as to render an attempt justifiable. Therefore, on the morning of June 7, a start was made to reach the North Col, with the object of spending a night there and making an assault on the mountain the following day. It was also proposed to carry up as much oxygen as possible to the greatest height they could get the porters to go, and from that point only, to use the remaining oxygen to make a push over the summit. I think this was a thoroughly sound proposition. They were all acclimatized, and it seems to me that it is probably better, especially if there is any chance of a shortage of oxygen, to use one's acclimatization to go as high as one can without undue fatigue, and from thence on to use the oxygen. No doubt it would be possible, and of advantage, if the oxygen apparatus should ever be improved, to use it for the whole of an ascent, say from 20,000 feet or so. But against that comes the chance that in case of any cessation of the oxygen supply, the danger would be very much greater. The caravan consisted of Mallory, Somerville, and Crawford who was going with them as far as the North Col to assist them and to relieve them of the hard labor of remaking the path up to that point. Mallory will relate further on how, at about one o'clock, when about half the journey had been completed, the snow suddenly cracked across and gave way, and the whole caravan was swept down the hillside, and seven porters killed. On return to Camp 3, a porter was dispatched 
to take the news down to the base camp, and arrived that same night at about nine o'clock, having traveled at full speed. Really a wonderful performance. There was nothing to be done, that was quite evident. And all I could do was to await the return of the party for a full account, sending news at the same time to Morris to evacuate the camps at the greatest possible speed. Mallory arrived by himself, very tired, and naturally very upset on Thursday the 8th. Again was shown what a terrible enemy the great Himalaya is. Risks and conditions which would appear justifiable in the Alps can never be taken in the Himalaya. So great is the scale that far greater time must be allowed for the restoration of safe conditions. When once the condition of a mountain is spoiled, the greater size requires more time for its readjustment. The odds against one are much greater in the Himalaya than in the smaller ranges. Its sun is hotter, its storms are worse, the distances are greater. Everything is on an exaggerated scale. Mallory was followed next morning by Wakefield, Crawford, and Somerville, who brought down with them a certain amount of the lighter equipment. Morris was all this time working to salvage as much as he possibly could from the different camps. We had a large number of Tibetans pushed up as far as Camp 2, and as many of our own porters as were available, not very many, I am sorry to say by now, working with Morris in the evacuation of Camp 3. In this work the cooks and orderlies also joined. It was perfectly evident by now that the monsoon had set in in full force. On his return Morris gave me a very vivid description of how, even during the one day that he stayed up after the others had left at Camp 3, although the weather was fairly fine, the whole face of the mountainsides began to change. How under the influence of the soft south wind the mountains seemed to melt and disintegrate. Not only that, but even the great teeth formed by the pressure of the collateral glaciers, probably great seracs that spring out like the teeth of a huge saw on the glacier, and which seemed solid enough to last for all time, were visibly crumbling up, and some of them were even toppling over. The great trough of black ice up the center of the glacier which Strutt had described had turned into a rushing torrent, and all this in an incredibly short period of time. Snow also fell at intervals, and it was quite apparent that when the monsoon settled down the whole of Camp 3 would be under a great blanket of fresh snow. Under these conditions a good deal of stuff, especially the supplies of grain, sampa, and so on, for our porters, had to be abandoned. As for Camps 4, 5, and 6, there was naturally no chance of rescuing anything from them. Thus was occasioned a fairly large loss of outfit, nor was there any possibility that any of it could have stood under any conditions more than a month's exposure to the weather. There was a considerable loss in the oxygen apparatus, but Morris managed to bring down three full outfits in more or less dilapidated condition. On Morris's return to the base camp, the party was completed. One of the difficulties in having so large an outfit as ours was the difficulty of obtaining transport when necessary. Therefore, as soon as we saw signs of the monsoon, it was necessary to make arrangements for our return, as at least fifteen days were required to collect the still large number of animals required for our moving. These animals have to be searched for all down the Tsakar Chu, collected and brought up, nor when once collected could they be kept waiting for very long, as the supply of fodder in the upper valley was absolutely nil fodder did not exist. When we sent off the previous party they traveled as lightly as possible, but even then the small number of animals which was required for their transport had not been obtained with any great ease. Fortunately John MacDonald was with us and was free, and it was owing to his help, for he speaks Tibetan as well as Nepali, and is thoroughly accustomed to deal with the people, that the two parties of Strutt and Norton were able to proceed with such little delay. It had required a full fifteen days to collect enough animals to move the main body. I had arranged for a latitude of one or two days, which meant that they should have spare food up to that extent, 
but beyond that it would be quite impossible, naturally, to make provision. Of course, as one of our secondary objects, we had hoped, if our party had not been exhausted, to have explored the West Wrong Book and the Great Glens on the western faces of Everest. And besides this most interesting piece of exploration, of which really not very much more than glimpses were obtained during 1921, there is the prodigious and fascinating group of Cho Uyo and Gya Chang Kang to be explored. As I before pointed out, of course, not only was our major work and the whole object of the expedition the tackling of the great mountain, but also it was a race against the weather. So we could let nothing interfere with our main object. It was quite clear now, as we were situated, that an exploration of the West Wrong Book was entirely beyond consideration. Not only was the whole party fairly laid out, but to get up enthusiasm in a new direction after what we had gone through was pretty nearly out of the question. Somerville, the absolutely untirable, had very strong yearnings in that direction, but it would have been nothing more than a scramble in the dark if he had gone. The weather was broken and was getting worse and worse every day. Snow fell occasionally even at our camp. Further up everything was getting smothered. Everest, when we had glimpses of it, was a smother of snow from head to foot, and no one who saw it in these days could ever imagine that it was a rock peak. I am afraid also that most of us had only one real idea at the time, and that was to get out of the wrong book valley. However, during our wait for the transport, the annual fate of the wrong book monastery occurred. There was a great pilgrimage to the monastery to receive the blessing of the Lama and to witness the annual dances. Most of our party went down to see dances, and Noel especially to cinematograph the whole ceremony, dances as well as religious ceremonies. I have not done justice up to this point to Noel's work. He was quite indefatigable from the start, and had lost no opportunity during our march up, not only of taking many pictures of the country and expedition, both with his ordinary camera and with his cinema camera, but of studying Tibetan life as well. He had, in the Wrong Book Valley, pitched his developing tents near the only available clear water at the moment, and had there been untiring in developing his cinema photographs. He had made two expeditions to the head of the East Wrong Book Glacier, and had even taken his cameras and his cinema outfit on to the North Col itself, where he remained for no less than four days, a most remarkable tour de force. On the last occasion he had accompanied the evacuation party, and had been actually taking pictures of the start of the last attempt to get to the North Col and to climb Everest. Of course, his performances with the camera are entirely unprecedented. The amount of work he carried out was prodigious, and the enthusiasm he displayed under the most trying conditions of wind and weather was quite wonderful. We now feel that we can produce a real representation of our life and of life in Tibet in a manner in which it has never hitherto been brought before people's eyes and this gives a reality to the whole expedition which i hope will make all those who are interested in mountain exploration understand the wonderful performances and the great difficulties under which the climbing members of this expedition and the transport officers labored after the news of the accident had been received we immediately got in touch with the great lama of Rongbuk who was intensely sympathetic and kind over the whole matter. It is very strange to have to deal with these curious people. They are an extraordinary mixture of superstition and nice feelings. Buddhist services were held in the monasteries for the men who had been lost, and for the families, and all the porters, and especially the relations of the men who were killed, were received and specially blessed by the Rongbuk Lama himself. All the Nepalese tribes who live high up in the mountains, and also the Sherpa Botias, have a belief that when a man slips on the mountains and is killed, 
or when he slips on a cliff above a river and falls into it and is drowned, that this is a sacrifice to God, and especially to the God of the actual mountain or river. They further believe that anyone whosoever who happens to be on the same cliff or on the same mountain at the same place, exactly at the same time of year, on the same date, and at the same hour, will also immediately slip and be killed. I also received, during our return, a very kind letter from the Maharaja of Nepal, condoling with us on the loss of our porters. He writes as follows. Personally, and as a member of the Royal Geographical Society, I share with you the grief that must have resulted from the frustration of the keen hope entertained by you and the party. My heartiest sympathies go to you and to the families of the seven men who lost their lives in the attempt. This puts in my mind the curious belief that persistently prevails with the people here, and which I came to learn so long ago in the time of our mutual friend, Colonel Manners Smith, when the question of giving permission for the project of climbing the King of Heights through Nepal was brought by you and discussed in a council of barauders. It is to the effect that the height is the abode of the god and goddess Shiva and Parvati, and any attempt to invade the privacy of it would be a sacrilege fraught with disastrous consequences to this Hindu country and its people. And this belief or superstition, as one may choose to call it, is so firm and strong that people attribute the present tragic occurrence to the divine wrath which on no occasion they would draw on their heads by their actions. This, I must point out, is of course the southern and Hindu people's tradition, and did not in the same way affect all the porters whom we employed, as they were Buddhists by faith. The whole of our people, however, took the view common to both, and dismissed their troubles very rapidly and very lightly, holding simply that the men's time had come, and so there was no more to be said about it. If their time had not come, they would not have died. It had come, and they had died, and that was all. What need to say any more? As a matter of fact, this philosophic way of looking on everything also allowed them to say that they were perfectly ready to come back for the next attempt, because if it was written that they should die on Everest, they should die on Everest. If it was written that they would not die on Everest, they would not. And that was all there was to be said in the matter. End of the Assault on the Mountain by C. G. Bruce, Part Two. Recording by Richard Potenza. Chapter Three, Part One, The Return by Carter, of the Assault on Mount Everest, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Vlahakis, San Francisco. On June 14th, we were cheered with the news that our transport was approaching, and I think a good many sighs of relief were uttered. We had quite made up our minds to cross over into the Kata Valley, and, having had a sufficiency of rest, to explore the Kamachu more completely than had been done in 1921, and, if possible, to examine the whole gorge of the Arun, where it breaks through the great Himalayan range. But our first idea was to get down to a decent elevation, where some rest could be obtained where we could get adequate bathing and washing for our clothes and get everybody into a fairly respectable condition again. Living continuously for many weeks at elevations never below and generally far above 16,500 feet does not tend to general cleanliness, and it also, after a time I think, tends to general degeneration. 
At the same time, we were by no means convinced that at medium elevations there is any particular loss of physical powers or that acclimatization takes long to complete. I found personally that I was getting better and better when exerting myself at the medium heights to which I went. I found that during the march that was in front of us that I could walk at elevations of over 16,000 feet very much more easily than when I first arrived at the Rongbuk Glacier, and this certainly does not show that one had been degenerating physically. I think really that the strain was more a mental one, and this remark probably also applies to every member of our party. At the same time, it was most exhilarating to think that one was descending to a low altitude. We made our first march back to the Rongbuk Glacier, and that evening we were left in peace by the llamas, that is to say, but not by the wind, which howled consistently, bringing with it thin driving sleet. On the following morning we arranged that we should all meet the Rongbuk Lama, and so, having got our kit packed, we left it to be loaded by the Tibetans, and the whole party, including all our followers, porters, all the Gurkhas who were with us, with the exception of Tejbir, who had gone on in advance with Geoffrey Bruce and Norton, went up to the monastery. There we waited in the courtyard until the Lama himself descended from his inner sanctuary and state. Tea was first served in the usual way, ordinary tea being provided, I am glad to say, for the others and myself by special arrangement of the interpreter. I think Noel, however, a man of infinite pluck, took down a bowl or two of true Tibetan tea. The Lama made special inquiries after the expedition and then began the blessing. He offered us his very best wishes and presented me, through Paul, with a special mark of his goodwill, a little image of one of the Taras, or queens of Tibetan mythology. My special one was the green Tara, who takes precedence among all ladies. This was a mark of very great favour. Paul was also presented with another little mark and many little packets of medicine, which were to preserve him from all and every description of the illnesses which afflict and worry humanity. The Buddhistic side of Paul came up on this occasion, and he received his blessings and the medicines in the most humble and reverent spirit. The Gurkhas all went up too and were suitably blessed, being even more humble in their aspect than the very much overcome and reverent porters themselves. They could hardly be induced to approach His Holiness. However, we all parted on the most friendly terms and left our own good wishes for what they were worth with the old gentleman. By three o'clock in the afternoon we arrived at Chodzong, but what a difference there was in our march. The few days of the monsoon and the small amount of rain which had fallen, even this little way back from the mountains, had changed the whole aspect of the valley. Flowers had begun to show, and in places there was even a little green grass. At Chodzong there was quite a considerable amount of grass, and we enjoyed here what was more pleasant than anything we had experienced for a long time a shower of rain. We had almost forgotten the existence of rain and the relief from the very trying dryness of the Tibetan atmosphere, which parches one's skin as if one was in the Sahara, was immense. Still, at Chodzong it was cold at night and the temperature below freezing point. Here we found all our ponies and their saces returned from taking Norton and Geoffrey Bruce over to the Kata Valley. Also the gigantic Drubler and his small Giamda very fit and well. This camp at Chodzong was a place particularly impressed on our minds on our way up, as we had there the very coldest breakfast that we anywhere indulged in. The wind was blowing half a hurricane, and the temperature nearly at zero, while our breakfast was actually being brought to us in the morning, and the misery and discomfort of that particular temperature 
was in great contrast to the delightful weather we were now experiencing. From this place we diverted a large convoy of our spare baggage to Shekar to await our return after we had finished our further wanderings in Kata. The following day took us up the Rebu Valley. It was a fairly long and very windy march, but the climate was so greatly improved that, generally speaking, it was very enjoyable, and again we camped in a very pleasant spot in grassy fields. Such a change from our late life. Not only that, but in the evening, as the people up here had no prejudices, we caught a sufficient number of snow trout, really a barbell, to make a dish. My own servant, Kaha Singh, the cook, always had a reputation for being, and always was, a first-rate poacher. At any form of netting or tickling trout, he was a great hand. However, he was completely eclipsed later on by one of MacDonald's servants, to whom I am quite certain no fish poacher that ever was could have given a wrinkle. He was also quite a good hand at catching fish with rod and line. The Gurkhas, as usual, took a hand. They are immensely fond of fish and their methods are primitive. Tejbir, who came along with us, was nearly recovered from his exertions with Finch and Geoffrey. He had lost a good deal of skin from seven or eight fingers and a large patch off his foot. But though his frostbites were many, they were slight. He was really suffering from being rather overdone and took at least a fortnight to recover. The next days was an interesting march, though very long and tiring for the animals. Our way led over the high ridge, which divides the Dzakachu country from the Kata district. Although the rise was not very great from our camp at approximately 13,500 feet, Still, the pass itself was just 17,000 feet, or rather, to be absolutely accurate, just three feet under. The way led for several miles, hardly rising at all, up a grassy valley, and then over the strangest and wildest and most completely barren of hillsides. From here, no doubt, we should have a fine view of the great supporters of Everest but clouds completely obliterated the mountains. We had the ordinary balmy Tibetan breezes through the snows, but modified to what they would have been quite a short time before. The descent from the Doya La was very fine indeed, the colour wonderful, and very soon giving promise of a greener land. The first 300 feet on the Kata side is down a very steep, rocky track, and I was told afterwards by Geoffrey Bruce that he never dismounted, and that the wonderful Giamda had carried him down without making a mistake. On that day we all of us well overstopped 17,000 feet. There was a little joke about Crawford who was not very tall, but who certainly did not deserve his nickname of the two-and-a-half-footer given him by the porters. It was a joke among them afterwards, when told the height of the pass, that he had just missed the 17,000 feet by six inches. It was a very long descent, but into a valley rapidly changing from bare hillsides to grassy banks. Never was there a more welcome change, and here we came into a real profusion of alpine flowers. It was a full 20-mile march to our halting place in Trateza, and as we got down where the valley narrowed, we passed the very picturesquely situated village of Teng. Everybody was delighted with the change. Our camp was pitched near the village on quite thick and beautiful green grass, and the hillsides were green and covered with bushes. We were absolutely happy and intensely relieved and pleased with our surroundings. The ponies and animals simply pounced on the green grass and were even more happy than their masters. The following morning we all started off in wonderful spirits, shared in by the yaks, several of whom took it into their heads to run amok, and we had a first-class scene of confusion in the rather tight camp before we could get matters straightened out. 
one yak especially was peculiarly gay here, and took to the hillside after throwing his load on three or four occasions. We had, in fact, a real hunt after him. Everybody joined in the fun, and I am afraid on one or two occasions some of the more light-hearted of the porters kept him going on purpose. This march, however, was even pleasanter than the one before. The part we were travelling down grew richer and richer. The hillsides were thickly clothed in cedar trees and in shrubs of many kinds. The valley itself, wherever possible, was cultivated. We passed on our way two or three small villages, extremely well situated, and finally debouched into an open valley, full of fields and cultivation, where we joined the main Arun Valley and the district of Kata proper. Kata is a fairly large district and not a village. The larger settlement is called Kata Shika, and it is there that the Tsongpen has his abode. The whole of this district also is under the Tsongpen of Sheka Tsong, and the Tsongpen of Shika apparently has not as full powers by any means as the Tsongpen at Sheka Tsong. However, for all that, he appears to be quite a little autocrat. It was quite delightful riding out into the main valley, and there also we were cheered by meeting Geoffrey Bruce and John MacDonald, who had come out some miles from where our camp had been established at the small village of Teng. We passed also the old gentleman known, I think, in the last year's expedition as the Habuldar, but whom Geoffrey and Norton had promptly christened Father William. He was a rather officious but at the same time most helpful old man, and on our way back he asked us to come in for a meal into his very attractive garden. But as it was only a mile or so from Teng where our camp was pitched, we did not think it was worth while then, knowing we should see a good deal more of the old gentleman. He brought us plenty of what we were yearning for, fresh green vegetables, the very greatest boon. We found our invalids very nearly recovered. Norton's feet, however, were tender and Geoffrey's toes still in a distinctly unpleasant condition. It was wonderful, nevertheless, how well both were able to get about with the help of plenty of socks. Our camp was pitched in fields at a height of about 10,800 feet, and below us, at about the distance of three miles, we could see the entrance to the great Arun Gorge, where it cuts through the Himalaya. On the opposite side of the Arun, the two mountains, old friends of ours that we had noticed on our way up, looked down on the camp. On the whole of my way down, I was struck with the resemblance between these valleys and parts of Lahul and Kai Lang. They were less rich, however, and the forests of pencil cedar not so fine. But still, the whole character of the country and of the hillsides was very much the same. Above the camp at Teng was a very well-situated monastery, which Noel afterwards photographed. Soon after our arrival during the afternoon, the Tsong Pen from Katashika arrived to meet us. He was reported at first to be very suspicious of the party, and such indeed appeared to be the case. However, after a long conversation and having presented him with pictures of the Dalai Lama and of the Tashilampo Lama, as well as with the ubiquitous Homburg hat, he became much more confidential and we finished up very good friends. He also told us that on the following day he would bring down some Tibetan dancers and acrobats to give us a performance. The rapidity with which the whole party seemed to recover at Kata was perfectly wonderful. Everybody was in first-class health and spirits, especially all our porters, and that night their high spirits were not only due to the atmospheric conditions, but were taken into them in a manner they thoroughly approved of and of which they had been deprived for some time. However, after all their very hard work and the wonderful way in which they had played up, it is not altogether to be wondered at if they did occasionally go on to the spree on their way back. So attractive was the whole country and so strong was the call of the Kama Valley 
that we were all very soon anxious to get a move on again. Tejbir was still not quite recovered and would be all the better for further rest, so he was detailed with one of the other Gurkhas, Sarabjit, to stay behind and take charge of our camp and spare equipment. The rest of us all set to work and planned an advance into the Kama Valley and we hoped also an exploration of it, both towards the Snows Up and to the Popti La, which is the main road into the valley of the Arun, and, if possible, up the great Arun Gorge itself. But this year's monsoon never gave us a chance of carrying out more than a small portion of that program. We were now living in an entirely different climate. We had many showers of rain, which were hailed with delight by the people of the country, as their crops were now fairly well advanced. The crops at Carter consist chiefly of peas and barley, as usual, but there is a certain amount of other grain and vegetables to be obtained from the gardens. Having arranged the transport, we started our caravan off to Carter Shika. Norton had issued a large-hearted invitation for us to lunch with him at the mouth of the Arun Gorge. Previously, Norton and Geoffrey had explored, while they were waiting, the country round as far as they could go on horseback, and Norton had discovered at the mouth of a gorge an alp like those on the Kashmir Mountains, surrounded with a forest which he described as equal to a southern Himalayan forest, and we positively must go and see it, and climb up the hillsides and look down into the gorge itself. We all accepted his invitation with the greatest alacrity. On the afternoon of the day before starting, the Tsong Pen, as he had promised, produced us his acrobats and dancers, and we had a very hilarious afternoon. They were not particularly good either as actors or as acrobats, but they danced with prodigious vigour, and it was altogether great fun. Before all the dancers and the little plays, they covered their faces with masks of an extremely primitive kind. They failed at most of their tricks, once or twice before accomplishment, and these failures were invariably greeted both by the spectators and by the actors with shrieks of laughter. On the following day, June 19th, we all set off, the luggage proceeding direct to Kata Shika under the charge of the interpreter and the Gurkhas, while we switched off to Norton's Alp. It really was delightful, and though the forest was rather a dwarfed forest, it contained several kinds of fir trees, birch, and rhododendron scrub, and after Tibet was in every way quite charming. We climbed up the hillsides and suddenly came round the corner onto great cliffs diving straight down into the Arun Valley, and we could see further down how enormously the scale of the mountains increased. It was a most attractive gorge, but on our side it appeared to be almost impossible to have got along, so steep were the hillsides. On the far bank, that is the true left bank, the east bank, there was a well-marked track, and it appears the lower down it crosses to the right bank and then continues on the right bank to the junction with the Kama Chu. Later on, Noel and Morris were able to explore and photograph the greater part of the gorge. We all sat on the top of the cliffs and indulged in the very pleasant amusement of rolling great rocks into the river a thousand feet below us. Always a fascinating pursuit, especially when one is quite certain that there is no one in the neighbourhood. The lunch did not turn up for some time when an exploring party discovered that our porters, who had been detailed to carry it, had dropped in at a village and visited the Bali Mao and could hardly get along at all in consequence. Finally, however, the lunch was rescued and an extremely pleasant time passed. It was absolutely epicurean, gruyere cheese, sardines, truffled yaks, and finally, almost our last three bottles of champagne. It was intended to be an epicurean feast, and it was so. By the evening, we arrived in Shika and found our camp pitched in beautiful grassy fields high above the village of Shika. 
The Tsong Pen was very anxious to entertain the whole party, but we were rather lazy and did not want to go down to his village, which was some way off, but promised him that we would pay him a visit on our return from Kama. The Tsong Pen, however, imported his cooks and full outfit and gave us a dinner in our own tent, himself sitting down with us and joining in. He was a plump and very well-dressed little man, and by now had completely recovered his confidence in us. He was, however, very anxious that we should do no shooting, and this anxiety of his was no doubt very largely occasioned by the fact that he had only arrived from Lhasa about a fortnight before our arrival. We were to reach in two marches, Sakayathang in the Kama Valley, where Colonel Howard Burry and his party had encamped the year before. Our first march led us over the Samchang La to a camp called Chokabo. It was a steep and rough walk over the pass, but knowing the wonderful capacity of the Tibetan pony, several of the party took ponies with them. It was necessary both for Geoffrey and for Norton to rest their feet as much as possible until completely cured. And so, on arrival at the Chokabo, they took their ponies on over our next pass, the Chogla, which is no less than 16,280 feet and down into the Kamachu. This is a very rough road indeed. We had here reached the most perfect land of flowers, and in the lowland which lies between the Samchung La and our camp at Chokabo, we found every description of alpine flora, reinforced by rhododendrons, the very last of the rhododendrons. We also found several kinds of iris. The road leading up to the Samchung La was extremely steep and rough, but the path was well marked, and it was evident there was a considerable amount of traffic leading into the Kamachu. The local people stoutly denied that yaks could cross, but later on we actually found yaks carrying loads over this road. I can quite understand their reason for not wishing to send their yaks, as the road from one end to the other is very bad for animals. At Chocabo, all the riding ponies were dispensed with, with the exception of Jeffreys and Norton's. These two ponies they particularly wished to look after, as they had bought them, knowing that they must assure mounts, probably to the end of the journey. They had certainly picked up the most useful little couple. All the same, they had to walk most of the way, as it was quite out of the question for anyone to have ridden at all except over short pieces of open ground, and it was perfectly wonderful the way in which these two ponies got over the most shocking collection of rocks, big and little, and how they negotiated the extremely slippery and rocky path which led down from the Chogla. The ascent to the Chogla was easy, and the latter half of it still under winter snow, as also was the first thousand feet of the descent. The mountains were interesting on each side, so much so that Somerville and Crawford went off for a little climb on the way. The descent was delightful, although the road was, as I have said, very stony indeed. One passes through every description of eastern Himalayan forest and wonderful banks of rhododendrons of many kinds. We were, unfortunately, much too late for their full bloom but a month earlier this descent must be perfectly gorgeous, the whole hillsides being covered with flowering rhododendrons. The descent to Sakayathang is at least 5,000 feet, and maybe a little more. Thang means a flat bench, and such was Sakayathang, set in gorgeous forest and deep in grass and flowers. But the weather was breaking fast, and by evening the clouds had descended and wiped out the whole of the valley. Before it was quite obliterated, we got glimpses of what it must be like in fine weather. End of chapter 3, part 1《The Assault on Mount Everest》1922. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Vlahakis, San Francisco. In the early morning of the following day, Thursday, June 22, when I woke up and looked out of my tent, the mouth of which looked straight up the valley between the big mountains, the clouds had lifted somewhat, and the whole end of the valley was filled with the gorgeous Chomolonzo Peak, and for an hour or so I was able to watch it with the clouds drifting round its flanks, and then, just as the sun lit up the valley for a moment, the great monsoon clouds coming up from the valley of the Arun, driven by the wind up the Kamachu, completely wiped it out again. It was a glorious glimpse, and the only one we obtained during our stay of more than a week in Sakayathang. We found encamped in the neighbouring woods Nepalese shepherds with their flocks of sheep, and saw for the first time the very fine type of sheep which these men own, a far bigger and better breed of sheep than exists in Tibet, and also carrying a very much finer coat of wool. They were rather strange to look at at first, as the whole forepart of their body was black and the hind part white. We also found that the Nepalese shepherds thoroughly understood the value of their own sheep. They keep them all to make butter from their milk, which they collect and sell in the bazaars in Nepal. All these shepherds were Gurkhas, belonging either to the Gurung tribe or Kirantis, and, curiously enough, one of them was related to my servant Kahar Singh, he having gone through the mitt ceremony with his relations, and that is quite sufficient for him to be also a mitt. This mitt ceremony is rather difficult to explain. It is not exactly blood brotherhood, it is more of the nature of religious brotherhood. But it is quite binding, as much so as an ordinary relationship. This eased the situation for us pretty considerably, in the matter of obtaining milk and butter. As I have before mentioned, I do not myself eat butter in an uncooked state, but the remainder of the party reported that this sheep's butter was of very fine quality and it was certainly very clean. These shepherd establishments are known as gots. Naturally forgetting that certain terms are unfamiliar, I told Wakefield that I had bought two sheep from the gots. He seemed more confused than usual by the strangeness of the country. As we were rather short of provisions, we dispatched Noel's servant and our excellent Chongay Tyndale to obtain supplies for us, the first down to the junction with the Arun, and the second over the Popti into Dumtang, a large Nepalese settlement. The remainder of the party stayed behind, hoping for better weather in order to explore the upper valley of the snows, and up to the Popti to get a view of the country into Nepal, if possible. It was no use attempting to move unless the weather cleared to a certain extent. Meanwhile, we were living in a smother of cloud, mist, and rain. But how delightful it was to have an ample supply of firewood and to be able to build, for the first time since we had entered Tibet, a reckless campfire round which we could all sit. It is a real hardship in Tibet never to have a good roaring fire, and it is a little damping to one's spirits, having always to go to bed in order to get warm. Whenever it cleared, we went for short walks through the neighbouring forests and into the neighbouring valleys, and saw quite enough to fill us with a desire for much more exploration. The forest of the Kama is unbelievably rich the undergrowth, especially the hill bamboo, of a very vivid green, and the cedar and fir appear very dark, almost black against it. But the forest also contains every other kind of tree and shrub, 
proper to the eastern Himalaya, and the river banks were in places overhung with the most glorious Himalayan larch, identical with the European larch in appearance, but with possibly a greater spread of branch. The weather got worse and worse, and our food supplies lower and lower. There were no signs of the return either of Noel's servant or of the Chongay from Nepal, and so, with the greatest reluctance, we gave up further exploration as a body. We were reduced to only half a day's grain food for our following, and not only that, but the Tibetan porters whom we were expecting to help us back, and who had been ordered, showed no signs of arriving. Having searched the country round, we managed to rope in a few local people, mostly Tibetans, who had come over from Kata for wood. There is considerable traffic from the Tibetan side, as, in this well-wooded country, they cut most of the timber required for their houses, and carry it over on their own backs, or else on the backs of unfortunate yaks, when they can bring themselves to risk their yak's legs over this awful road. We carried as much luggage as we possibly could with us, not knowing how many men we should be able to obtain to send for the remainder. We had not enough men with us to carry the whole camp, and so two Gurkhas were left here in charge of what remained. They were also to meet Chongay and bring him back with them, and it was considered an absolute certainty that he would be in time to save them from a shortage of rations. Also, they would be able to get enough to keep themselves alive from the Gurkha Gots, although these Gots themselves are on very short ration of grain, living largely on sheep's milk. Our own porters and a few local people, with the help of a little chaff to excite them, vied with each other in the size of the loads they could carry, and they certainly gave us a first-class exhibition of load-carrying. One girl, about eighteen years of age, actually carried a 160-pound tent by herself from Sakayathang to Chokabo over the top of the Chogla. Moreover, this tent had been wet for the last ten days and although we did our best to dry all our camp as much as possible before starting, it must have been at least twenty to thirty pounds heavier than it ought to have been. I am quite certain that not a single man or woman carried less than a hundred pounds that day over the pass, and this they did apparently without undue fatigue, arriving quite cheerful at Chocabo. We started in fairly fine weather, a break, we thought. But before we had gone halfway up the hill, the clouds descended on us, and it was raining hard when we got to our camp. The day before we left, we came to the conclusion that it would be quite possible for a very small party to get down to the junction of the Kamachu over the Arun, and Noel himself was intensely anxious to photograph the Kamachu and the gorges of the Arun itself. He had also a plan, if possible, to get up the gorge and to cross up over the high cliffs and hillsides, which would bring him down almost to the Alp where we had our picnic with Norton. This was a magnificent conception, but considering the weather, we thought that he would have a very rough time of it. He chose Morris as his assistant. He took off his own particular porters, reinforced by some Tibetans, and left on the 27th, we leaving on the 28th. While we had been over there, Geoffrey's feet had completely recovered, and he was able to walk now as of old. Norton could walk uphill, but his feet pained him when descending. His ear had by this time completely recovered. On the twenty-ninth, Geoffrey and I, leaving the remainder of the party, went down to see the Tsongpen of Kata, with a view to making arrangements for our final return. I had, previous to this, 
written to the Maharaja of Nepal, with a scheme by which Mallory should be allowed to cross the upper end of the Walung and Yalung valleys, and to cross into British territory by the Kangla, returning to Darjeeling by the ordinary route along the Singalela Ridge. The Maharaja gave his consent to this expedition, but unfortunately it had to be modified, owing to difficulties of transport and to the very bad weather. But as Mallory was rather pressed for time, it was arranged that he, Somerville, and Crawford should return direct to Tinky, crossing the Arun by the rope bridge which was utilized in 1921 for the return of the party, and from thence descending into Sikkim, and travelling via Larkin and Gangtok back to Darjeeling. The remainder of the party, with the heavy luggage, would have to return via Shakar and the way we came, in order to square up our various accounts with the different Song Pens and with the authorities, postal and other, in Faridzong and the Chumbi Valley. All this required a certain amount of arrangements. Before going into Kama, we had given the Tsong Pen an outline of our requirements, but everything in Tibet, as elsewhere, requires a considerable supervision, and so Geoffrey and I went down before the rest of the party to complete our arrangements. On our way down we met a large contingent of Tibetan porters coming over to move our camp. This eased matters off very considerably. They were sent off into the Kama to bring the remainder of the camp, and on their return to move the full camp down to Tang. Meanwhile we descended, and had a long and very interesting interview with the Tsong Pen, who by this time had quite lost all suspicion of us. He entertained us splendidly, and presented us each with a jade cup before leaving. On July 1 we were all assembled in Teng, and packing up and dividing our luggage preparatory to the return of the party by the different routes. On July 3 Mallory's party set off, and we did not see him nor the rest of the party again until our arrival in Darjeeling more than a month later. We were now joined by Nolan Morris back from their adventurous journey up the Arun, they gave me a report of their travels. I think it would be worth while once more to point out what the course of the Arun is. The Arun is one of the principal tributaries of the Kosi River, that is evident from the map, and has a very long journey through Tibet where it is known as the Bong Chu. It rises near and drains the plains of Tingri and Kumba, and then turning due south, forces its way through the main chain of the Himalaya, directly between the mountain passes of the Everest group on the one side and of the Kanchenjunga group on the other. Between our camp at Kata and the village of Kiamathung, which is on the actual Nepal frontier, a distance of some twenty miles, the river drops a vertical height of four thousand feet and therefore we were particularly interested in the exploration of this wonderful gorge, and we wished to find out, if we could, whether this tremendous vertical drop consisted of a series of great rapids and waterfalls, or a steady fall in the bed of the river. It was also clear from first glimpses that we had of the Arun Gorge that lower down they must be of the greatest possible grandeur and interest. I have before described how we looked down from our picnic into the Arun and hoped we should be able to explore it. When we dispatched Nolan Morris it was in terribly bad weather, the whole of the lower kammer being a smother of mist and the jungle dripping with moisture. We had, most of us, been down as far as a place called Chotromo, where the river is crossed by the road which leads up to the Popti La, and this is the common road down into Nepal. From there the road is far less well known, and is not so well marked. 
I will now give Noel's description of his journey. On the evening of the 27th June, at the end of our first day's march, we pitched our camp on a little pleasant grassy shelf, situated in a small clearing in the forest near empty shepherd huts, which comprised the camp at Chatromo. The hot, damp atmosphere of the Kama here at 9,000 feet harbors a world of insect life. No sooner had the sun set that evening than swarms of tiny midges emerged. They annoyed us for most of the night, except when, in moments of exasperation, we got out of bed and drove them away by lighting a small fire of juniper wood at the mouth of our tent. From Chotromo, a little shepherd track leads down the left bank of the river to Kayamathang. In actual distance, Kayamathang is not far, but the road is scarcely level for more than a few yards. It zigzags precipitously a thousand feet up and down in order to avoid the ravines through which the river rushes, thus trebling the marching distance. The forest here becomes more tropical. Bamboos and ferns are thick in the undergrowth. The trees increase enormously in size, and leeches make their appearance. The path, where it descends to the river, passes through bog and marsh, where the Nepalese shepherds, who mostly use this road in order to reach the upper grazing grounds, have cut and laid tree trunks along the path. The forest here darkens, owing to the height of the trees, junipers being particularly noticeable, most of the trees being festooned with thick grey lichen. Here and there, on level spots beside the river bank, one marches from the forest into delightful glades, carpeted with moss and thick with banks of purple irises in full bloom. Ascending and descending precipitously the hillsides, and covering all the time horizontal distance at a despairing rate, we came at last, tired out, to the bridge which leads across the Kiamathang, and there found that another climb of some fifteen hundred feet remained before reaching the village, which is perched on a small plateau overlooking the junction of the rivers. Kiamathang, though strictly speaking in Tibet, is a typical Nepalese village. The neat little chalets are each surrounded by well-kept fields of Indian corn, wheat, and barley. The fields are bounded by stone walls, and each contains a small makan, a small raised platform, from where a lookout is kept for bears at night. Kiamathang and the surrounding villages are so inaccessible that the people do not appear to come under the influence of Tibet or Nepal, leading an independent life. The village boasts of five gambus, headmen, all of whom, so excited at seeing Europeans for the first time, did all they could to help us and insisted on accompanying us on our first march up the gorge. The road from Kiamathang, after passing the fields of Langdo, plunges once more into the forest. The path mounts up over cliffs, hiding the view of the river in the gorge below, but revealing across the valley the magnificent waterfalls of Tsanga, some thousand feet in height. At our first halting place, we met a fine old Gurkha shepherd, Ray, or Karanti by tribe, a man of some seventy years of age, who, many years ago, had been employed by the Survey of India. He was able to tell us much about our route ahead. This stretch of country, although inhabited by Tibetans, is yearly visited by Nepalese shepherds, who use the rough track in order to reach the grazing grounds on the mountain tops above the gorge. He told us we should find a track of sorts along the right bank of the river, which would eventually bring us out at Kata again. 
The Arun has no great waterfalls, but passes through three deep gorges, one at Kiamathang and one near Kata where it enters the main chain. There is another also between these two. For the rest, it is a raging torrent running through a narrow forested defile. In order to pass these gorges, the path ascends and descends many thousands of feet. Looking down from the ledges of the precipices, one gets occasional glimpses of the torrent below. The cliffs above frequently rising as much as 10,000 feet above the riverbed and ending in snow-capped peaks. Here and there, the promontories of the cliffs afford a grandiose panorama, which rewards the exertions of the terrific ascents. But as these alternate ascents and descents are not single occurrences, but the normal nature of the track, ever climbing up by crazy ladder paths and plunging amongst tangled undergrowth, one ceases to revel in the scenery and would forgo those bird's eye views from the cloud level for the sake of a few yards of marching on the flat. At the end of our second march, where the track appeared to come to an end, while pitching our camp in a small clearing, swarms of bees descended upon us, scattering our porters in all directions. They did no harm, however. Our third march was a struggle through pathless jungle, and, mounting over the great central gorge, on the far side of which we dropped down to the river bed, we found a narrow strip of sand, just room enough to pitch our camp. This was one of the most beautiful spots seen in the valley. Wildflowers grew here in great profusion, the most conspicuous amongst them being some great white lilies, fully six feet in height. That evening, the rain, which had been falling most of the day, cleared, and the rising clouds revealed the luxuriant walls of the valleys, which seemed to rise almost vertically above us, with black caverns beneath where the trees trailed and projected over the water's edge. During the fourth march, we again struck the track, which is apparently used by Tibetans who come down from the Carter end of the valley to get wood. This led us up the side valley, descending from the mountains round about Chogla. We camped towards the top of the valley, and next day crossed by a new pass, which we judged to be about 16,000 feet in height, and then crossed the Sakaya Chu which descends from the Samchung Pass across the Yulok La and descended on Kata. Well, I think that is a very fine description of an intensely interesting journey. One thing the party was quite certain of, and that was that they never would have got through had they numbered any more. It was very difficult to get supplies even for themselves as the roads were so very, very bad, and camping grounds so very, very small. They said all their men had worked like horses, but it was so warm that they took nearly all their clothes off and worked almost entirely naked. It is an extraordinary thing how, when one gets far back into the Himalaya, at altitudes at 7,000, 8,000, and 9,000 feet, one is often extremely warm. This is generally due to the fact that most of these places are usually between mountains and in confined conditions. Such altitudes on the lower spurs of the Himalaya are by no means so warm. We all envied Noel and Morris their trip and the gorgeous country which they had seen and further than that, I in particular envied them the occasional glimpses which they could get right down the Arun Valley into Nepal, glimpses of country which I believe no European has yet looked on. As a matter of fact, I had also written to the Maharaja to find out whether it would not be possible for me to return to Darjeeling via this same Arun Valley. It was a mere ballon d'essai. 
I had no real hope that the rules and regulations of the Nepal Duaba would be overridden in my favour, but it is probably not more than fifty miles from Kiamathang down the Arun Valley to Dunkuta, which is a large Nepalese town, and only some five or six days' travel from Darjeeling itself. What a wonderful experience it would have been! The Maharaja was extremely kind about it, but quite firm. At the same time as Noel and Morris arrived, our Chonge also came from the Popti route, and he brought with him quite a number of chickens and vegetables and excellent potatoes. He had been delayed at Damtang by the weather. There was quite a change in Chonge on his arrival. We were filled with admiration. He wore a Seaforth Highlander's bonnet and a Seaforth Highlander's tunic, both of which he had obtained from some demobilized Gurkha who had sold his effects in the upper Arun Valley. We joined hands and danced round him with cheers, Chongay bridled from head to foot. Soon after Mallory's party left, a note arrived from Crawford to say that his pony and his pony man had run away during the night, and asking us to find out about it, as he had been paid for the full journey. This was reported immediately to the Tsong Pen. He knew exactly what to do. Without a moment's hesitation, he seized the man's elder brother, down with his clothes, and gave him a first-class flogging, and nearly flogged old Father William himself, so angry was he, as this man was one of Father William's underlings. Father William was humbler than ever after this, and produced more and more green vegetables. On July 4 the main body set off, even now very considerable. We were to march direct by a road up to the present date untravelled, our first march being to Lume, which was also on the road used by Mallory and by last year's expedition. From there we marched up the Tsakachu, instead of turning to our right and crossing the Arun. We had been largely in summer in Kata, but on our way to Lume we came in for a time to some of the very strongest winds we had met since leaving the Rongbuk Glacier. Crossing a little gully, I was nearly blown off my pony. Our camp at Lume has been described by Colonel Howard Burry, and is a very charming spot. The following march to Zakachu was quite new ground, not travelled by any European, and was very interesting indeed, but extremely rough. It led for part of the way through a steep and deep gorge, extraordinarily like the gorges in the Hindu Kush in Gilgit and Chambal. The gorge, owing to its elevation, is of less depth, but the whole colour and form of the mountains, their bareness and barrenness, and the smell from the wormwood scrub, brought back to me the Hindu Kush in very vivid recollection. Those gorges, however, as so often in the West, are terribly and oppressively hot, but here, at 12,500 to 13,000 feet above the sea, we were in a fresh and exhilarating air. We camped at a village called Dra, at the foot of the pass we were to cross, which is called the Che La. Our camp was pitched in a very pleasant grove, and here we had, for the last time until we arrived at the Chumbi Valley, a gorgeous and glorious campfire. Curiously enough, the wood was willingly given to us by the inhabitants. The following morning there was a long march and a continual pull to the top of the Che Lar, about 17,000 feet, the last thousand feet being a very rapid ascent, but from the top we were almost in sight of Shakar and the Arun Valley. The camp at which we stopped was a very short morning's walk from our old camp at Pangli, and separated from it by a low ridge. End of chapter 3, part 2
Chapter 3, Part 3 of The Assault on Mount Everest, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Vlahakis, San Francisco. The Assault on Mount Everest, 1922, by various authors. The next morning, after crossing the Arun at the Arun Bridge, we reached Shekhar, where we had a great reception. The Tsong Pen played up, and he had no less than a hundred and sixty mules, all collected and ready for us the following morning. And not only that, but every one turned out the evening, and we had a little race meeting of our own, and a great tea with exchange of cakes and compliments with the Tsong Pen himself. Altogether we were evidently in very good favour both with the Tsong Pen and with the great Lama of Shakar. Noel and others paid a very interesting visit to the great Lama, and were shown by him his collections of curios of all kinds. They thought at first that the old gentleman prized and guarded these as gompa property, but they were rather surprised to discover that he was perfectly ready to sell at a price, and that his own. He was by far the shrewdest trader that we had come across in Tibet. Most of the things that he was ready to part with, however, were beyond the pockets of our party. John MacDonald, who has a very good eye for a pony, took out a likely mount in the horse races, and himself won no less than three races that day. He bargained for it, as he was looking forward to the Darjeeling pony races in the autumn, and before we left, MacDonald, to his great joy, had concluded a very respectable bargain. The following morning we got off not quite as well as we should. We had difficulty in loading, and some difficulties on the march. Shakar had proved altogether too much for the porters, and the following morning they were not of much use. In fact, it was with the greatest difficulty that many of them were produced at the next camp. The place was called Kishong. It had not been a very promising little camp, so we thought of stopping down by the river on a very pleasant plot of grass. But on arrival there we found a dead Tibetan, in a basket moored to the bank in the water, about a hundred yards above our camp, so that was no place for us. Instead of marching back exactly the same way we had come, via our camp at Gyanka Nangpa, we determined to follow up a smaller branch of the Arun, which would bring us finally down onto Tinki itself. By so doing, we avoided wading the Yaru in two places, and also the rather high and steep Tinki Pass. On our way across the plains of Teng, before one arrives at the great sand dunes of Shiling, we passed a Sokpo, a true Mongolian, whose home was in northern Mongolia near Urga, a religious devotee. He was travelling from Lhasa to Nepal, that is, to Kathmandu, on a pilgrimage, by the time-honoured method of measuring his length on the ground for every advance. He was a young man, and apparently well-fed, trusting to the kindness of the villagers through which he passed for his food. He told us that he had been continually travelling, and that it had taken him one year to reach the place where we found him from Lhasa, and that he hoped to get to Kathmandu in another year, if he was lucky and able to cross the mountains. We encouraged him the best way we could, and left him to his work. Our halt that night was in a very pleasant camp surrounded by low cliffs, at a place called Jikyop. Our march up this valley was a great contrast to our march into Tibet. A warm sun and a pleasant cool breeze blowing. The clouds drifted across us and we had some rain, which only added to our comfort. We camped one night at a place called Chiu, where we all bathed, and bathed the ponies into the bargain. Our last march before reaching Tinki 
was over an interesting pass, which suffers under the terrible name of the Farmagodra La, down to a pleasant little camping ground with a very dirty village near it. Here we caught an enormous number of fish, the inhabitants proving quite ready to help us do so. Everyone fed freely on fresh fish that night. An easy, pleasant pass the following morning led us down in two and a half hours to Tinki. Here we met the Tongpen of Tinki for the first time. He was an extremely pleasant individual, and the most friendly and intelligent official we met in Tibet. He helped us in every way, and had previously helped Strut's party on their journey through. We heard excellent reports also of him, afterwards from the advance parties. When we had gone through in the spring, this Tsongpen had been away collecting his dues for the Tibetan government. Tinki was a very different place, very green and altogether very lovely. Before travelling in Tibet, we had heard so much of the wonderful colour of Tibetan scenery. It was only on our return journey when there was a considerable amount of moisture in the air, when clouds rolled up from the south, that one obtained a real notion of what Tibet could be like when at its best, and Tinki, which had been an absolute sandy waste when we marched up, was now covered with beautiful green grass and flowers. Nor was the air of that horrible and rather irritating dryness, but was almost balmy, considering the height of the country. Two days later we reached Kumba Tsong. The Tsongpen was absent, but his two headmen helped us in his place. We had pouring rain the whole of the following night. There must have been from one and a half to two inches of rain, a most surprising experience in Tibet, and one for which we were hardly prepared. The men had been breaking out a little again, and one sportsman had broken out considerably more than anybody else. For purposes of letting the porters down easily, we never considered a man was inebriated as long as he could lie on the ground without holding on. But this man, for three days in succession, had been hopeless, giving no reaction whatever to the smartest smacks with our sticks and finally having to be brought into camp and given a great deal of trouble. So we determined on an exemplary punishment. The other men who had broken out badly had all been given loads to carry for a march. But the next day this man was condemned to carry an enormous load from Kambatsong to Fari. Considering what his condition had been, we were absolutely astounded when the following day he carried the whole of well over a hundred pounds for a twenty-mile march to Tatsung over a pass of seventeen thousand feet, grinning and smiling the whole way, as if it was the finest joke he had heard of. Everybody pulled his leg on the way, but nothing could possibly interfere with his good temper. He was condemned to carry this load right into Faritong, crossing the three high ridges of the Donkala, and never for a moment did he lose his temper or bear any ill will. This is characteristic of the people. As long as your treatment of them is understood by them to be just, they bear no ill will whatever, nor does it interfere in any way with one's friendly relations. But still, for all that, it seems to me that they are unkillable. After his behaviour and the condition he was in for so long, to do such terrific hard labour as we condemned him to do, without the smallest sign of fatigue, was pretty remarkable. But after all, my own particular, Angturke, had only complained of being a little dazed after falling sixty feet onto his head at the time of the accident. We camped at Tatsung, and here we parted with Noel, who carried off his own people and left us for Gyantse. He was very much afraid of bringing his cinema films down into the warmth and damp of Sikkim until they were properly developed. But not only this, it was now the season of the great meetings and dances of Gyantse, 
and he hoped to get first-rate studies of Tibetan life generally. The climate and accommodation also at Kyantse would just suit him, and he would be able there to put in a full month's work, completing his films and adding immensely to his collection of pictures of Tibetan life. He accompanied us for five miles, almost up to the camp we had occupied on our arrival in the spring, and we left him with great regret. We had a long march that day from Tatsang, and again crossing the ridges of the Donkala, a very cold wind and sleet and rain overtook us. It was the last shot at us the typical Tibetan weather had, and considering the time of year, it did its very best for us. But we camped that night under the Donkala at a great height, not far from 17,000 feet. While we were waiting for our luggage, we took refuge in a Tibetan encampment. The Tibetans were out with their herds of yaks, grazing them over the hillsides. We were rather amused to find that they had guns in their encampment, which they evidently used for sporting purposes, and we thought regretfully of the limitations which had been put on our expedition. Next morning we had a delightful march, crossing the last and highest ridge of the Donkala, and camped halfway to Fari, finally reaching Fari Tsong after a very pleasant morning's ride over delightful green turf and passing immense flocks of sheep grazing on the hillsides. Here on July 20 we found a welcome post and spent the day in great comfort in the Fari Tsong bungalow. Two days later we reached Chumbi and met the McDonald's again and were, as usual, sumptuously entertained by them. Here, our transport had to be reorganised to take our still rather large convoy down to India. Geoffrey and I climbed the neighbouring hills and really revelled in the whole journey down, which had been very reminiscent of the West Himalaya in summer. Chumbi is wonderful. Even in the rains, the climate is delightful. It cannot have more than one-third of the rainfall which falls only twenty miles away on the other side of the Jalap. In fact, when two days later we crossed the Jalap, we were immediately involved again in the mists and rains and sleets, and were again in a completely and absolutely different type of country. We arrived at Natong on July 27 in pouring rain, but next morning it had cleared and on the way down as we started, the clouds showed signs of really lifting. On arrival at the ridge, over which the road crosses before beginning the long descent to Rongli Chu, about 400 feet above Natong, we were lucky enough to come in for one of those sudden breaks which occasionally occur during the monsoon, and if one is at the moment in a position to profit by them, one obtains one of the most glorious sights to be found in this world. Such was our luck this morning. Standing on the ridge, we were able to see the plains of India stretched out beneath us to the south, the plains of Kuch Bihar, with the Mahanadi River running through them quite clear, while on our right, Kanchenjunga rose through the clouds, a perfectly marvellous vision of ice and snow, looking immeasurably high. The clouds were drifting and continually changing across the hillsides and the deep valleys. The extremely deep and in places sombre colour, the astonishingly brilliant colour where the sun lit up the mountains, and the prodigious heights made a mountain vision which must be entirely unsurpassed in any other portion of the globe. It was a moment to live for, but the moment was all too short. In half an hour the vision of the plains and the mountains was completely blotted out. At Lung Tung we visited the little tea shop where we had all collected as we had promised the patroness on our way up. There she was again, full of smiles, with her family round her, and we all stayed there and drank hot tea, which we thoroughly enjoyed after the cold and driving mist and the flow of chaff, I think, even surpassed that of our first visit.
So exhilarated were we that Geoffrey and I ran at top speed down to Sedong Chen, which is only 6,000 feet, tearing down the hillsides, and by so doing, although we occasionally took shortcuts over grassy banks and through forest where it was not too thick, we arrived at Sedong Chen having entirely baffled the leeches which swarm in this part of the forest. Not so, however, Wakefield. He also had been exhilarated and had taken a short cut down, but he had been too trusting, and he arrived with his legs simply crawling with leeches. The rest of our journey through Sikkim requires no particular comment, except that the weather behaved itself in a wonderful way, and we escaped any real heavy duckings. The heat, although considerable in the lower valleys and moist, was not at all oppressive so much so that we were able to travel at a great pace down to Rongli Bridge, which is only 700 feet above the sea. We arrived in Darjeeling on August 2, everyone by now in thoroughly good health. Here we were to await the arrival of Crawford and Somerville, who were making tremendous attempts, considering that it was the height of the monsoon, to see something of the south face of Kanchen, and even, if possible, to do a little climbing, a rather ambitious program under the circumstances. Five or six days later they arrived, quite pleased with themselves, and having had a very strenuous time, but naturally having seen a minimum of the country they travelled over. At Darjeeling the party rapidly broke up, although the staff of the expedition had about a fortnight's work clearing up business matters which included the proper provision for the families of the unfortunate porters who had been lost in the avalanche. Thus ended the first attempt to climb Mount Everest. I think on the whole we may be quite satisfied with the results. It would have been almost unthinkable if a great mountain like Everest, the highest in the world, almost the greatest in scale as well, had yielded to the very first assault. After all, it took a very long time, many years in fact, to climb the easier of the great mountains of the Alps. It took many years to find the way, even, up the north face of the Matterhorn, a problem which would now only be considered one of the second class. How then could we expect on the very first occasion to solve all the different problems which are included in an assault on Everest? It is not merely a case of mountaineering, or of mountaineering skill, nor even of having a most highly trained party, there are many other problems which we also have to consider. Our methods had almost to be those of an Arctic expedition. At the same time our clothing and outfit in many ways had to be suitable for mountain climbing. Our climbing season was extraordinarily short, far shorter than it would have been in any mountains in the West. Not only that, but all the warnings of the scientists tended to show that no very great height could probably be reached without oxygen, and that even with an oxygen apparatus there were a great many dangers to be faced. Among other things we were told that having once put on the oxygen apparatus, and having once for any continuous period worked on an artificial supply of oxygen, the sudden cessation of that supply would certainly cause unconsciousness, and probably would cause death. Luckily for us, this was proved not to be in accordance with actual practical experience, as the height reached by our climbing party, which had not used oxygen, was more than 2,000 feet higher than any point yet reached. For the Duke of Abruzzi, in his great attempt on the Bride Peak on the Baltoro Glacier in Baltistan, did not quite reach 24,600 feet, while Mallory, Somerville and Norton reached 26,985 feet. In the whole range of the mountains of the world, there are only four peaks that top this great height, namely Mount Everest itself, K2 in the Karakoram in Baltistan, Broad Peak on the Baltoro Glacier, and Makalu in the Everest Group. Therefore, this climb stands actually as the fifth of the great altitudes of the world. 
it is a perfectly prodigious performance, and taken simply as a tour de force, stands in the front rank in no matter what department of sport or human endeavour. The men who took part in this climb have every reason to be proud of themselves. As I have pointed out, Finch and Geoffrey Bruce, using oxygen, took a route traversing the face of the mountain to the west, and before they were completely played out and conditions were such that they had to return, reached a height of 27,235 feet. If they had directly mounted up the ridge, they would undoubtedly have reached the point on the main Everest crest, which is marked at 27,390, and have progressed along it to a greater altitude. There is no doubt in my mind whatever of this. Not only would their route have been far more direct, but the actual ground over which they would have to climb would have been easier. It is quite certain that with the same exertions on the same day, they could have reached a higher point than they did. That does not, however, in the least detract from their performance. Their experiences, as has been pointed out by Finch, ease the oxygen question immensely. It was shown that it was quite possible to remove the oxygen apparatus altogether, having used it fully and having reached a height of 25,500 feet. Nor was the accident to Jeffrey's apparatus attended with any of the terrible consequences which we were led to expect. Very satisfactory from the point of view of our final success in climbing Everest. There is no doubt that the height will be attained, provided the very best men, the best apparatus, and an outfit of porters equally as good as our own attempt it and there are plenty of men to draw from for porters. We could probably obtain without difficulty a team as good or better. Of that I am quite certain. It was pretty evident that one of the secrets of living with immunity high up is that the actual clothes on the men's backs should be as light as possible, and as windproof as possible. Proper protection should be taken against the wind for the head also and the greatest care must be taken and the necessity for care be understood by everybody in the protection of their hands and feet. It is quite possible that with a little more care we might have escaped this year without any serious consequences from that point of view. These remarks apply equally to the outfit for the porters. Men who worked with so little experience and took camps for us to a height of 25,500 feet would, if correctly outfitted, take the camp 500 to 1,000 feet higher. Of that, I am quite convinced. An improved and lighter oxygen apparatus is under construction. When this has been completed, I have every reason to believe that an oxygen depot could be well established at 26,000 feet, thus allowing a full time for the attempt on the greater heights. This year there was always at the back of the oxygen carriers' minds a slight doubt that their oxygen might give out, and that the consequences to them would be most unpleasant. Another problem that must always be borne in mind when one's object is the assault of a great mountain in the Himalaya is to bring one's whole party there in first-class health and training. This sounds an unnecessary remark to have to make, but as a matter of fact, the task is not as easy as it appears. The great danger lies in fatiguing and exhausting one's party before the real test comes. This year there was great danger of our working the porters out, and this question gave me a good deal of anxiety. But they were all absolute gluttons for work, and I never would have believed that men could have carried out such tremendous hard labour in establishing our high camps, and apparently continuing fit and well, showing no signs of staleness, and quite ready to continue up the mountain. Before we left Darjeeling, I forwarded to the Dalai Lama, on behalf of the Mount Everest Committee, a letter of thanks for all the assistance which he had given to our expedition and sent with it, for him and for the Tashilompo Lama also, a silk banner, 
on which was printed a coloured picture of the Potala, the great palace of the Dalai Lamas in Lhasa. End of chapter 3, part 3. Recording by Nick Vlahakis, San Francisco. Chapter 4, Part 1 of The Assault on Mount Everest, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in May 2022. The Assault on Mount Everest, 1922, by various authors. The Problem, by George Mallory. 1. It is very natural that mountaineers, particularly if they are members of the Alpine Club, should wish success to the average expedition, for in a sense it is their own adventure. And yet their sympathies must often wobble. It is not always an undiluted pleasure to hear of new ascents in the Alps, or even in Great Britain, for half the charm of climbing mountains is born in visions preceding this experience visions of what is mysterious, remote, inaccessible. By experience we learn that we may pass to another world and come back, we rediscover the accessibility of summits appearing impregnable, and so long as we cannot without a tremor imagine ourselves upon a mountain's side, that mountain holds its mystery for us. But when we often hear about mountaineering expeditions on one or another of the most famous peaks in the world, are told of conquests among the most remote and difficult ranges, or others continually repeated in well-known centres, we come to know too well how accessible mountains are to skilful and even to unskilful climbers. The imagination falters and it may happen that we find ourselves one day thinking of the most surprising mountain of all, with no more reverence than the practised golfer has for an artificial bunker. It was so, I was once informed by a friend, that he caught himself thinking of the Matterhorn, and he wondered whether he shouldn't give up climbing mountains until he had recovered his reverence for them. A shorter way, I thought, was to wait until the weather broke and then climb the Matterhorn every day till it should be calm and fine again, and when he pondered this suggestion he had no need to test its power, for he very soon began to think again of the Matterhorn as he ought to think. But from the anguish of discovering his heresy, he cherished a lesson and afterwards would never consent to read or hear accounts of mountaineering nor even to speak of his own exploits. This was a commendable attitude in him, and I can feel no doubt, thinking of his case, that however valuable a function it may have been of the Alpine Club in its infancy to propagate not only the gospel but the knowledge of mountains, the time has come when it should be the principal aim of any such body not only to suppress the propagation of a gospel already too popular, but also to shelter its members against that superabundance of knowledge which must needs result from accumulating records. Hereafter, of contemporary exploits, the less we know the better. Our heritage of discovery among mountains is rich enough. Too little remains to be discovered. The story of a new ascent should now be regarded as a corrupting communication calculated to promote the glory of man or perhaps only of individual men, at the expense of the mountains themselves. It may well be asked how, holding such opinions, I can set myself to the task of describing an attempt to reach the highest summit of all. Surely Chomolungmo should remain inviolate, or, if attempted, the deed should not be named. With this point of view I have every sympathy and lest it should be thought that in order to justify myself I must bring in a different order of reasons from some other plane, and involve myself in a digression even longer than the present, I will say nothing about justification for this story, beyond remarking that it glorifies Mount Everest, since this mountain has not yet been climbed. And when I say that sympathy in a mountaineer may wobble, the mountaineer I more particularly mean is the present writer. 
it is true that i did what i could to reach the summit but now as i look back and see all those wonderful preparations the great array of boxes collected at paris and filling up the courtyard of the bungalow the train of animals and coolies carrying our baggage across tibet the thirteen selected europeans so snugly wrapped in their woolen waistcoats and jaeger pants their armour of windproof materials their splendid overcoats the furred finiscoes or felt-sided boots or fleece-lined moccasins devised to keep warm their feet and the sixty strong porters with them delighting in underwear from england and leathern jerkins and puttees from cashmere and then unforgettable scene the scatter of our stores at the base camp the innumerable neatly made wooden boxes concealing the rows and rows of tins of harris's sausages hunter's hams heinz's spaghetti herring's soi disant fresh sardines sliced bacon peas beans and a whole forgotten host besides sauce bottles for the mess tables and the rare bottles more precious than these the gay tins of sweet biscuits ginger nuts and rich mixed and all the carefully chosen delicacies and besides all these for our sustenance or pleasure the fuel supply uncovered in the centre of the camp green and blue two-gallon cans of paraffin and petrol and an impressive heap of yak dung and the climbing equipment the gay little tents with crimson flies or yellow pitched here only to be seen and admired the bundles of soft sleeping bags soft as eiderdown quilt can be the ferocious crampons and other devices steel pointed and terrible for boots armament the business-like coils of rope the little army of steel cylinders containing oxygen under high pressure and not least the warlike sets of apparatus for using the life-giving gas and lastly when i call to mind the whole begoggled crowd moving with slow determination over the snow and up the mountain slopes and with such remarkable persistence bearing up the formidable loads when after the lapse of months i envisage the whole prodigious evidences of this vast intention how can i help rejoicing in the yet undimmed splendour the undiminishing glory the unconquered supremacy of mount everest it is conceivable that this great mountain though still unsubdued may nevertheless have suffered some loss of reputation it is the business of a mountain to be ferocious first charming and smiling afterwards if it will but it has been said already of this mountain that the way to the summit is not very terrible it will present no technical difficulties of climbing has it not then after all a character unsuitably mild is it not a great cow among mountains it cannot be denied that the projected route to the summit presents no slopes of terrible steepness but we may easily underrate the difficulties even here though some of us have gazed earnestly at the final ridge and discussed at length the possibility of turning or of climbing direct certain prominent obstacles no one has certainly determined that he may proceed there without being obliged to climb difficult places and the snow slope which guards the very citadel will prove one cannot doubt as steep as one would wish to find the final slope of any great mountain again the way to the north call that snow saddle by which alone we may gain access to the north ridge has not always been simple we know little enough still about its changing conditions but evidently on too many days the snow will be dangerous there and perhaps on many others the presence of bare ice may involve more labour than was required of us this year but granted this one breach in the defence of mount everest shall we only for that think of it as a mild mountain how many mountains can be named in the alps of which so small a part presents the hope of finding a way to the summit nowhere on the whole immense face of ice and rocks from the north-east ridge to lotse and the south-east ridge is the smallest chance for the mountaineer and leaving out all count of size mont blanc even above the brenva glacier has no face so formidable as this of the southern side which we know only from a few photographs and sketches one thing is certain 
that whoever reaches it will find there a terrific precipice of bare rock, probably unequalled for steepness by any great mountain face in the Alps, and immeasurably greater. The single glimpse obtained last year of the western glacier and the slopes above it revealed one of the most awful and utterly forbidding scenes ever observed by men, how much more encouraging, and yet how utterly hopeless, is the familiar view from the Rongbuk Valley. Mount Everest, therefore, apart from its pre-eminence and bulk and height, is great and beautiful, marvellously built, majestic, terrible, a mountain made for reverence, and beneath its shining sides one must stand in awe and wonder. 2. When we think of a party of climbers struggling along the final ridge of Mount Everest, we are perhaps inclined to reject an obvious comparison of their endeavour with that of athletes in a long-distance race. The climbers are not, of course, competing to reach the goal one before another. The aim is for all to reach it. But the climber's performance, like the runner's, will depend on two factors, endurance and pace, and the two have to be considered together. A climber must not only keep on moving upwards if he is to succeed, he must move at a certain minimum pace, a pace that will allow him, having started from a given point, to reach the top and come down in a given time. Further, at a great height, it is true for the climber, even more than for the runner on a track in England, that to acquire pace is the chief difficulty, and still more true that it is the pace which kills. Consequently, it is pace more than anything else which becomes the test of fitness on Mount Everest. Every man has his own standard, determined as a result of his experience. He knows perhaps that in the Alps, with favourable conditions, he is capable of ascending 1,500 feet an hour without unduly exerting himself and without fatigue. If he were to bring into action the whole of his reserves, he might be able to double this figure. He will assuredly find when he comes up into Tibet and leaves at a mean height of 15,000 feet that he is capable of very much less. And then he begins to call in question his power, to measure himself against his European standard. Every member of both Everest expeditions was more or less of a valetudinarian. He had his eye on his physical fitness. He wondered each day, am I getting fitter? Am I as fit as I should expect to be in the Alps? And the ultimate taste was pace uphill. The simpler phenomena of acclimatization have frequently been referred to in connection with Mount Everest. But still it may be asked why improvement should be expected during a sojourn at 15,000 feet. It is expected because, as a matter of experience, it happens. The wider red corpuscles in the blood, whose function is to absorb and give us oxygen, should multiply in the ratio of 8 to 5, I leave it to physiologists to explain. Whatever explanation they may give, I shall not cease to regard this amazing change as the best of miracles. And this change in the hemoglobin content of the blood evidently proceeds a long way above 15,000 feet. Nevertheless, the advantage thereby obtained by no means altogether compensates at very high altitudes the effects of reduced atmospheric pressure. It enables a man to live in very thin air, 11.5 inches barometric pressure at 27,000 feet, but not to exert himself with anything like his normal power at sea level. His pace suffers. If at 23,000 feet he were able to exercise no less power than at 10,000 feet, after a few well-spent days in the Alps, he would probably be able to ascend the remaining 6,000 feet to the summit in a single day. But if you cut off the supply of fuel, you cannot expect your engine to maintain its pace of working. The power exercised by the climber in the more rarefied atmosphere at these high altitudes must be less. A rise of 6,000 feet in a day will be beyond his capacity. Therefore, he must have camps higher on the mountain, 
and ultimately he must have one so high that in nine or ten hours even his snail's pace will bring him to the summit we must remember too that not only will his pace have suffered his mind will be in a deplorable state the experiments conducted in pressure chambers have a bearing on this point i treasure the story of professor haldane who while in such a chamber wanted to observe the colour of his lips and for some minutes gazed into his mirror before discovering that he held the back towards his face mountaineers have often observed a lack of clarity in their mental state at high altitudes it is difficult for the stupid mind to observe how stupid it is but it is by no means improbable that the climbers of mount everest will try to drink their food or proceed crab-wise or do some quite ridiculous thing and not only is it difficult to think straight in thin air it is difficult to retain the desire to do anything at all perhaps of all that tells against him the mere weakness of a man's will when he is starved of oxygen is beyond everything likely to prevent his success since the problem of climbing mount everest presented itself physiologically it was only natural in us on the expedition continually to be watching acclimatization we watched it in connection with the whole idea of being trained for the event probably each of us had a different notion as to how he should be trained and some thought more about training than others on this point i must confess a weakness when i foresee an event in which my physical strength and condition are to count for so much i am one of those who think more about training i consider how i may add a cubit to my stature and all the time i am half aware that i might spare myself the trouble of such futile meditations experience seems only to show that provided i habitually eat well and sleep well and take a moderate amount of exercise i can do nothing to improve my endurance on a mountain probably some men may do more to this end the week we spent in darjeeling sufficed for all of us to brace ourselves after the enervating effects of our journey from england norton who had come out rather earlier and prepared himself in the most strenuous fashion for the immense exertions of the kadir cup was already finely trained too well i thought for so lean a man he and Geoffrey bruce my companion in the first party together with general bruce longstaff and noel elected to walk a great deal in sikkim and so i believe did somerville wakefield and morshead in the second party the general very frankly expressing the probable advantage to his figure of profuse perspiration in those warm valleys also walked a great deal for an exactly contrary reason i hate the inconvenience that must arise on the march from wet clothes i walked less than any of these probably longstaff and i rode more than the rest up to paris Zong. but when i heard how wonderfully fit were the two most energetic walkers of our party and learned from geoffrey bruce of norton's amazing pace uphill I could not refrain from testing my own condition on the first occasion that we approached a comparatively high altitude coming up to natong where the bungalow is situated above twelve thousand feet i walked for all i was worth and was well satisfied next day i felt far from well with indigestion and headache general bruce and longstaff were also unwell and it was a cheerless afternoon and evening in the two little rooms at kupup with hailstorms outside and too little light within norton and bruce selected to sleep on the veranda and these two with me if i were fit enough intended starting early next morning so as to climb a small mountain diverging thus from our path over the jelle pla fourteen thousand five hundred feet for the sake of the view we set off not much later than we had intended but it was now norton's turn to be unwell and he was probably mountain sick ten thousand feet below the pass however we were not inclined to pay much attention to these little troubles with a day's rest at a lower elevation nine thousand feet and the pleasures of feasting with the macdonalds in yatung we were quickly restored 
the continuous process of acclimatization was due to begin at Faritong. There we should stay three days above 14,000 feet, and after that our marches would keep us between that level and 17,000 feet, so that a man would surely find out how he was affected by living at high altitudes. At Fari, the whole party seemed remarkably fit, and any amount of energy was available for sorting out and checking our vast mass of stores. But the conditions of travel on these high plains became evident so soon as we were on the march again. Those who gaily started to walk, not troubling to provide themselves with a pony, found after a time that they were glad enough to ride, but then it became so bitterly cold that riding was more disagreeable than walking, and most of us, as we pushed along in the teeth of a blizzard, preferred to walk, and were surprisingly fatigued. Two of the party were ill when we reached camp, but more perhaps from chill than mountain sickness. On the following day, a system of sharing ponies to allow alternate walking and riding was more carefully organized. Even so, most of us must have walked two-thirds of that long rough march, about twenty-five miles, and while crossing the Contartina Pass, as we called it, a name which explains itself, we had ample opportunities of testing our powers of walking uphill between sixteen thousand and seventeen thousand feet. It was evident that we were already becoming acclimatized and able to enjoy those mild competitions in which a man will test his powers against another as they breast the hill together. This was encouraging enough, but how far we were from going, as we would go at ten thousand feet lower, could easily be observed from our puffing and blowing, and the very moderate pace achieved by great efforts. It was a week later before we had another opportunity of testing our acclimatization, as we came up to the Tinki La, a rise of nearly three thousand feet up to seventeen thousand feet. I suppose there may have been some slight improvement in this week. For my part, I was fairly fit, and after riding over the comparatively flat approach, walked up about two thousand feet without a halt, and experienced no sort of fatigue. But the party as a whole was disappointing, and several members were distinctly affected by the height. Perhaps this pass was one of those places where some local circumstance emphasizes the altitude, for the ponies stopped and puffed in a way we had never seen before but I fancy the reason of their condition was to be found in the steepness of the ascent. The day after crossing the Tinki La, we had a short march to Gyangkarnangpa, and, coming across the flat basin, had full in view before us Sankari, a prominent rock peak, the most northerly of a remarkable range above the left bank of the Arun River. The desire to vary the routine of the daily march by climbing a mountain had already stirred a number of suggestions among us, and now the opportunity seemed to offer itself. We were further incited by the prospect of a splendid view of Mount Everest, if we could reach this summit, which lay not so very far out of our way. No doubt unconscious motives too promoted our attempt on Sankari. The pleasures of mountaineering must always be restricted for those who grapple with the highest mountains, if not denied in toto but the ascent of a little rock peak of twenty thousand feet might help to keep alive in us some appreciation of mountaineering as an enjoyable pursuit. And then we wanted confidence in ourselves. At present we could only feel how unequal we were to the prodigious task in front of us, so were we urged to try conclusions with Sankari to put ourselves to the test. The project demanded a high camp, at 17,000 feet, nearly 4,000 feet above Gyangkang Nangpa. Seeing that it would clearly be undesirable to employ more than a very small number of porters to carry up tents and sleeping bags for the night, Somerville and I at first made a plan for ourselves alone, but when it was found that two others wanted to come with us, this plan was amplified to include them and it was arranged that the four of us should sleep at close quarters in a whimper tent. The porters who carried for us in the evening would take down their burdens in the early morning, in time to get them loaded on to the animals at Gyangkar without delaying the main body. 
the establishment of our camp did not proceed without some little difficulty one of the porters gave out and had to be relieved of his load and it was not until we had contoured a hillside for an hour in the dark that we found a suitable place so soon as we had lain down in our tent a bitter wind sprang up and blew in at the door the night was one of the coldest i remember End of chapter 4, part 1chapter four part two of the assault on mount everest nineteen twenty two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by avai in may two thousand twenty two the assault on mount everest nineteen twenty two by various authors chapter four the problem by George Mallory. Part 2. We had ascended not more than one thousand feet next morning, when one of the party decided that he was too ill to go on. He exhibited the usual symptoms of mountain sickness. While the other two suffered the disappointment of turning back, Somerval and I pushed on towards a snow call on the north ridge of the mountain. As it was desirable to reach this point without delay, in order to see the view while it was yet unclouded, and to take photographs, I continued at my own pace, and eventually found myself looking down on Somerville some distance below me, as he struggled up with frequent halts. I very soon made up my mind that we should get no higher than this. But after a brief halt and some refreshment when he had rejoined me, Somerville announced that he was prepared to go on. We began to make our way along a rock ridge, which became ever steeper as we mounted. Our progress was slow indeed, and I kept thinking, as I found myself more and more fatigued, surely we must give up now, a man in his state can't go on climbing such rocks as these. But whenever I asked how he was feeling, he would answer that he was getting along well enough, and as we gradually won our way up, and I kept my eye on my watch, I began to see that we had really a chance of reaching the summit. The rocks were by no means easy, and it is commonly said that the effort of climbing difficult rocks is just what will prove most exhausting, if it can be undertaken at all, to men affected by altitude. The struggle to overcome a steep obstacle must always interfere with regular breathing. Nevertheless, I am inclined to think that the advantage in sheer acceleration of climbing difficult rocks compensates the greater trouble in breathing, and that so long as I am still in a state to climb them, I prefer even difficult rocks to snow. The actual exertion put forth in mounting even the steepest cliff is often overrated. If there are moments of intense struggle, these are rare, and though the demand on nervous concentration is great, the climber proceeds for the most part with balanced movements, requiring, indeed, the sureness of trained muscles, but no tremendous output of strength. With such balanced movement, the two of us were able to go slowly upwards, without a rapidly increasing exhaustion, to the foot of a formidable gendarme. We had hopes in the first instance that he might be compelled to yield to a frontal attack. But, thirty feet up, we found our way barred by a slab, which was at once so smooth and so exposed that, though we felt it might conceivably be climbed, we decided it was not for us to climb it at the present moment. Our allowance of rope was insufficient for operations which might require an upsail on the descent. We therefore turned to the west side of our ridge. Here, of course, we were out of the sun, and the rocks were so cold that they felt sticky to the skin and blistered our fingertips. However, we managed to execute a sensational traverse, and afterwards climbed a steep wall, which brought us out above the slab from which we had turned back. It was here that we experienced both the difficulty and the danger of rock climbing at high altitudes. It was necessary, in a terribly exposed position, 
to pull oneself over an edge of rock on to a little platform a big effort was required but the reserve of strength had been exhausted having committed myself to this taxing struggling the grim thought arose in my mind that at the critical moment i might be found wanting and my body refused to respond when the greatest effort was required of it a great effort was required before i arrived panting on the airy stance after these exciting moments we reached the top of the gendarme without much trouble but he had cost us too much time we had to start from young car this same day in pursuit of general bruce and ought to cross the quicksands of the Shiling Plain before dark. We had already overstepped the time allowed for the ascent according to our intention. The summit now appeared perhaps five hundred feet above us, and the intervening rocks were evidently going to provide some stiff passages. It was necessary, therefore, to turn back here and waste no time on the descent. The descent proved longer than we had expected, we chose a long traverse over steep snow to avoid the gendarme, and neither of us was in a condition to cut steps quickly. We observed, in fact, what I had observed last year with Bullock, that one may go down a considerable distance at a high altitude, and instead of recovering very quickly, as may happen in the Alps, one only becomes progressively more fatigued. It was 4.30 p.m. when we reached Gyangkar and found ourselves happily recovered from our exertions. Sankari was still unclimbed. But we looked back on our expedition with some satisfaction. We had been little short of 20,000 feet when we turned back, and I had been greatly impressed by Somerville's endurance. For though very much fatigued before reaching the call at the foot of our ridge, and further enervated by an attack of dysentery which had begun on the previous day his condition seemed rather to improve than to deteriorate above that point for my part i had come near enough to exhaustion considering the difficulties of the climb and had suffered from a severe headache but certainly felt no worse than i expected at this stage of our training I entered upon this tale with the object of illustrating the course of acclimatization among us, but the return to Gyangkar was not for us the end of the story. It was now clear that we could not hope to cross the quicksands before night. However, we might hope to reach the ford by which we must cross the river Yaru with still enough light to recognize the spot, and thereafter we could rest in a sheltered place I knew of until the late rising moon should show us the tracks of the main body. We set off accordingly in high haste on the ponies we found waiting for us. Our instruction had been that these animals should be specially selected for their fleetness of foot, for Tibetan ponies can, some of them, travel at a fair speed, while others no amount of flogging will urge beyond three miles an hour. The beast I rode very quickly showed that he was one of these last. I had entrusted my ice-axe to a porter who accompanied us, and now told him to ride behind me and use it if necessary. For five miles he used it with a dexterity and energy beyond praise. Then I abandoned the pony, and, walking ahead of the party, easily outstripped the rest encumbered with this beast. Night fell when we were still two miles short of the ford. But as Somerville and I approached the spot and wondered exactly where it might be, we perceived lights a little way ahead on the further bank of the river, presumably those of a Tibetan camp, and soon a figure appeared on that side. We were hailed in Tibetan. Our Sirdar, coming up, spoke Tibetan in reply, the figure waded across to us, and it was explained to me that this good Samaritan was prepared to carry me over on his back. I readily agreed to so generous a proposition. He was not an easy steed, but I was able to hang on to him for a hundred yards or so until he deposited me on the other bank, a light enough burden, apparently, to be picked up and set down like a child and four hundred yards further we reached the lights. It was no stranger camp, 
the tents were ours and the general and the rest were sitting in the mess while dinner was keeping hot in the kitchen against our return ten days later we reached our base camp at the foot of the rongbuk glacier sixteen thousand eight hundred feet and contemplated the prospect of rising another twelve thousand feet and more to the summit of mount everest at all events the whole party had reached this point remarkably fit and no one now showed signs of distress from staying at this elevation remembering how bullock and i had felt after our first exertions up here last year i hoped to spend a few days at the base camp before doing very much and as general bruce's plans worked out nothing was required of me at present but much was asked of the reconnaissance party which started out on may four it has been recorded in earlier chapters how in three days from the base camp they reached a height of twenty one thousand five hundred feet on the east rongbuk glacier the cold was great and their hardships were unrelieved by the greater comfort of established camps enjoyed by those who followed the pioneers from their accounts they were evidently affected a good deal by altitude before turning back with their work accomplished and in spite of the cold they experienced a familiar phenomenon of lassitude so painfully and particularly noticeable on the glaciers when the sun makes itself felt but on the whole they had been less affected by the want of air than was to be expected they had this advantage and they proceeded gradually the distance to travel was long but the ascent was never steep and they found the upper glacier very lightly covered with snow and it is heavy going and a steep ascent that most readily induced the more distressing symptoms of mountain sickness however from the point of view of acclimatization it was highly satisfactory that this party should have proceeded with so little delay to reach twenty one thousand feet meanwhile Somerville and i chafing somewhat at our inactivity and with the idea that a long day on the mountains would do us good at this stage on may six climbed a small peak above the left bank of the rongbuk glacier it was a day of small misfortunes for me as we were walking on the stony slopes in the early morning my triconi nails of hard steel slipped on a granite slab and i contrived to leave there an incredible amount of skin from the back of my right hand and higher as we worked along a broken ridge a large boulder poised in unstable equilibrium slipped as i brushed it with my knee and fell on the big toe joint so as to pinion my right foot it was an awkward moment for the place was steep i just had strength to heave it over and down the mountain side and luckily no bones were broken but walking was very painful afterwards and perhaps this accident had something to do with the fatigue i felt as we neared the summit on the lower slopes i had been going well enough and seemed fitter than somerville at twenty one thousand feet he was apparently no more fatigued than at eighteen thousand or nineteen thousand feet while i could scarcely drag one leg after the other and when we came back to camp i was surprisingly glad to take a little whisky in my tea three i have said too much already about the early stage of acclimatization my excuse must be that much will depend upon this factor the issue will depend no less on organization and transport and though this subject is general bruce's province at all events so far as camp three i have a few words to add to what he has written in the calculation of what will be required at various stages in order to reach the summit of mount everest it is necessary to begin at the highest and the climber imagines in the first place where he would like to have his camps he may imagine that on the final day he might rise two thousand feet to the summit if he is to give himself the best chance of success he will not wish to start much lower than twenty seven thousand feet and in any case he cannot camp much higher for he is very unlikely to find a place on the ridge above the northeast shoulder twenty seven thousand four hundred feet or on the steep rocks within two hundred feet of it we may therefore fix twenty seven thousand feet approximately 
as the desirable height for the last camp and we have another camping ground fixed for us by circumstances approximately at twenty three thousand feet the broad shelf lying in the shelter of the ice cliffs on the north col there is no convenient place for a comparatively large camp for a considerable distance either above or below it but to carry up a camp four thousand feet at these altitudes would be to ask altogether too much of the porters we must therefore establish an intermediary camp between these two say at twenty five thousand feet if a place can be found now what will be required at these three camps we must ask first with what number of climbers the assault is to be made a party of two appears insufficient for if one man should become exhausted the other will probably want help in bringing him down this difficulty is met by having three climbers but since an exhausted man cannot be left alone certainly not without the shelter of a tent nor should one man go on alone a party of three must turn back so soon as one man is unable to go further four men would give a better chance of success in this case for then two might go on and still leave one to look after the sick man granted then that the best hope is for four men to start from a camp at twenty seven thousand feet we have firstly to provide them with tents two tents are better than one for it may be difficult to find a place of four men to lie side by side and the greater weight of two smaller tents above one larger is inconsiderable and they must have sleeping bags provisions for two days fuel and cooking pots all these necessities have been previously carried up to the camp below at twenty five thousand feet but other things besides are required there we may assume that this camp is to be used as a stage on the way up only and not on the way down even so six porters at least will have to sleep there before carrying up the highest camp and their requirements will be the same as we have laid down for the four climbers we must add another day's provisions and fuel for the climbers themselves it will be understood from this method of calculation how we arrive at the number of loads which must be carried up to any given camp it is observable that at each stage downwards the number increases in a proportion considerably greater than two to one fortunately we are not obliged to proceed strictly on these lines to the lower camps we need not carry up the whole of our stores on one day and consequently we need not increase in this alarming ratio the number of our porters but in any case when we get down to the north coal we must clearly have a large bulk of stores and the fewer porters we employ between one stage and another economizing on tents and sleeping bags the more time we shall require it was clear from the start that time was likely to be a formidable enemy general bruce's problem was not only to move our vast quantity of stores across an almost barren country but to move them in a given time it was fortunate for this reason that the number of porters who came with us was not increased for every man must add something to our burdens no one who knows that arid country could fail to be surprised that we reached our base camp below the rongbuk glacier so early as the first of may but now the number of nepalese porters only forty were available for carrying was too small for all our needs if they alone were to shoulder all our loads when should we reach the north coal some sort of depot must be established below it at twenty one thousand feet for the supply of all higher camps on the mountain before we could proceed and the reconnaissance party determined that two staging camps would be required between the base camp and this depot the existence and the solution of so large a problem of transport have so important a bearing on our later plans that i must refer to it again in this place general bruce has told how he impressed tibetans into his service and by using them up to camp two was able to liberate our own porters much earlier than might have been expected for work further on but the system of employing tibetans did not work without a hitch 
it was because the first labor battalion absconded that general bruce gave orders for only two of us to go forward and used the first opportunities for pushing on from camp three with the prospect of an early monsoon and a shortage of transport it was desirable that so soon as any porters were available for work above camp three this work should be pushed on without delay and if necessary an assault should be made with the minimum of stores required by a party of two climbers without a further supply of transport there was no question of using the oxygen for we should have more than enough to carry up without it on may ten somerville and i started from the base camp for camp one the way already customary among the porters led us at first over the flat waste of stones intersected occasionally by dry stream beds which lies below the black humpy snout of the rongbuk glacier we then followed the deep trough below the glacier's right west bank an obvious line but rough with great boulders it is not before reaching the head of this trough where one must turn up towards the east rongbuk glacier that a problem arises as to how best to proceed here we found that an adequate path had already been stamped on the loose moraine and after ascending steeply we contoured the hillside at an easy gradient a little forethought and energy had devised so good a way that we could walk comfortably from one camp to the other in two hours and a half moreover we were highly pleased by camp one the draught perpetually blowing down the main glacier was scarcely noticed in this side valley the afternoon sun was shining to cheer the stony scene and away to the west some noble peaks were well placed for our delight but beyond aesthetic satisfaction we were soon aware of a civilized habitation we had been in camp only a few minutes when a cook brought us tea and sweet biscuits and demanded to know what we would like for dinner we ordered a good dinner and proceeded to examine our apartments geoffrey bruce we knew had been busy here with certain constructional works to obviate the difficulty of carrying up heavy tents which were required in any case at the base camp we found a little house reserved for europeans one of four solidly built with stones and roofed with the outer flies of whimper tents i never measured up this chamber I suppose the floor must have been eight feet by ten feet and the roof four feet high it is true the tent poles bridging across from side to side in support of the roof were in dangerously unstable equilibrium and there were windy moments when valetudinously minded persons might have pronounced it a draughty room but we were far from hypocritical on this first night particularly as no wind blew and a wonderful and pleasant change it was after living in tents to sit eat and sleep in a house once more the greater part of our alpine stores with which i was especially concerned had already reached camp one and there i found the various bundles of tents ropes sleeping bags crampons paraffin petrol primus stoves cooking sets etc which I had carefully labelled for their respective destinations. The great majority were labelled for three. No higher destination had yet been assigned, and I speculated, not altogether optimistically, as to the probable rates of their arrival. As the general order of transport was interrupted for the present, we had to decide what we should take on with us both of food and alpine stores somerville who by now was an expert in the numbers and contents of food boxes vigorously selected all that we preferred and we went to bed with very good hopes for the future at least in one respect in consequence of these puzzling problems it took us some little time in the morning to make up our loads it was past ten o'clock when we started on our way to camp two I was surprised, after we had proceeded some distance along the stones on the left bank of the East Rongbuk Glacier, to observe a conspicuous cairn, evidently intended to mark our way over the glacier itself. But the glacier in its lower end is so completely covered with stones that in choosing the easiest way one is only concerned to find the flattest surfaces, 
and as we mildly followed where the route had been laid out by Colonel Strutt and his party, we found the glacier far less broken than was to be expected. Ultimately, we walked along a conspicuous medial moraine, avoiding by that means some complicated ice, and descended it abruptly to find ourselves on the flat space where Camp 2 was situated. By this time we had seen a good deal of the East Rongbuk Glacier. As we came up the moraine near its left bank, we looked northwards on a remarkable scene. From the stony surface of the glacier fantastic pinnacles arose, a strange, gigantic company, gleaming white as they stood in some sort of order, divided by the definite lines of the moraines. Beyond and above them was a vast mountain of reddish rock, known to us only by the triangulated height of its sharp summit, marked in Wheeler's map as 23,180. The pinnacles became more thickly crowded together as we mounted, until, as we followed the bend southwards, individuals were lost in the crowd, and finally the crowd was merged in the great tumbled sea of the glacier, now no longer dark with stones, but exhibiting everywhere the bright surfaces of its steep and angry waves. At Camp 2 we were surrounded on three sides by this amazing world of ice. We lay in the shelter of a vertical cliff not less than sixty feet high, sombrely cold in the evening shadow, dazzlingly white in the morning sun, and perfectly set off by the frozen pool at its foot. Nothing, of course, was to be seen of Mount Everest. The whole bulk of the north peak stood in front of it. But by mounting a few steps up some stony slopes above us, we could see to the southeast, over the surface of the ice, the slopes coming down from the Lapka La, from which high pass we had looked down the East Rongbuk Glacier in September 1921, and observed the special whiteness of the broken stream, at our own level now, and puzzled over its curious course. We had yet another sight to cheer us as we lay in our tents. On the range between us and the main Rongbuk glacier stood, in the one direction of uninterrupted vision, a peak of slender beauty, and as the moon rose its crests were silver cords. Next morning, May 12, according to Colonel Strutt's directions, we worked our way along the true left edge of the glacier and the stones of its left bank. The problem here is to avoid that tumbled sea of ice where no moraine can be continuously followed. Probably it would be possible to get through this ice almost anywhere, for it is not an ice fall, the gradient is not steep, the pinnacles are not seracs, and there are few crevasses, but much time and labour would be wasted in attempting such a course. Further up, the surface becomes more even, and the reconnaissance party had reached this better surface by only a short and simple crossing of the rougher ice. We easily found the place, marked by a conspicuous cairn, where they had turned away from the bank. Their tracks on the glacier, though snow was lying in the hollows, were not easy to follow, and we quickly lost them, but presently we found another cairn built upon a single large stone, and here proceeded with confidence to cross a deep and wide trough of which we had been warned, and once this obstacle was overcome we knew no difficulty could impede our progress to Camp 3. The laden porters, however, did not get along very easily. Their nails, for the most part, were worn smooth, and they found the ice too slippery. As I had never seen in the Alps a glacier surface like this one, I was greatly surprised by the nature of the bare ice. In a sense, it was often extremely rough, with holes and minute watercourses having vertical sides six inches to thirteen inches high, but the upper surfaces of the little knobs and plateaus intervening were extraordinarily hard and smooth, and the colour was very much bluer than the usual granular surface of a dry glacier. It was also surprising to find at most a thin coating of fine snow as high as 20,500 feet, for in 1921 we had found, even before the first heavy snowfall, plenty of snow on the glaciers above 19,000 feet. 
For my part, with new nails in my boots, I was not troubled by the slippery surfaces. But we decided to supply the porters with crampons, which they subsequently found very useful on this stage of the journey. End of chapter 4, part 2「Section 10 of the Assault on Mount Everest, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Assault on Mount Everest, 1922, by various authors. Section 10. The Highest Camp by George Mallory, Part 1. 4. The situation of Camp 3 when we reached it early in the afternoon was not calculated to encourage me, though I suppose it might be found congenial by hardier men. We had turned the corner of the North Peak so that the steep slopes of its eastern arm rose above us to north and west. Our tents were to be pitched on the stones that have rolled down these slopes onto the glacier, and just out of range of a stonefall from the rocks immediately above us. A shallow trough divided us from the main plateau of the glacier, and up this trough the wind was blowing. Since a higher current was hurrying the clouds from the normal direction, northwest, we might presume that this local variation was habitual, but wind we could hardly expect to escape from one direction or another. A more important consideration, perhaps, for a mountain camp, is the duration of sunshine. Here we should have the sun early, for to the east we looked across a wide snowy basin to the comparatively low mountains round about the Lac Pala, but we should lose it early too, and we observed with dismay on this first afternoon that our camp was in shadow at 3.15 p.m. The water supply was conveniently near, running in a trough, and we might expect it to be unfrozen for several hours each day. Whatever we might think of this place, it was undoubtedly the best available. Very little energy remained among the party, most of whom had now reached 21,000 feet for the first time in their lives. However, a number soon set to work leveling the ground which we chose for two tents. It was necessary to do this work thoroughly, for, unlike the smooth flat stones at Camp 1, these, like those at Camp 2, of which we had obtained sufficient experience during the previous night, were extremely sharp and uncomfortable to lie on. After it was done, we sent down the main body of the porters, keeping only one man for cook and each the man specifically attached to him as servant by Geoffrey Bruce's command long ago in Darjeeling. With these, we proceeded to order our camp. The tents were pitched. Some sort of a cookhouse was constructed from the wealth of building material, and we also began to put up walls behind which we could lie in shelter to eat our meals. Perhaps the most important matter was the instruction of Pooh, our cook, in the correct use of the Primus stove. With the purpose of giving him confidence, a fine fountain of blazing paraffin was arranged and at once extinguished by opening the safety valve. For the conservation of our fuel supply, we carefully showed him how the absolute alcohol must be used to warm the burner while paraffin and petrol were to be mixed for combustion. Fortunately, his intelligence rose above those disagreeable agitations which attend the roaring, or the failure to roar, of primus stoves, so that after these first explanations, we had never again to begrime our hands with paraffin and soot. In our tent this evening of May 12th, Somerville and I discussed what we should do. There was something to be said for taking a day's rest at this altitude before attempting to rise another 2,000 feet. Neither of us felt at his best. After our first activities in camp, I had made myself comfortable with my legs in a sleeping bag. Somerville, with his accustomed energy, had been exploring at some distance. He had walked as far as the broad pass on the far side of our snowy basin, the Ripie La, at the foot of Everest's northeast ridge, and had already begun a sketch of the wonderful view obtained from that point of Makalu. When he returned to camp about 5.30 p.m., he was suffering from a headache and made a poor supper. Moreover, we were full of doubts about the way up to the North Call. After finding so much ice on the glacier, we must expect to find ice on those east-facing slopes below the Call. It was not unlikely that we should be compelled to cut steps the whole way up, 
and several days would be required for so arduous a task. We decided, therefore, to lose no time in establishing a track to the North Call. It was our intention on the following morning, May 13th, to take with us two available porters, leaving only our cook and camp, and so make a small beginning towards the supply of our next camp. But Somerville's man was sick and could not come with us. We set out in good time with only my porter, Dasno, and carried with us, besides one small tent, a large coil of spare rope and some wooden pegs about 18 inches long. As we made our way up the gently sloping snow, it was easy to distinguish the line following to the North Call after the monsoon last year, a long slope at a fairly easy angle bearing away to the right or north, a traverse to the left, and a steep slope leading up to the shelf under the ice cliff on the skyline. With the sun behind us, we saw the first long slope, nearly 1,000 feet, glittering in a way that snow will never glitter. There we should find only blue ice, bare and hard. Further to the north was no better, and as we looked at the steep final slope, it became plain enough that there and nowhere else was the necessary key to the whole ascent, for to the south of an imaginary vertical line drawn below it, it was a hopeless series of impassable cliffs. The more we thought about it, the more convinced we became that an alternative way must be found up to this final slope. We had not merely to reach the North Call once, Whatever way we chose must be used for all the comings and goings to and from a camp up there. Unless the connection between camps three and four were free from serious obstacles, the whole problem of transport would increase enormously in difficulty. Every party of porters must be escorted by climbers both up and down, and even so the dangers on a big ice slope after a fall of snow would hardly be avoided. Endeavoring to trace out a satisfactory route from the shelf of the North Call downwards, we soon determined that we should make use of a sloping corridor lying some distance to the left of the icy line used last year, and apparently well covered with snow. For three or four hundred feet above the flat snowfield, it appeared to be cut off by very steep ice slopes. Nevertheless, the best hope was to attempt an approach more or less direct to the foot of this corridor, and first we must reconnoiter the steepest of these obstacles, which promised the most convenient access to the desired point could we climb it. Here, fortune favored our enterprise. We found the surface slightly cleft by a fissure slanting at first to the right and then directly upwards. In the disintegrated substance of its edges, it was hardly necessary to cut steps, and we mounted 250 feet of what threatened to be formidable ice with no great expenditure of time and energy. Two lengths of rope were now fixed for the security of future parties, the one hanging directly downwards from a single wooden peg driven in almost to the head, and another on a series of pegs for the passage of a leftward traverse which brought us to the edge of a large crevasse. We were now able to let ourselves down into the snow which choked this crevasse a little distance below its edges, and by means of some large steps hewn in the walls and another length of rope, a satisfactory crossing was established. Above this crevasse, we mounted easy snow to the corridor. So far as the shelf which was our objective, we now met no serious difficulty. The gentle angle steepened for a short space where we were obliged to cut a score of steps in hard ice. We fixed another length of rope, and again the final slope was steep, but not so as to trouble us. However, the condition of the snow was not perfect. We were surprised, on a face where so much ice appeared, to find any snow that was not perfectly hard. And yet we were usually breaking a heavy crust and stamping down the steps in snow deep enough to cover our ankles. It was a question rather of strength than of skill. An east-facing slope in the heat and glare of the morning sun favors the enemy mountain sickness. And though no one of us three was sick, our lassitude increased continually as we mounted, and it required as much energy as we could muster to keep on stamping slowly upwards. We lay down at length on the shelf, not yet shaded by the ice cliff above it, in a state of considerable exhaustion. Here, presumably, was the end of a day's work satisfactory in the most important respect, for we felt that the way we had found was good enough, and with the fixed ropes was suitable for use under almost any conditions. It occurred to us after a little interval and some light refreshment that one thing yet remained to be done. The lowest point of the North Call from which the north ridge of Everest springs a little way to the south of our shelf, is perhaps ten minutes' walk. 
We ought to go just so far as that in order to make quite sure of the way onward. In the direction of the northeast shoulder, now slightly east of south from us, the shelf slopes gradually upwards, a ramp, as it were, alongside the battlements almost attaining the level of the crust itself. In the whirl of snow and wind on that bitter day of September 1921, Bullock, Wheeler, and I had found it necessary, in order actually to gain this level, to take a few steps to the right round the head of a large crevasse slanting across our line to the North Call. Somerville and I soon found ourselves confronted by the same crevasse and prepared to evade it by the same maneuver. But during those intervening months, the crack had extended itself some distance to the right and prevented the possibility of getting round at that end. It was also much too wide to be leapt. The best chance was in the other direction. Here we were able to work our way down before the steep slopes plunge over towards the head of the East Rongbuk Glacier to a snow bridge within the crevasse giving access to a fissure in its opposite wall. We carefully examined the prospects of an ascent at this point. Our idea was to go up in the acute angle between two vertical walls of ice. A ladder of footsteps and finger holds would have to be constructed in the ice, and even so the issue would be doubtful. When we set against the severe labor, our present state of weakness and considered the consequences of a step into the gulf of the crevasse while steps were being cut, how poor a chance only one man could have of pulling out his companion, it was clear that a performance of this kind must wait for a stronger party. In any case, we reckoned, this was not a way which could safely be used by laden porters. If it must be used, we should apply to General Bruce for a 15-foot ladder, more permanent than any we could make in the ice, and no doubt the mechanical ingenuity so much in evidence at the base camp would devise a ladder both portable and strong. Even this thought failed to inspire us with perfect confidence, and it seemed rather a long way to have come from England to Mount Everest to be stopped by an obstacle like this. But was there no possible alternative? On this side of the crust we had nothing more to hope, but on the far side could we reach it? There might exist some other shelf crowning the west-facing slopes of the call and connecting with the lowest point. We retraced our steps, going now in the opposite direction with a battlement on our left. Beyond, there was a snow slope ascending toward the formidable ridge of the North Peak. The crevasse guarding it was filled with snow and presented no difficulty, and though the slope was steep, we were able to make a staircase up the edge of it, and presently found ourselves on the broken ground of the northern end of the crest. As we turned back toward Everest, a huge crevasse was in our way. A narrow bridge of ice took us across it, and we found we were just able to leap another crevasse a few yards further. We had now an uninterrupted view of all that lies to the west. Below us was the head of the main Rongbuk Glacier. On the skyline to the left was a prodigious northwest ridge of Everest, flanked with snow, hiding the crest of the west peak. Past the foot of the northwest ridge, we looked down the immense glacier flowing southwestwards into Nepal and saw without distinguishing them the distant ranges beyond. Near at hand, a sharp edge of rocks, the buttress of Changxi falling abruptly to the Rongbuk Glacier, blocked out vision of the two greatest mountains northwest of Everest, Gaiacheng Kang, 25,990 feet, and Cho Yuo, 26,367. But we could feel no regret for this loss, so enchanted were we by the spectacle of Pumori, though its summit, 23,190, was little higher than our own level, it was, as it always is, a singularly impressive sight. The snow cap of Pomori is supported by splendid architecture. The pyramidal bulk of the mountain, the steep fall of the ridges and faces to south and west, and the precipices of rock and ice towards east and north are set off by a whole chain of mountains extending west-northwest along a frail, fantastic ridge unrivaled anywhere in this district for the elegant beauty of its cornices and towers. No more striking change of scenery could be imagined than this from all we saw to the east. The gentle snowy basin, the unemphatic lines of the slopes below and on either side of the Lac Pala, dominated as they are by the dullest of mountains, Katarfu, the even fall of rocks and snow from the east ridge of Changxi and from the northeast ridge of Everest, 
Pomori itself stood only as a symbol of this new wonderful world before our eyes as we stayed to look westwards. A world exciting, strange, unearthly, fantastic as the skyscrapers in New York City, and at the same time possessing the dignity of what is enduring and immense. For no end was visible or even conceivable to this kingdom of adventure. However, even Somerville's passion for using colored chalks did not encourage him to stay long inactive in a place designed to be a funnel for the west wind of Tibet at an elevation of about 23,000 feet. We sped again over snow-covered montacules thrust out from the chaos of riven ice and at last looked down from one more prominent little summit to the very nape of the Chang La. We saw our conjectured shelf and real existence in a fair way before us. In a moment, all our doubts were eased. We knew that the foot of the North Ridge, by which alone we could approach the summit of Mount Everest, was not beyond our reach. Dasno, meanwhile, was stretched in the snow on the sheltered shelf, which clearly must serve us sooner or later for Camp 4. As we looked down upon him from the battlements, we noticed that their shadow already covered the greater part of the shelf. It was four o'clock. We must delay no longer. The tent which Dasno had carried up was left to be the symbol of our future intentions, and we hastened down. Since 7 a.m., Somerville and I had been spending our strength with only one considerable halt, and latterly at a rapid rate. For some hours now, we had felt the dull, height headache which results from exertion with too little oxygen, a symptom, I am told, not unlike the effect of poisoning by carbon monoxide. The unpleasing symptom became so increasingly disagreeable as we came down that I was very glad to reach our tent again. As it was only fair that Somerville should share all my sufferings, it now seemed inconsiderate of him to explain that he had a good appetite. For my part, I took a little soup and could face no food. Defeated for the first and last time in either expedition before the sight of supper, I humbly swallowed a dose of aspirin, lay my head on the pillow, and went to sleep. 5. For three days now we made no expedition of any consequence. The question arises then, what did we? I have been searching the meager entries in my journal for an answer, with no satisfactory result. The doctrine that men should be held accountable for their days, or even their hours, is one to which the very young often subscribe as a matter of course, seeing in front of them such a long way to go and so little time. The futility of exact accounts in this sort is apparent among mountains. The span of human life appears so short as to hardly be capable of the usual subdivisions. And a much longer period than a day may be neglected as easily as a halfpenny in current expenditure. And while some hours and days are spent in doing, others pass in simply being or being evolved, a process in the mind not to be measured in terms of time. Nevertheless, it is often interesting to draft a balance sheet covering a period of 24 hours or seven days, if only to see how much must truthfully be set down as unaccounted. In the present instance, my first inclination is to write off in this bold fashion a full half of the time we spent in Camp 3, but I will try to serve my accounts better cooked. The largest item in a balance of hours, even the least frank, will always be sleep. Here I prefer to make the entry under the heading, Bed. This will enable me to write off at once a minimum of 14 or a maximum of 16 hours, leaving me only 8 to 10 hours to account for. It is also a simplification, because I am able by this means to avoid a doubtful and perhaps an ugly heading, Dozing. No one will ask me to describe exactly what goes on in bed. At Camp 3, it will be understood that supper is always included, but not breakfast. For as the breakfasting hour is the most agreeable in the day, it must be spent out of doors in the warm sun. Supper, unlike most activities, takes less time than in civilized life. Wasted minutes allow the food to cool and the grease to congeal. The porter serving us would not want to be standing about longer than necessary, and the whole performance was expeditious. Perhaps the fashion of eating among mountaineers is also more wolfish than among civilized men. The remaining thirteen and a half or fourteen and a half hours were not all spent in sleep. Probably on the night of May 13, 14, I slept at least ten hours after the exertions of our ascent to the North Call. 
But though one sleeps well and is refreshed by sleep in a tent at an altitude to which one is sufficiently acclimatized, the outside world is not so very far away. However well accustomed to such scenes, one does not easily lose a certain excitement from the mere presence beyond the open tent door of the silent power of frost, suspending even the life of the mountains, and of the black ridges cutting the space of stars. The slow spinning web of unconscious thought is nearer consciousness. One wakes in the early morning with the mind more definitely gathered about a subject, looks out to find the stars still bright or dim in the first flush of dawn, and because the subject, whatever it be, and however nearly connected with the one absorbing problem, commands less concentrated attention, for the unwilled effort of the mind is more dispersed, one may often fall asleep once more and stay in a light intermittent slumber until the bright sun is up and the tent begins to be warm again. No sleeper, as far as I know on this second expedition, could compete either for quantity or quality with the sleep of Guy Bullock on the first, but all, perhaps with different habits from either his or mine, but at all events all who spent several nights at this camp or higher, slept well and were refreshed by sleep, and I hope they were no less grateful than I for those blessed nights. I often remarked during the expedition how large a part of a day had been spent by some of us in conversation. Down at the base camp, we would often sit on, those of us who were not expert photographers or painters or naturalists, sit indefinitely not only after dinner, but after each succeeding meal, talking the hours away. When a man has learned to deal firmly with an imperious conscience, he will be neither surprised nor ashamed in such circumstances to enter in his diary so many hours talking and listening. It is true that conscience has the right to demand, in the case of such an entry, that the subjects talked about should also be named. But our company was able to draw upon so wide a range of experience that a fair proportion of our subjects were worth talking of. Perhaps in the higher camps there was a tendency to talk, though less from active brains, for the sake of obliterating the sense of discomfort. However, I believe that most men, once they have faced the change from armchairs and spring mattresses and solid walls and hot baths and drawers for their clothes and shelves for their books, do not experience discomfort in camp life except in the matter of feeding. However good your food and however well cooked, sooner or later in this sort of life, meals appear messy. The most unsatisfactory circumstance of our meals at the base camp was the tables. In a country where wood is so difficult to obtain, you cannot construct solid tables, still less can you afford to carry them. Our ingenious X tables had thin iron legs and canvas tops. On the rough ground, they were altogether too light, too easily disturbed, and for this reason, too many of our victuals aired onto these tables. Their surfaces appeared under our eyes with constantly accumulating stains, but half rubbed out by a greasy rag. Efforts truly were made to control the nightly flow proceeding from X and Y in their cups. Had they been but cups of beer or whiskey, we might have minded a little enough. But the sticky soiling mess was soup or cocoa. Offenders were freely cursed. Tables were scrubbed. Tablecloths were produced. In the long run, no efforts availed. If the curry were tasty and the plate clean, who would complain of a dirty tablecloth, at the impurification of which, he had himself assisted. But I have little doubt that this circumstance, more than any gradual drift of the mountaineer back towards the Stone Age, was to be held accountable for the visible deterioration of our table manners. With no implication of insult to General Bruce and Dr. Longstaff, I record my belief that our manners at Camp 3 were better than those at the base camp. It may suggest a lower degree of civilization that men should be seated on the ground at boxes for eating rather than on boxes at a table. On the contrary, the nice adjustment of a full plate upon one's lap or the finer art of conveying and forking in the mouthfuls which start so much further from the face requires a delicacy, if it is to be accomplished at all, which continually restrains the grosser impulses. And, though it might be supposed that as we went higher up the mountain we should come to feeling entirely sans facon, it was my experience that the greater difficulties at the higher altitudes in satisfying the appetite continually promoted more civilized habits of feeding. To outward appearance, perhaps, the sight of four men each with a spoon eating out of a common saucepan of spaghetti would not be altogether reassuring. 
But one must not leave out of the reckoning the gourmet's peculiar enjoyment in the steamy aroma from things cooked and eaten before any wanton hand has served them on a dish, still less the finer politeness required by several persons sharing the same pots in this manner. On the whole, therefore, we suffered, either morally, aesthetically, or physically, little enough in the matter of meals, still less from any other cause. The bitter wind, it is true, was constantly disagreeable, but such wind deadens even the senses that dislike it, and the wind of Tibet was admirable both as an excuse for and necessary contrast with luxurious practices. Just as one most enjoys a fire when half aware of unpleasant things outside, or is most disgusted by a stuffy room after breathing the soft air of a southwest wind, so in Tibet one may delight merely in being warm anywhere. Neatly to avoid the disagreeable is in itself a keen pleasure and heightens the desire for active life. It was only rarely, very rarely, that one suffered of necessity, and generally, if a man were cold, he was himself to blame. Either he had failed to put on clothes enough for the occasion, or had failed, having put them on, to stimulate circulation. In a sleeping bag such as we had this year, with soft flannel lining the quilted eiderdown, one need not be chilled even by the coldest night, and to lie in a tent no bigger than will just hold two persons, with twenty degrees of frost inside and forty without, snugly defying cold and wind, to experience at once in this situation the keen bite of the air and the warm glow in one's extremities, gives a delicious sense of well-being and true comfort, never to be so acutely provoked even in the armchair at an English fireside. But to return to the subject from which I have naughtily digressed, time passed swiftly enough for Somerville and me at Camp 3. We did not keep the ball rolling so rapidly and continuously to and fro as it was wont to roll in the United Mess, but we found plenty to say to one another, more particularly after supper, in the tent. We entered upon a serious discussion of our future prospects on Mount Everest, and were both feeling so brave and hardy after a day's rest that we decided, if necessary, to meet the transport difficulty halfway and do without a tent in any camp we should establish above the North Call, and so reduce the burden to be carried up to Camp 4 to three rather light or two rather heavy loads. Our conversation was further stimulated by two little volumes which I had brought up with me. The one, Robert Bridges' anthology, The Spirit of Man, and the other, one-seventh of the complete works of William Shakespeare, including Hamlet and King Lear. It was interesting to test the choice made in answer to the old question, what book would you take to a desert island, though in this case it was a desert glacier, and the situation demanded rather lighter literature than prolonged edification might require on the island. The trouble about lighter literature is that it weighs heavier because more has to be provided. Neither of my books would be to everyone's taste in a camp at 21,000 feet, but the spirit of man, read aloud now by one of us and now by the other, suggested matters I'm dreamt of in the philosophy of Mount Everest, and enabled us to spend one evening very agreeably. On another occasion, I had the good fortune to open my Shakespeare at the very place where Hamlet addresses the ghost. Angels and ministers of grace defend us, I began, and the theme was so congenial that we stumbled on enthusiastically reading the parts in turn through half the play. Besides reading and talking, we found a number of things to do. The ordering of even so small a camp as this may occupy a good deal of attention. Stores will have to be checked and arranged in some way as to be easily found when wanted. One article or another is sure to be missing, too often to be retrieved when it lies on the stones only after prolonged search, and even to find a strayed stocking groped for on hands and knees in the congested tent may take a considerable time. Again, the difficult and important problem of meals will have to be considered in connection with the use of available food supplies. We have one ox tongue. Shall we open it today, or ought we keep it to take up with us? And so on. But with a number of details to be arranged, I was impressed not so much by the amount of energy and attention which they demanded, as by the time taken to do any little thing, and most of all to write. Undoubtedly, one is slower in every activity and in none so remarkably slower as in writing. The greater part of a morning 
might easily be consumed in writing one letter of perhaps a half dozen pages. In referring to my own slowness, particularly mental slowness, I must hasten to exclude my companion. His most important activity when we were not on the mountain was sketching. His vast supply of energy, the number of sketches he produced, and oil paintings besides, was only less remarkable than the rapidity with which he worked. On May 14, he again walked over the uncurvassed snowfield by himself to the Ripia La. Later on, I joined him, and, so far as I could judge, his talent and energy were no less at 21,000 feet than on the windswept plains of Tibet. End of section 10. Read by Paul Hampton. Section 11 of The Assault on Mount Everest, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Assault on Mount Everest, 1922, by various authors. Section 11, The Highest Camp, by George Mallory. Part 2. 6. On May 16th, Somerville and I spent the morning in camp with some hopes of welcoming sooner or later the arrival of stores. And sure enough, about midday, the first detachment of a large convoy reached our camp, with the porters, somewhat to our surprise, were Strutt, Moorshead, and Norton. The whole party seemed rather tired, though not more than was to be expected, and when a little later Crawford, the responsible transport officer came in, he told us he had been mountain sick. We were delighted to learn that General Bruce was now much happier about transport, hence these reinforcements. Twenty-two Tibetan coolies were now working up to Camp 1, more were expected, and the prospects were definitely brighter. A start had even been made, in spite of Finch's continued sickness, with moving up the oxygen cylinders. We at once proceeded to discuss with Crawford how many porters could remain with us at Camp 3. Taking into consideration the oxygen loads, he suggested a number below the hopes I had begun to entertain. It was agreed that eight could be spared without interfering with the work lower down. We had two before, so we should now have ten in all. It was clear that all must carry loads up to Camp 4 with the least delay in reason. But in view of the tremendous efforts that would be required of these men at a later stage, it was a necessary act of precautionary wisdom to grant the porters a day's rest on the 16th. And in any case, an extra day was advisable for the acclimatization of us all before sleeping at 23,000 feet. Meanwhile, we should be able to formulate exact plans for climbing the mountain. It had hitherto been assumed that the first attempt should be made only by Somerville and me, and General Bruce had not cancelled our orders but he had now delegated his authority to strut as second in command to decide on the spot what had best be done. The first point, therefore, to be settled was the number of climbers composing the party of attack. Strutt himself took the modest role of assuming that he would not be equal to a considerable advance above Camp 4, but saw no reason why the other four of us, Crawford returned on the 15th to a lower camp, should be too many for one party provided our organization sufficed. Norton and Moorshead were evidently most anxious to come on, and for my part I'd always held, and still held, the view that four climbers were a sounder party than two for this sort of mountaineering, and would have a better chance of success. It remained to determine what could be done for a party of four by the available porters. To carry the whole of what we should need up to Camp 4 in one journey was clearly impossible, but we reckoned that twenty loads should be enough to provide for ourselves and for nine porters, who would have to sleep there and carry up another camp. The delay in making two journeys to the North Call was not too great. The one sacrifice involved by this plan was a second camp above the North Call. In my judgment, the chances of establishing such a camp, even for two climbers, with so small a number as ten porters, without reckoning further loss of time, would be small in any case. We were necessarily doubtful as to how much might be expected of our porters before the North Ridge had been explored, and before we had any evidence to show that these men were capable of much more than other porters had accomplished before. It was right, therefore, for the advantages of the stronger party 
to sacrifice so uncertain a prospect. Nevertheless, we realize the terrible handicap in this limitation. I shall perhaps appear as affirming or repeating what is merely commonplace if I venture to make some observations about the weather, but I must here insist upon its importance to mountaineers, and though I cannot remember that the subject was much discussed among us at Camp 3, it remained but a little way below the surface of consciousness. In settled weather among mountains, one has not a great deal to observe. The changing colors at sunrise and sunset follow an expected sequence, the white flocks of fleecy clouds form and drift upwards, or the midday haze gathers about the peaks, leaving the climber unperturbed. He has sniffed the keen air before dawn when he came out under the bright stars, and his optimism is assured for the day. On Mount Everest, it had been supposed that the season preceding the monsoon would be mainly fair, but we knew that the warm, moist air should be approaching up the Aran Valley, pushing up towards us during the month of May and we must expect to feel something of its influence. Moreover, we did not know very well how to read the signs in this country. We anxiously watched and studied them, each of us, I suppose, while he might be engaged upon one thing or another, or talking of matters infinitely and delightfully remote from Mount Everest, like a pilot has his weather eye open. And what he saw would not all be encouraging. The drift of the upper clouds, it is true, was fairly consistent. The white wisps of smoke, as it seemed, were driven in our direction over the north call, and occasionally the clear edge of the north ridge would be dulled with powdery snow puffed out on the eastern side. But looking across the snowfield from near our camp to where the head of Makalu showed over the Rapiola, we saw strange things happening. On May 16, our day of rest, a number of us paid a visit to this pass, and as we stood above the head of the Kama Valley, the clouds boiling up from that vast and terrible cauldron were not gleaming white, but sadly gray. A glimpse down the valley showed under them the somber blue light that forebodes mischief, and Makalu, seen through a rift, looked cold and grim. The evidence of trouble in store for us was not confined to the Kama Valley, for some clouds away to the north also excited our suspicion. And yet, as we looked up the edges of the northeast arete to its curving sickle and the great towers of the northeast shoulder, here was the dividing line between the clear air and fair weather to the right and the white mist to the left streaming up above the ridge and all the evil omens. The bitterest even of Tibetan winds poured violently over the pass at our backs. We wondered as we turned to meet it how long a respite was to be allowed us. Preparation for what we intended to attempt was not to be made without some thought, or at all events I do not find such preparation a perfectly simple matter. It requires exact calculation. The first thing is to make a list. In this case, a list of all we should require at Camp 4, with the approximate weights of each article. But not every article would be available to be carried up on the first of the two journeys to the North Call. For instance, we must keep our sleeping bags for use at Camp 3 until we moved up ourselves. It was necessary, therefore, to mark off certain things to be left for the second journey, and to ascertain that not more than half of the whole was so reserved. It might be supposed that the problem could now be solved by adding up the weights, dividing the total by ten, the number of our porters, and giving so many pounds, according to this arithmetical answer, to each man for the first journey. In practice, this cannot be done, and we have to allow for the fallibility of human lists. However carefully you have gone over in your mind and provided for every contingency, you may be quite sure you have omitted something, probably some property of the porters regarded by them as necessary to salvation, and at the last moment it will turn up. The danger is that one or two men will be seriously overloaded, and perhaps without your knowing it. To circumvent it, allowance must be made in your calculations. On this occasion, we took good care to carry up more than half of what was shown on our list on the first journey. Another difficulty in the mathematical solution is the nature of the loads. They cannot all be exactly equal, because they are composed of indivisible objects. A tent cannot be treated like a vulgar fraction. The best plan, therefore, is to fix a maximum. We intended our loads to be from 25 to 30 pounds. They were all weighed with a spring balance, and the upper limit was only exceeded by a pound or two in two cases, 
to the best of my remembrance. On May 17, the 15 of us, Strutt, Morshead, Norton, Somerville, and I, with 10 porters, set off for Camp 4. The snow was in good condition. We had our old tracks to tread in, and the only mishap to be feared was the possible exhaustion of one or more porters. It was necessary that all the loads should reach their destination today, but the five climbers were comparatively unladen and constituted a reserve of power. My recollections of going up to the North Call are all of a performance, rather wearisome and dazed, of a mind incapable of acute perceptions faintly stirring the drowsy senses to take notice within a circle of limited radius. The heat and glare of the morning sun as it blazed upon the windless long slopes emphasized the monotony. I was dimly aware of this puzzling question of light rays and the harm they might do. I was glad that I wore two felt hats, and that Strutt and Somerville had their solar topies. Moorshead and Norton had no special protection, and the porters none at all. What did it matter? Seemingly nothing. We plodded on and slowly upwards. Each of us was content to go as slowly as anyone else might wish to go. The porters were more silent than usual. They were strung up to the effort required of them. No one was going to give in. The end was certain. At length, our success was duly epitomized. As he struggled up the final slope, Strut broke into gasping speech. I wish that cinema were here. If I look anything like what I feel, I ought to be immortalized for the British public. We looked at his grease-smeared, yellow ashen face, and the reply was, Well, what in heaven's name do we look like? And what do we do it for anyway? At all events, we had some reason to feel hopeful on our subsequent day's rest, May 18. Somerville more particularly pronounced that his second journey to Camp 4 had been much less fatiguing than the first. I was able to say the same, though I felt a sufficient reason was to be found in the fact that far less labor had been required of me. It was more remarkable, perhaps, that those who went for the first time to 23,000 feet, and especially the laden men, should have shown so much endurance. On May 19, we carried up the remainder of our loads, and again we seemed better acclimatized. The ascent to the North Call was generally felt to be easier on this day. We had strength to spare when we reached the shelf. With all our loads now gathered about us at Camp 4, the first stage up from the base of the mountains was accomplished. Tomorrow, we hoped, would complete the second. The five light tents were gradually pitched, two of them destined for the climbers a few yards apart towards the North Peak, the remaining three to accommodate each three porters in the same alignment. In all, a neat little row showing green against the white. The even surface of the snow was further disturbed by the muddled tracks, soon to be a trampled space about the tent doors. For the safety of sleepwalkers, or any other who might feel disposed to take a walk in the night, these tent doors faced inwards toward the back of the shelf. There, the gigantic blocks of ice were darker than the snow on which their deep shadow was thrown. Their cleft surfaces suggested cold colors and were green and blue as the ocean is on some winter's day of swelling seas. A strange, impressive rampart, impregnable against direct assault, and equally well-placed to be the final defense of the North Call on this section, and at the same time to protect us amazingly, entirely, against the unfriendly wind from the West. Other activities besides demanded our attention. It had been resolved that one more rope should be fixed on the steep slope we must follow to circumvent the ice cliffs. Moorshead and Somerville volunteered for this good work. Norton and I were left to tend the cooking pots. As we had not burdened the porters with a large supply of water, we now had to make provision both for this evening and for tomorrow morning. The Primus stoves remained at Camp 3, partly because they were heavy and partly because, however carefully devised, their performance at a high altitude must always be a little uncertain. They had served us well up to 21,000 feet, and we had no need to trust them further. With our aluminum cooking sets, we could use either absolute alcohol in the spirit burner or meta, a French sort of solidified spirit, especially prepared in cylindrical shape and extremely efficient. You only have to put a match to the dry white cylinders and they burn without any trouble and smokelessly, even at 23,000 feet, for not less than 40 minutes. The supply of meta was not very large and it was considered rather as an emergency fuel. 
The alcohol was to do most of our heating at Camp 4, and all too rapidly it seemed to burn away as we kept filling and refilling our pots with snow. In the end, six large thermos flasks were filled with tea or water for the use of all in the morning, and we had enough for our present needs besides. Mooreshead and Somerville had not long returned, after duly fixing the rope, before our meal was ready. As I have already referred to our table manners, the more delicate-minded among my readers may not relish the spectacle of us four feasting around our cooking pots, in which case I caution them to admit this paragraph. For now, living up to my own standard of faithful narrative, I must honestly and courageously face the subject of victuals. As mankind is agreed that the pleasures of the senses, when it is impossible they should be actually experienced, can most nearly be tasted by exercising an artistic faculty in choosing the dishes of imaginary repasts, so it might be supposed that the state of affairs, when those pleasures were thousands of feet below in other worlds, might more easily be brought to mind by reconstructing the associated menus. But such a practice was unfortunately out of the question, for it would have involved assigning this, that, and the other to breakfast, lunch, and supper, and, when calling to mind what we ate, I try to distinguish between one meal and another, I am altogether at a loss. I can only suppose they were interchangeable. The nature of our supplies confirms my belief that this was the case. Practically speaking, we hardly considered by which name our meal should be called, but only what would seem nice to eat or convenient to produce when we next wanted food and drink. Among the supplies I classify some as standard pattern, such things as we knew were always to be had in abundance, the piece, as it were, of our whole menage, three solid foods, two liquid foods, and one stimulant. The stimulant, in the first place, as long as we remained at Camp 3, was amazingly satisfactory, both for its kind, its quality, and especially for its abundance. We took it shamelessly before breakfast, and at breakfast again, occasionally with or after lunch, and most usually a little time before supper, when it was known as afternoon tea. The longer we stayed at this camp, the deeper were our potations. So good was the tea that I came almost to disregard the objectionable flavor of tinned milk in it. I'd always supposed that General Bruce would keep a special herd of yaks at the base camp for the provision of fresh milk. But this scheme was hardly practicable, for the only grass at the base camp grew under canvas, and no one suggested sharing his tent with a yak. The one trouble about our stimulant was its scarcity as we proceeded up the mountain. It diminished instead of increasing to the climax where it was needed most. Fortunately, the lower temperatures at which water boils as the atmospheric pressure diminishes made no appreciable difference to the quality, and the difficulty of melting snow enough to fill out our saucepans with water was set off to some extent by increasing the quantity of tea leaves. The two liquid foods, cocoa and pea soup, though not imbibed so plentifully as tea, were considered no less as the natural and fitting companions of meat on any and every occasion. At Camp 3, it was not unusual to begin supper with pea soup and end it with cocoa, but such a custom by no means precluded their use at other times. Cocoa tended to fall in my esteem, though it never lost a certain popularity. Pea soup, on the other hand, had a growing reputation, and, from being considered an accessory, came to be regarded as a principle. However, before I describe its dominating influence in the whole matter of diet, I must mention the solid foods. The three of standard pattern were ration biscuits, ham, and cheese. It was no misfortune to find above the base camp that we had left the region of fancy breads, for while the chapatis and scones, baked by our cooks with such surprising skill and energy, were usually palatable, they were probably more difficult of digestion than the biscuits, and our appetite for those hard wholemeal biscuits increased as we went upwards, possibly to the detriment of teeth, which became ever more brittle. Ham, of all foods, was the most generally acceptable. The quality of our hunter's hams left nothing to be desired, and the supply, apparently, was inexhaustible. A slice of ham, or several slices, either cold or fried, was fit food for any and almost every meal. The cheese supplied for our use at these higher camps and for expeditions on the mountains besides were always delicious and freely eaten. 
We had also a considerable variety of other tinned foods. Harris's sausages, sardines, herrings, sliced bacon, soups, ox tongues, green vegetables, both peas and beans. All these I remember in general use at Camp 3. We were never short of jam and chocolate. As luxuries, we had quails and truffles, besides various sweet stuffs such as mixed biscuits, acid drops, crystallized ginger, figs and prunes. I feel greedy again as I name them. And reserved more or less for use at the highest camps, Heinz's spaghetti. More important, perhaps, than any of these was Army and Navy rations. From the special use we made of it, I never quite made out what these tins contained. They were designed to be, when heated up, a rich stew of mutton or beef, or both. They were used by us to enrich a stew, which was the peculiar invention of Moorshead. He called it hoosh. Like a trained chef, he was well aware that the foundation of good cooking is the stock pot. But such a maximum was decidedly depressing under our circumstances. Instead of accepting and regretting our want of a stock pot, Moorshead, with the true genius that penetrates to the inward truth, devised a substitute and improved the motto. The foundation of every dish must be pea soup. Or if these were not his very words, it was easy to deduce that they contained the substance of his culinary thoughts. It was a corollary of this axiom that any and every available solid food might be used to stew with pea soup. The process of selection tended to emphasize the merits of some as compared with other solids until it became almost a custom, sadly to the limitation of Moorhead's art, to prefer to sliced bacon or even sausages for the flotsam and jetsam of hoosh, Army and Navy rations. It was hoosh that we ate at Camp 4, about the hour of an early afternoon tea on May 19. We had hardly finished eating and washing up. It was a point of honor to wash up, and much may be achieved with snow. When the shadow crept over our tents, and the chill of evening was upon us. We lingered a little after everything was set up in order to look out over the still sunlit slopes of Mount Everest between us and the Rapia La, and over the undulating basin of snow towards the Lac Pala and Camp 4, and to pass some cheerful remarks with the porters, already seeking shelter, before turning in ourselves for the night. It had been, so far as we could tell, a singularly windless day, such clouds as we had observed were seemingly innocent, and now, as darkness deepened, it was a fine night. The flaps of our two tents were still reefed back so as to admit a fresh supply of air, poor and thin in quality but still recognizable as fresh air. Norton and I, and, I believe, Moorhead and Somerville, also lay with our heads toward the door, and peering out from the mouths of our eider-down bags, could see the crest above us sharply defined. The signs were favorable. We had the best omen a mountaineer can look for, the palpitating fire, to use Mr. Santayana's words, of many stars in a black sky. I wonder what the others were thinking of between the intervals of light slumber. I dare say none of us troubled to inform himself that this was the vigil of our great adventure. But I remember how my mind kept wandering over the various details of our preparations without anxiety rather like God after the creation, seeing that it was good. It was good. And the best of it was what we expected to be doing these next two days. As the mind swung in its dreamy circle, it kept passing and repassing the highest point, always passing through the details to their intention. The prospects emerging from this mental movement, unwilled and intermittent, and yet continually charged with fresh momentum, were wonderfully, surprisingly bright already better than I had dared to expect. Here were the four of us, fit and happy, to all appearances as we should expect to be in a snug alpine hut after a proper nightcap of whiskey punch. We had confidence in our porters, nine strong men willing and even keen to do whatever should be asked of them. Surely these men were fit for anything, and we planned to lighten their burdens as far as possible. Only four loads, beyond the warm things which each of us would carry for himself, were to go on to our next camp. Two tents weighing each 15 pounds, two double sleeping bags, and provisions for a day and a half besides the minimum of feeding utensils. The loads would not exceed 20 pounds each, and we should have two men to one load, and even so a man in reserve. To provide a considerable excess of porters, 
had for long been a favorite scheme of mine. I saw no other way of making sure that all the loads would reach their destination. As it was, we should start with the knowledge that so soon as any man at any moment felt the strain too great, he could be relieved of his load. And when he in his turn required to be relieved, the other would presumably be ready to take up his load again. Proceeding in this way, we should be free of all anxiety lest one of the loads should be left on the mountainside, or else put onto a climber's back, with the chance of impairing his strength for the final assault. Ceteris paribus. We are going to succeed at least in establishing another camp. This was no mere hope wherein judgment was sacrificed to promote the lesser courage of optimism, but a reasonable conviction. It remained but to ask, would the fates be kind? End of section 11 Read by Paul Hampton Chapter 6, Part 1 of The Assault on Mount Everest, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Assault on Mount Everest, 1922 by various authors. The Highest Point by George Mallory, Part 1. My first recollection of the morning of May 20 is of shivering outside the porter's tents. It is not an enviable task at 23,000 feet, this of rousing men from the snugness of their sleeping bags between 5 and 6 a.m. One may listen in vain for a note of alertness in their response. The heard notes will not echo the smallest zest for any enterprise. On this occasion, the replies made to my tender inquiries and encouragements were so profoundly disappointing that I decided to untie the fastenings of the tent, which were as nearly as might be hermetically sealed. In the degree of somnolence and inertia prevailing, I expected the abnormal. Soon I began to make out a tale of confused complaints. The porters were not all well. The cause was not far to look for, they had starved themselves of air during the night. The best chance of a remedy was fresh air now, and a brew of tea, which could easily be managed. Meanwhile Norton had been stirring, and while I retired to dress, he began to busy himself with preparations for our own breakfast. Tea, of course, was intended for us too, and further, two tins of spaghetti had been reserved to give us the best possible start for the day but one small thing had been forgotten. Those precious tins had lain all night in the snow. They should have been cuddled by human bodies, carefully nursed in the warmth of sleeping bags. Now their contents were frozen stiff and beyond extraction even by an ice axe. Even so, it might be supposed a little boiling water would put all to rights. Had a little sufficed, I should omit to tell the doleful tale." Only very gradually were the outer surfaces thawed, permitting the scarlet blocks, tomato sauce was an ingredient, to be transferred to another saucepan, where they had still to be thawed to homogeneous softness and afterwards heated to the point required for doing justice to the genius of Mr. Hines. As the expenditure of treasured hot water merely for thawing spaghetti involved more melting of snow to water and boiling of water for indispensable tea, the kitchen maid's task was disagreeably protracted, and the one among us, Norton, who most continuously and stubbornly played the man's part of kitchen maid, sitting upon the snow in the chill early morning, became a great deal colder than any one should be with a day's mountaineering in front of him. Of our nine porters, it was presently discovered that five were mountain sick in various degrees. Only four were fit to come on and do a full day's work, carrying up our camp. The whole of our reserve was already exhausted before we had advanced a single step up the north ridge. But pessimism was not in the air this morning. We had won through our various delays and difficulties, we had eaten and enjoyed our wonderful breakfast, and after all we were able to make a start about 7.30 a.m., the reserve had already been of use. Without it, we should have been obliged to remain in camp, waiting for sick porters to recover, and counting our stores. 
Morshead, who by the testimony of good spirits seemed the fittest of us all, was set to lead the party. I followed with two porters, while Norton and Somerville shepherded the others on a separate rope. In a short half hour we were on the North Coal itself, the true white neck to the south of those strange blocks of ice, and looking up the north ridge from its foot. The general nature of what lay ahead of us can readily be appreciated from this point of view. To the right, as you look up, the great northern slopes of Mount Everest above the main Rungbuk Glacier were slightly concave. The northeastern facet to the left is also concave, but much more deeply, and especially more deeply, in a section about 1,500 feet above the North Coal. Consequently, the ground falls away more suddenly on that side below the ridge. The climber may either follow the crest itself, or find a parallel way on the gently receding face to right of it. The best way for us, we soon saw, was not to follow the crest of snow or even the snow slopes immediately to the right, for these were merged after a little interval in the vast sweep of broken rocks forming the north face of the mountain, and at the junction between snow and rocks was an edge of stones stretching upwards for perhaps 1,500 feet at a convenient angle. Loose stones that slip as he treads on them are an abomination to the climber's feet, and only less fatiguing than knee-deep sticky snow. We presently found those stones agreeably secure. Enough snow lay among them to bind and freeze all to the slope. We were able to tread on firm, flat surfaces without the trouble of kicking our feet into snow. No sort of ground could have taken us more easily up the mountain. The morning, too, was calm and fine. Though it can hardly be said that we enjoyed the exercise of going up Mount Everest, we were certainly able to enjoy the sensation so long as our progress was satisfactory. But the air remained perceptibly colder than we could have wished. The sun had less than its usual power, and in the breeze which sprang up on our side, blowing across the ridge from the right, we recognized an enemy, quote, the old wind in the old anger, end quote, the devastating wind of Tibet. The wolf had come in lamb's clothes. But we were not deceived. Remembering bitter experiences down in the plains, now ten thousand feet below us, we expected little mercy here. We only hoped for a period of respite. So long as this gentle mood should last, we could proceed happily enough until we should be obliged to fight our way up. We had risen about 1,200 feet when we stopped to put on the spare warm clothes which we carried against such a contingency as this. For my part, I added a light Shetland woolly and a thin silk shirt to what I was wearing before under my closely woven cotton coat. As this outer garment, with knickers to match, was practically windproof, and a silk shirt too is a further protection against wind, with these two extra layers I feared no cold we were likely to meet. Morshead, if I remember right, troubled himself no more at this time than to wrap a woolen scarf around his neck, and he and I were ready and impatient to get off before the rest. Norton was sitting a little way below with his rucksack poised on his lap. In gathering up our rope, so as to have it free when we should move on, I must have communicated to the other rope some small jerk, sufficient, at all events, to upset the balance of Norton's rucksack. He was unprepared, made a desperate grab, and missed it. Slowly the round, soft thing gathered momentum from its rotation. The first little leaps down from one ledge to another grew to excited and magnificent bounds, and the precious burden vanished from sight. For a little interval, while we still imagined its fearful progress until it should rest for who knows how long on the snow at the head of the Rongbuk Glacier, no one spoke. "'My rucksack gone down the cood," Norton exclaimed with simple regret. I made a mental note that my warm pajama legs, which he had borrowed, were inside it. So if I were to blame, I had to share in the loss." A number of offers in woolen garments for the night were soon made to Norton, after which we began to explain what each had brought for comfort's sake, 
and I wondered whether my companion's system of selection resembled mine. As I never can resolve in cold blood to leave anything behind, when each article presents itself as just the one I may particularly want, I pack them all into a rucksack and then pull out this and that more or less at random until the load is not greater than I can conveniently carry. Even so, I almost invariably find that I have more clothing in reserve than I actually use. However, we had no time to spare for discussing the dispensation of absolute justice between the various claims of affection and utility among a man's equipment. We were soon plodding upwards again, and had we been inclined to tarry, the bite of the keen air would have hurried us along. The respite granted us was short enough. The sun disappeared behind a veil of high clouds, and before long grey tones to match the sky replaced the varied brightness of snow and rocks, and soon now we were struggling to keep our breath and leaning our bodies against a heavy wind. We had not the experience to reckon exactly the dangers associated with these conditions. We could only look to our senses for warning, and their warning soon became obvious enough. Fingertips and toes and ears all began to testify to the cold. By continuing on the windward flank of the ridge just where we were most exposed, we should incur a heavy risk of frostbite, and the whole party might be put out of action. It was clear that something must be done and without delay. The best chance was to change our direction. Very likely we should find less wind, as is often the case, on the crest itself, and in any case we must reach shelter on the leeward side at the earliest possible moment. While Morse had stopped, at last submitting so far as to put on a sledging suit, which is reputed to be the best possible protection, I went ahead, abandoned the rocks, and steered a slanting course over the snow to the left. Unlike the softer substance we had met in the region of the North Coal, the surface here was hard. On this smooth slope the blown snow can find no lodgment, cannot stay to be gathered into drifts, and the little that falls there is swept clean away. The angle soon became steeper, and we must have steps to tread in. A strong kick was required to make the smallest impression in the snow. It was just the place where we could best be served by crampons, and be helped up by their long steel points without troubling ourselves at all about steps. Crampons, of course, had been provided among our equipment, and the question of taking them with us above Camp 4 had been considered. We had decided not to bring them. We sorely needed them now. And yet we had been right to leave them behind. For with their straps binding tightly round our boots, we should not have had the smallest chance of preserving our toes from frostbite. The only way was to set to work and cut steps. The proper manner of cutting one in such a substance as this is to take but one strong blow, tearing out enough snow to allow the foot to finish the work as it treads in the hole. Such a practice is not beyond the strength and skill of an amateur in the Alps. But even if he can muster the power for this sort of blow at a great altitude, he will soon discover the inconvenience of repeating it frequently. He will be out of breath and panting, and obliged to wait, so that no time has been gained after all. The alternative is to apply less force. Three gentle strokes, as a rule, will be required for each step. To cut a staircase in this humble manner was by no means impossible, as was proved again on the descent, up to 25,000 feet. But the same rules and limitations determine this labor as every other up there. The work can be done, and the worker will endure it, provided sufficient time is allowed. It is haste that induces exhaustion. On this occasion we were obliged to hurry. Our object was to reach shelter as soon as possible. In a wind like that, on a bare snow slope, a man must take his axe in both hands to meet the present need. Future contingencies will be left to take care of themselves. The slope was never steep, the substance was not obdurate, but when at length we lay on the rocks and out of the wind, I computed our staircase to be three hundred feet, 
and at least one of us was very tired. I cannot say precisely how much time passed on this arduous section of our ascent. It was now 11.30 a.m. The aneroid was showing 25,000 feet, compared with a reading of 23,000 on the North Coal. The rise of 2,000 feet had taken us in all three and a half hours. For some reason, Morshead had been delayed with two or three of the porters, and as the rest of us now sat waiting for them, we began to discuss what should be done about fixing our camp. It had been our intention to reach 26,000 feet before pitching the tents, but it was evident that very few places would accommodate them. We had already seen enough to realize how steeply the rocks of this mountain dip towards the north, with the consequence that even where the ground is broken, the ledges are likely to prove too steep for camping. We must pass the night somewhere on this leeward side, and we had little hopes of finding a place above us. However, at about our present level, well marked as the point of junction between snow and rocks, we had previously observed from Camp 3 some ground which appeared less uncompromising than the rest. A broken ledge offered a practicable line towards the same locality. Whether the decision we came to at this crisis of our fortunes were right or wrong, I cannot tell, and I hardly want to know. I have no wish to excuse our judgment. Who can tell what might have happened had we decided otherwise? And who can judge? Then why should I be at the pains to analyze the thoughts which influenced our decision? It is perhaps a futile inquiry. Nevertheless, it is such decisions that determine the fate of a mountaineering enterprise, and the operative motives, or contending points of view, may have an interest of their own. Among us there was deliberation often enough, but never contention. There never was a dissentient voice to anything we resolved to do, partly, I suppose, because we had little choice in the matter, more because we were that sort of party. We had a single aim in common, and regarded it from common ground. We had no leader within the full meaning of the word, no one in authority over the rest to command as captain. We all knew equally what was required to be done from first to last, and when the occasion arose for doing it, one of us did it. Some one, if only to avoid delay in action, had to arrange the order in which the party or parties should proceed. I took this responsibility without waiting to be asked. The rest accepted my initiative, I suppose, because I used to talk so much about what had been done on the previous expedition. In practice it amounted only to this, that I would say to my companions, A. Will you go first? B. Will you go second? And we roped up in the order indicated without palaver. Apart from this, I never attempted to inflict my own view on men who were at least as capable as I of judging what was best. Our proceedings in any crisis of our fortunes were uniformly democratic. They were so on the occasion from which I have so grievously digressed. It must not be forgotten that we had just come through a trying ordeal. Nothing is more demoralizing than a severe wind, and it may be that our morale was affected. But I don't think we were demoralized, or not in any degree so as to affect our judgment. The impression I retain from that remote scene, where we sat perched in discussion, crowding under a bluff of rocks, is of a party well pleased with their performance, rejoicing to be sheltered from the wind, and every one of them quite game to go higher. Perhaps the deciding influence was the weather. A mountaineer judges of the weather conditions almost by instinct, and apart from our experience of the wind, which had already been sufficiently menacing, we knew, so far as such things can be known, that the weather would get worse before it got better. But we could not imagine what might be coming without thinking definitely about the porters. It would be their lot, wherever our new camp was fixed, to return this same day to Camp 4. It was no part of our design to risk even the extremities of their limbs, let alone their lives. Apart from any consideration of ethics, it would not be sensible. No one supposed that this attempt on Mount Everest 
would be the last of the season, even for ourselves, and if the porters who first completed this stage were to suffer nothing worse than severe frostbite, the moral effect of that injury alone might be an irreparable disaster. The porters must be sent down before the weather grew worse, and the less they were exposed to the cold wind, the better. It was 12.30 p.m. before the stragglers who had joined us had rested sufficiently to go on. To fix a camp 1,000 feet higher would probably require, granted reasonably good fortune in finding a site, another three hours, and if snow began to fall, or the ridge were enveloped in mist, it would be necessary to provide an escort for the porters. Had we supposed a place might be found anywhere above us within range on this lee side of the ridge, we might conceivably have accepted these hard conditions and pushed on. Deliberately to choose a site on the ridge, with such a wind blowing and in defiance of every threat in the sky, was a folly not to be contemplated. And our suppositions as to the lee side above us, they were afterwards proved correct, were all unfavorable to going higher. The plan of encamping somewhere near at hand, not lower than 25,000 feet, still left plenty of hope for this time besides building the best foundation for a second attempt. In my opinion, no other alternative was sanely practicable, and I believe this conviction was shared by all when at length we left our niche, having conceded so much already to the mountain. End of chapter 6, part 1